Chapter 1 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2, by Knut Gershet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded for you by Eric Bjornsson. History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2, by Knut Gershet. The Middle Period 1. Political Union, an Era of Transition When the royal family of Norway became extinct in the male line upon the death of Haakon V in 1319, the kingdom still appeared to possess its former strength. Internal disturbances no longer threatened, as the aristocracy had submitted unconditionally to the king, who had firmly established the principles of hereditary kingship and a strongly centralized government. In Sweden and Denmark, where royalty had become elective, rival pretenders, aided by powerful nobles, found opportunity to maintain civil strife in ceaseless struggles for the crown. But Norway enjoyed peace, a fair degree of prosperity existed, and its commerce, though somewhat impaired, was still fairly well maintained. This apparent strength and stability of the kingdom was nevertheless a mere illusion. In reality, the nation was gradually sinking into a state of lethargy and weakness which soon affected every part of the national organism. The once so remarkable energy of the Norwegian people shriveled as if touched by a withering blight, and without any dramatic struggle they lost their political and economic independence. There can be no doubt that the rise of the Hanseatic merchants, and the change in Norway's foreign policy contributed to this growing national decay, but the main cause is to be sought in the extinction of the old line of kings, who had been leaders of the people and the center of national life and greatness. In their long struggle with the aristocracy, the kings had been victorious. Not only had they lodged all power in the crown, and created a body of administrative and judicial officers wholly subservient to it, but the aristocracy, weakened by wars and dispirited by constant defeats, had gradually lost significance as leaders of the people. Hawken V wiped out the remnant of the old hereditary aristocracy when he abolished the titles of Jarl and Lendermand in 1308, while he retained that of Knight, as this new rank depended on appointment and royal favor. Had the circumstances in Norway been favorable to the growth of chivalry, the disappearance of the old aristocracy might have produced no serious change, but the new nobility never became numerous or strong enough to assume leadership in a new national development. While Sweden and Denmark fostered a proud and powerful aristocracy, Norway was urged, also by her natural environment, along the path towards democratic conditions. In comparing the growth of the Swedish and Norwegian nobility, P. A. Munch says, the already mentioned circumstance that war in Sweden was usually waged on land, while in Norway it was generally waged on the sea, would, when we consider the customary mode of fighting, make the separation between the mounted nobles and the common foot soldiers or peasants more distinct and conspicuous than in Norway. The more highly developed land war in Sweden, as well as the stronger influence of German knight errantry, also led to the erection of numerous royal and private castles a feature almost unknown in Norway. For years together, private knights and squires, as well as feudal lords, ensconced behind the walls of these castles, might successfully defy law and justice, oppress the neighboring districts, and maintain an independent existence. It is also clear that it was in their power to make their privilege hereditary, and to transform them into rights which were real, as well as personal. This is best seen in cases where some powerful knight received a fief and castle as security for a debt, which was often not paid during his lifetime. These estates with the castle were then, as a matter of course, inherited by his sons or heirs. In this way there had been formed in Sweden at the time when it was united with Norway under Magnus Eriksson in 1319, a larger and more compact circle of noble families than in Norway. In other words, a real hereditary aristocracy whose members indeed did not regard themselves superior to the Norwegian nobles, and hence offered intermarried with them. But against their own countrymen, they assumed a more aristocratic and distant attitude than did the Norwegian nobles against their people. 
We find in Sweden also family names and family coats of arms used much earlier than in Norway, which shows that an aristocracy of birth with inherited privileges was established there, while in Norway nobility as a mere personal honor still prevailed. Professor T. H. Aschehug shows that the Norwegian nobility was much weaker than the same class in Sweden and Denmark, both in wealth and number. The great and permanent cause of the inferiority of the Norwegian aristocracy in wealth lay in the different natural conditions of the three countries. The wealth, which should be the mainstay of the noble family, consisted at that time more than ever in land. But whether we consider the area or the productivity of the tillable soil, Norway has, without comparison, a more scant supply of land than the neighboring kingdoms. The growth of royal power had wrought the unification of the people, and the establishing of a national kingdom. An efficient government had been created which enabled Norway to rise to greatness. But the aristocracy had been crushed, and when the kings disappeared, the orphaned nation no longer had competent leaders to shape its career, or to protect its interests. The country's foreign policy was guided by weak and unskilled hands, if it could be said to be guided at all, while in commerce and in economic life in general, timidity and torpor replaced the earlier spirit of enterprise. For want of men, strong and self-reliant enough to attempt the solution of new problems and to face altered conditions with resolute hopefulness, the people grew unprogressive and clung to old forms with a tenacity which made successful competition with spirited rivals impossible. The Norwegians had hitherto accomplished great things, because they had been stimulated to efforts by ambitious leaders, and their energies had been wisely directed by able kings. When this stimulus and direction ceased, the decadence began, not because the people's native ability was lost, but because it became inoperative and latent. End of chapter 1、chapter、two of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Magnus Smek, The Union of Norway and Sweden. On the death of Haakon V, May the 1st, 1319, his grandson, Magnus Eriksson, Heir to the throne of Norway, was yet a child only three years of age. King Berger of Sweden, who had been compelled to flee from his kingdom after the treacherous imprisonment and tragic death of his brothers, the Dukes Eric and Valdemar, was still living in exile in Denmark, while his son Magnus had been imprisoned in Stockholm. So bitter was the feeling against the exiled king that there seemed to be no hope for him to regain the throne either for himself or his son. When Haakon died, Magnus Eriksson was staying with his mother in Sweden, and the leading Swedish nobles immediately took steps to elect him king of Sweden. The royal council summoned a general council of magnates, which met at Oslo in the month of June. Footnote. It had been customary for the king to ask advice of his lendermand and other prominent persons in important state affairs, but in the 13th century we find traces of a smaller number of men acting as the king's advisers, though they were not required to meet as a body. When Haakon V abolished the title of Lendermand, he seems to have chosen a few prominent men to act as a concilium regis. In the first half of the 14th century, this council grew rapidly in power, especially during periods when it also acted as a regency during the minority of the kings. From a concilium regis, or royal council, it developed into a concilium regni, or council of the kingdom, which shared the power with the king. And he was henceforth not expected to act except with the advice of the council. End footnote. The Duchess Ingeborg and seven members of the Swedish Royal Council met to negotiate a union between Sweden and Norway, and the election of Magnus Eriksson to the throne of both realms. An act of union was soon agreed upon, and Magnus was proclaimed king of Norway at the Haugathing at Tunsberg, and about the same time he was also elected king of Sweden. Thus, Norway and Sweden were united for the first time by an accident which looked like a plan. Nothing but family interests had dictated this course, and the two kingdoms had nothing in common but the king, who, according to the Act of Union, should spend an equal length of time in each kingdom. During the king's minority, his mother, Duchess Ingeborg, and the council, which, according to the Act of Succession, should consist of twelve members, 
was to act as a regency. A similar arrangement was also made in Sweden. The council showed great laxity in administering the government of the kingdom. The Duchess Ingebjörg, who was a thoughtless and pleasure-loving young woman, got possession of the royal seal, and she was able to exercise such an influence in public affairs that she might be called the real regent, although she hastened to establish her residence in Sweden, where she also kept the king, contrary to the Act of Union. She became enamored of a Danish nobleman, Knut Porsa, and spent the money in the treasury in pursuit of pleasure, or in furthering the wild and ambitious schemes of her paramour. Without submitting the matter to the councils of regency, she even promised him the support of the United Kingdoms in a war with Denmark, which he was about to undertake for the most selfish reasons. Supplied with a document bearing the seal of the Kingdom of Norway, he was even enabled to hire mercenaries in Germany for an attack on the Danish kingdom. The public funds had been squandered, the treasury was empty, the laws were disregarded, and the people were oppressed by unlawful taxes. The seal of the kingdom was misused in foreign affairs, and Knut Porsa had begun war with Denmark in the name of the King of Norway and Sweden. Discontent grew loud on every hand. In 1322, a council of magnates, which assembled at Skara in Sweden, deprived the Duchess of her political power in that kingdom. The following year, a similar assembly in Oslo chose Erling Vidkunsson regent to rule the kingdom of Norway with the advice and assistance of the council. But a difficult situation confronted the new regency. Through the machinations of Knut Porsa and the Duchess, Norway had been placed in a hostile attitude to Denmark. The relations with England were strained, the treasury was empty, and war had broken out with Russia as a result of border disputes in Finnmarken. In 1323, the Russians and Karelians invaded and harried Hologoland, but the regent was unable to act with energy for want of necessary funds. Three years later, peace was concluded at Novgorod for a period of ten years. What had happened in the meantime is not known, but the hostility seemed to have practically ceased since Sweden made a treaty with the Russians, 1323. The boundaries in these remote regions were at that time very vague, and the treaty, which was a mere temporary arrangement, did not bring the question much nearer to a final resolution. A truce was also concluded between Norway and Russia at Novgorod in 1326, for the period of ten years, an envoy sent to England had been able to come to a friendly understanding with Edward II in 1325. The law made by King Hawken V that the king should not be of age until he was twenty years old seems to have been set aside, as Magnus Eriksson seized the reins of government in 1332 at the age of sixteen. His reign began auspiciously by the acquisition of Skåne and Blekinge, which had hitherto been Danish provinces. The worthless King Christopher II of Denmark, who had succeeded Erik Menved, had granted these provinces temporarily to Count John of Holstein as security for a loan of 34,000 marks of silver. As the people were grievously oppressed by the Holsteiners, they appealed to King Magnus and asked him to become their ruler. Magnus consented, and they hailed him as their lawful king. Count John could not begin war against the provinces while they were supported by the king of Sweden and Norway, and he gladly accepted the offer to relinquish his title for a sum equal to the amount due him by the king of Denmark. Sweden had at least temporarily secured title to these important districts, though it is doubtful if this can be attributed to the king's own energy and foresight. In 1335, Magnus married Blanca, or Blanche, of Namor, who bore him two sons, Eric, 1339, and Hawken, 1340. Very little is known of King Magnus Eriksson's character. By some contemporaries, he was described as dissolute and incompetent, but it is now generally admitted that he was earnest and conscientious, that he tried to rule well, but that he failed, not for want of good intentions, but because he lacked the ability to guide the two kingdoms through a most difficult period. During the long regency, the Swedish nobles had carried on their private feuds without restraint, and Magnus soon met with determined resistance when he attempted to limit their privileges, and to increase his income by levying new taxes. The large sums paid for the newly acquired provinces, as well as Magnus's poor management, had brought him into serious financial difficulties, but his attempt to seek relief in this way only aggravated the situation. The hostile nobles accused him of vice and extravagance, and in contempt they nicknamed him Magnus Smek, 
a name by which he is generally known in history. Footnote. Smek, pronounced Smek, from Swedish Smeka, to fondle or caress. End footnote. Magnus was born and reared in Sweden, and was in all respects a Swedish king. The acquisition of new territory, together with financial difficulties, involved him so deeply in Swedish politics that he seldom visited Norway, or paid any attention to the affairs of that kingdom. But though he remained a stranger to its real needs, he nevertheless continued to settle Norwegian affairs with a stroke of the pen and the use of the royal seal without even consulting the Norwegian Council of State. This caused great dissatisfaction, not only because of the injury done by this careless and irresponsible management of public affairs, but also because this kind of rule did not conform to the people's ideas of the character and dignity of Norwegian kingship. A strong opposition party was formed under the leadership of Erling Vidkunsen, Ivar Agmundsson, Sigurd Hafthorsson, and other powerful barons. They demanded nothing less than a dissolution of the Union, and asked that King Magnus's youngest son, Haakon, should be made king of Norway. The king was forced to yield. By a royal decree issued at Farberg, 1343, it was decided that Haakon should succeed to the throne of Norway as soon as he reached his majority, that the older brother, Eric, should be elected to succeed his father as king of Sweden and Skåne, and that the kingdoms should remain separated from the time that Haakon became of age, 1355. Until that time, Magnus should act as regent in Norway. The following year, Eric was elected king of Sweden, and Haakon was proclaimed king of Norway. Thereby, the royal decree annulling the act of union was ratified by the people of both kingdoms. Footnote. Haakon was not proclaimed king at the Urething, nor at a thing assembled for the purpose, but representatives from the city and from the country districts were summoned to Bohus, where they signed a written agreement to accept him as their king when he became of age. A copy of this document is still in existence. This copy bears the signatures of the representatives of the cities and a part of the country districts. Other copies must have contained the signatures of the other representatives. End footnote. The royal seal was returned to Norway and given to the new chancellor, Arna Oslogsson. This virtually terminated King Magnus Smek's rule in Norway. Nominally, he remained regent, but the affairs of the government were henceforth directed by the chancellor and the council. After the peaceful settlement of the troubles with Norway, Magnus devoted himself earnestly to social and legal reforms in Sweden. The last remnants of slavery were removed. He prepared a uniform code of laws for the kingdom, Medellagen, and also wrote a code of city laws. The work was very praiseworthy and shows that he meant to rule well but new troubles were soon created, both in Sweden and Norway, by the growing power and arrogance of the Hanseatic merchants. The foreign affairs of Norway were still controlled by Magnus, while the domestic affairs of the kingdom were managed by the council. They tried to enforce the tariff laws and other restrictions which aimed at preventing undue encroachments on Norwegian trade, but the Hanseatic League, which was rapidly developing into a great commercial monopoly, possessed great capital and superior business methods, and they did not hesitate to treat the weak government with contempt. The Icelandic annals mention many bloody encounters between the German merchants and the cities of Bergen. 1332, the Germans burned a large part of Bergen. 1333, a fight between the priests and the German shoemakers, Sutura, and two priests killed. Other lawless acts were committed, so that the city of Lübeck in 1341 finally found it necessary to send envoys to King Magnus to arrange a settlement. King Magnus describes the conduct of the Hanseatic merchants as follows. When they come to the harbors of Norway, they ill-treat, wound, and kill people, and depart without a thought of amends for their wrongdoings to God or the king, or even of restitution to those whom they have injured. Where they land, they pull down houses belonging to the king or other people, and use them for fuel without asking permission. They do not permit other goods to be exported from their cities than spoiled ale, poor flour, and adulterated hops, but they import from Sweden, Norway, and Skåne grain and other valuable articles. The Germans look with contempt on the inhabitants of Norway, and in Sweden even on those who have formerly belonged to their own class, i.e. those who have married in Sweden and who have established homes there, so that they never admit them to their feasts or to other social intercourse. 
In 1342, Norway and Sweden became involved in a war with King Valdemar Otterdag, who did not seem willing to abide by his agreement regarding the Danish provinces which had been ceded to King Magnus. The Hanseatic cities aided Valdemar, and the Icelandic annals mention a fight between the German merchants and the citizens of Bergen, in which many merchants were killed. In the peace treaty of 1343, Valdemar ceded to Magnus, Skåne, Holland, Lister, Blekinge, and Fenn for the amount of 49,000 marks. In his dealings with the Hanseatic merchants, Magnus was less successful. He was unable to pay the stipulated amount for the acquired provinces, and had to seek the financial aid of the Germans, in return for which he granted to a number of German cities a charter, 1343, in which he confirmed all the privileges which had been given them by Eric Magnusson and others of his predecessors. He abolished the high duties, which had been imposed by Hawken V, and henceforth they were not required to pay higher duties than in the days of Eric Magnusson. The efforts which had hitherto been made to control the traffic of the Hanseatic merchants were thereby adjusted in their favor, and they exercised henceforth almost unrestricted control over the country's trade. The general economic conditions seem, however, to have been quite good. The conspicuous lack of energetic activity had at least the advantage of producing a period of comparative peace, in which the people were able to direct their attention to their own domestic affairs. The distribution of land according to the law of Odal, and the comparative weakness of the aristocracy, ensured the people against oppression, and maintained a large class of freeholders, bunder, who continued to be the mainstay of the nation, and the custodians of the national traditions and spirit of liberty. Even the renters who owned no land were protected in their rights by the laws, and were not left to the mercy of the larger landowners. Roads and bridges were maintained by the people, subject to the direction and supervision of the authorities of the Filka, and the laws were so well enforced that no one was in danger of being robbed or otherwise molested, even in journeying along the lonely mountain paths of remote inland districts. But aside from this fair degree of prosperity and general social well-being, a weakening of the people's energies took place in nearly every phase of national activity. Literary productivity ceased, and no books seemed to have been read, save legends and translations of chivalric romances. Through the influence of the king and the court, and Norway's intimate relations with Sweden, the Swedish language came to be regarded in higher social circles as more refined than the Norse, in which so many great works had been written, and which had been most highly developed as a literary language. Norse was still exclusively used, but many Swedish words were introduced, especially in the diplomatic language and in public documents. The literary language shows very little change, however, during the whole Old Norse period, which lasted until 1350. It retained throughout great purity of vocabulary and constancy of forms and idioms. The Old Norse language was divided into a few not very sharply differentiated dialects, especially during the latter part of the period. East Norse was spoken in Trindelagen and Östlandet, West Norse in Vestlandet, Gulathingslag, and North Vestlandet, i.e. Romsdal, Sundmur, Sundfjord, Nordfjord, and Ethersogon, as well as in Iceland and the rest of the colonies. About 1300, Östlandet developed its own dialect, distinct from that of Trundelagen, with which it had hitherto been almost identical. The West Norse had been divided into two dialects, a southern and a northern, at a much earlier date. The southern dialect of the West Norse was identical with that of Iceland until about 1400, and is the one used with but few exceptions in Old Norse literature. But when the unifying influence of literary activity disappeared, the number of dialects rapidly increased and the greater uniformity of forms and idioms was lost. The language of Norway entered upon a new development, like other languages of Europe at that time, while the more conservative Icelandic became a distinct language. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gjerset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other Causes Contributing to the Intellectual and National Decadence It is quite evident that in the growing competition with the new sea power, the Hanseatic League, the Norwegians soon found themselves outclassed, both as to their merchant marine and their military power at sea. 
Hitherto, Norway had been a leading naval power. The fleet had been her main strength in war, as necessary to the maintenance of her political power and independence as her merchant marine and commerce were to the nation's economic well-being. Shorn of these locks of strength, the nation inevitably sank into a state of languor and debility. The more surprising it is to notice with what indecision and lack of energy the government waged this decisive contest for naval and commercial supremacy. Norway's navy had become hopelessly antiquated. The old lading system, which had proven very advantageous a century or two earlier, still remained unaltered, though wholly impractical under the changed conditions of the 14th century. According to this system, the coast provinces were divided into 309 skibreder, Old Norse skibreder, or naval districts, and each skibreder should build and man one ship. In this way, the full quota of vessels could be secured, but no progress was made in the art of shipbuilding. The bunder, freeholders, who furnished the required vessels and equipments as a regular lading tax, continued to build ships of the same size and type as had been furnished hundreds of years earlier. In the Hanseatic cities, in Flanders, France, and the Netherlands, a new type of vessel, the Kogge, Old French Koch, Italian Kocha, had been introduced. This vessel had one or two stationary masts, and was wholly propelled by sails. It was of the size of a brig or small schooner. Such a vessel could travel faster and maneuver easier than the Norwegian longships, which had only one sail and had to be partly propelled by oars. The Kaga was also harder to enter. It was well supplied with war machines of different kinds, and as the men did not have to ply the oars, the fighting force on these new ships was relatively much larger than on the old war vessels. About 1350, gunpowder was also introduced, and the Hanseatic merchants were not slow in making use of it. The art of shipbuilding and the science of war had changed. In a contest with a fleet of sailing vessels of the new type, the Norwegian fleet soon proved comparatively useless. After the inferiority of the older type of ships had been thoroughly demonstrated, the longship was discarded about 1350, and sailing vessels of the new type were built. But the change came too late to save Norway's prestige as a naval power. In the Norwegian merchant marine, similar conditions prevailed. Small ships of the old type were still used, while the Hanseatic merchants were introducing large sailing vessels of improved type. Alexander Bugge says, The Norwegian ships which came to England during the 14th century not only became fewer and fewer, but also smaller and smaller, a sad evidence of Norway's failing strength. While the nation was sinking into such a lethargic state, its remaining strength was suddenly broken by the fearful ravages of the Black Death. In 1347, this plague had reached southern France from the Orient, and it quickly spread to Italy and Spain. In 1348, it appeared in England, whence it seems to have been carried to Scotland, the Orkneys, Hebrides, Shetland, and Faroe Islands, while Iceland and Greenland escaped its ravages. The disease was so malignant that people died after a few days or even a few hours' illness, and many districts lost the greater part of their population. According to the Icelandic annals, the disease was brought to Norway by a merchant vessel which came to Bergen from England. The exact date is not given, but it must have been in the summer of 1349. The people on the ship died before the cargo was unloaded, and the ship sank in the harbor, says the analyst. The plague seems to have spread to all parts of the kingdom. In 1350 it harried Sweden, and the following year Finland and Russia. When it reached the districts around the Black Sea, it finally ceased, after having visited all parts of Europe on its deadly mission. How large a part of the population of Norway died from this scourge, it is impossible to determine with any degree of accuracy. Many tales were later told by the people, of whole settlements which became wholly depopulated, of churches which were later discovered in dense forests, which had grown up on formerly cultivated areas, of children who had been left alone in depopulated districts where they grew up in a wild state. It is not difficult to see that these tales are later creations, based largely on imagination, but the mortality must, nevertheless, have been very large. Even public documents show evidence of this. Of the bishops of Norway, only one survived the Black Death, and even in 1371 the Archbishop of Nidaros complained to the Pope that while there used to be about 300 priests in his diocese, 
There were, after the Great Plague, not above forty. The Icelandic annals contain the following statement. Then the disease spread over all Norway, and caused such mortality that not one-third of the people of the country remained alive. This statement is, however, an exaggeration. Oscar Montelius, who has investigated the decrease of the population in Sweden on the basis of the Peter's pence paid before and after the Black Death, finds that the plague carried away from one-third to one-half of the population in that country. Footnote. In Sweden, one penning in Peter's pence was paid yearly by every household. In the period 1333 to 1350, the average sum per year was 221 and three-fifths marks, while in the years 1351 to 1353, the average sum was 132 and one-third marks. The population would, therefore, stand in the same ratio. End footnote. Professor J. E. Sars, who has made a similar investigation in Norway, finds that the decrease of the population in that kingdom was considerably less than in Sweden, probably because it was less densely populated, that the loss did not exceed one-third. Footnote. In Norway, the Peter's pence was one penning from every man and woman who owned property to the value of three marks. End footnote. The calamity was, nevertheless, overwhelming. Commerce was almost at a standstill, the voyages to Greenland almost ceased, many estates lay uncultivated, and a number of leading men in church and state were dead. Footnote. After Iceland and Greenland were united with Norway, they became crown colonies, and the king regulated all commerce with these islands. In the charter granted the German merchants in 1294, it was stipulated that they should not sail north of Bergen, except where it was granted as a special favor. Alexander Buga considers it probable that the crown established a monopoly of the trade with these colonies for the benefit of companies in Bergen and Trondheim. Only one merchant ship was dispatched to Greenland every year, and if this failed to reach its destination, the colony remained wholly isolated from the rest of the world. End footnote. There is indeed evidence that the ordinary affairs of life were carried on in the customary routine way, but a stunning blow had been dealt all optimism and enterprise and the consequences were the more serious because of the low ebb of national vigor. After the expiration of the ten years' truce which had been concluded at Novgorod in 1326, hostilities with the Russians had been renewed. In 1348, King Magnus crossed the Baltic Sea with an army, and fought a campaign in Finland, but the Black Death put a stop to the war. The exhausted and afflicted kingdoms needed peace above all things but the king immediately undertook a new expedition which was as unsuccessful as the first. In 1351, the pope instructed the clergy of Sweden and Norway to preach a crusade against the Russians, and Magnus raised a small army of volunteers with which he again entered Finland. But instead of gaining renown as a defender of the Catholic faith, he only proved his incompetence. The treasury was empty, his debts had increased, and new dissatisfaction had been created, especially among the nobility. End of chapter 3。Chapter 4 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of Haakon Magnusson the Younger. Haakon Magnusson ascended the throne of Norway in 1355, having reached the age of 15 years. The two kingdoms were not completely separated, as might have been expected as several provinces were still retained by Magnus. Besides Vestfold and Skien Sissel, which he retained in his own name, his queen, Blanche, kept Ranafilke, Borger Sissel, and Iceland as her Norwegian dowry. This was an important modification of the Act of Varberg of 1343, according to which the two kingdoms should be separated as soon as Haakon became of age, but it seems that the Norwegian magnates made this concession without protest, as Magnus had yielded to their demand that the union should be dissolved. The districts retained by King Magnus and his queen were not severed from Norway, but were to revert to the crown upon the death of the royal pair. But through this parceling out of the provinces and possessions of the kingdom, Norway continued to be affected by the subsequent checkered fortunes of Magnus Smek. The expeditions to Russia had left Magnus in great financial difficulties. Money could be borrowed only in small quantities for short periods, 
and these distress loans aggravated rather than relieved the deplorable financial situation. In 1355 he was excommunicated by the Pope for failure to pay his debts, and he had already been obliged to pawn his two crowns to the city of Lübeck for a small loan. The political outlook was not encouraging. King Magnus's brother-in-law, Duke Albrecht of Mecklenburg, had entered into a secret compact with King Valdemar of Denmark to wrest from Magnus the province of Skåne. At home, he was opposed by the discontented nobles, who for some time had pursued a well-defined policy of increasing their power and privileges at the king's expense. The violent and often disloyal nobles found a new opportunity to nurse their growing discontent when Magnus bestowed the greatest honors on his favorite, Bengt Algotsson, whom he made Duke of Holland and Finland, and governor of Skåne. His motives for doing this are left wholly to conjecture. Did he attempt to win a competent ally for the struggle of the nobility, the approach of which he must have foreseen? It is not improbable, but this move hastened the crisis. The nobles easily persuaded Prince Eric that he had been slighted. His younger brother Haakon was already king of Norway. The royal favorite, Bengt Algotsson, had been made duke, while Eric had neither titles nor possessions. Footnote. St. Birgitta, who voiced the general sentiment of her people, expressed disapproval of the arrangement by which the younger brother Haakon received the hereditary kingdom of Norway, while Eric had to be satisfied with Sweden, where the kingship was elective. The hereditary kingship was regarded as the more stable and honorable, hence Norway was regarded as the more desirable of the two kingdoms. End footnote. In 1356, he raised the standard of revolt. Aided by the nobles, he surprised and captured Bengt, and forced Magnus to cede the whole of southern Sweden. Albrecht of Mecklenburg, who had encouraged him with a view to his own benefit, secured for himself and his sons southern Holland and a part of Skåne. But not even these liberal concessions satisfied the rebellious Eric, who now assumed the title of king. He broke without hesitation the agreements which he had made, and seized one district after another of his father's remaining possessions until he ruled all Sweden. But in 1359, both he and his queen suddenly died. Footnote. The rumor was spread that Eric and his queen were poisoned, but the report seems to be only an attempt of the common people to account for their sudden death. They probably died in the smallpox epidemic raging at the time. End footnote. Magnus again mounted the throne, and the nobles, whom he summoned to a council, agreed that everything should be as before, even as if the uprising started by Eric had not taken place. This agreement was subscribed to also by King Haakon of Norway. But Magnus was not even now suffered to enjoy the blessings of peace. Not long after he had regained the throne, King Valdemar of Denmark entered Sweden with an army and besieged the castle of Helsingborg. Albrecht of Mecklenburg, who was playing the double role of Magnus's friend and Valdemar's secret ally, seems to have been placed in command of the castle by the unsuspecting Magnus, and as soon as the king withdrew to the northern districts of his realm, Albrecht surrendered Helsingborg to King Valdemar, who also seized Skåne and Blekinge. A Danish chronicle says that, taking advantage of Magnus's lack of penetration, Valdemar gained possession of Skåne through fraud and deceit. Magnus's weakness encouraged Valdemar to continue his operations. In the summer of 1361, he captured the island of Erland and seized Gothland, where he sacked the rich city of Visby. This bold and unexpected move greatly alarmed the Baltic cities of the Hanseatic League, who feared that a similar fate might befall them. Negotiations were begun with a view to bring about an alliance between the Hanseatic cities and the kingdoms of Norway and Sweden against Valdemar, but the greed and selfishness of the cities frustrated the plan. In the fall of 1361, Hawken, who had always been a loyal son, had a serious quarrel with his father, and even imprisoned him for a time. Footnote. Aeneas Silvio Piccolomini, Aeneas Silvius, later Pope Pius II, wrote in 1457 that Hawken was a superb man and wonderfully loved by his people. That all his deeds show him to have been a good son, father, man, and king, except that in his youth he suffered himself to be persuaded by the Swedish council to imprison his father, 
which deed he recompensed later by filial obedience and support. End footnote. The Icelandic annals state that Hawken imprisoned Magnus because he promised to cede a part of his kingdom to Valdemar. However this may be, he seems to have been prompted to the act by the nobles. His resolute action won their favor, and he was made king of Sweden a few months later, to rule that kingdom jointly with his father. In their war with Denmark the Hanseatic cities were unsuccessful. Valdemar captured the greater part of their fleet, and after an unsuccessful attempt to take Helsingborg, their commander, John Wittenborg, was forced to conclude an armistice and withdraw his forces. On his return to Lübeck, he was condemned to death and executed. Both Magnus and Hawken had learned to understand the advantage of maintaining cordial relations with Valdemar, for they were now opposed by the Hanseatic League as well as by the nobles at home, who sought to destroy their power. In 1363, a friendly agreement was finally concluded between the three kings. Magnus ceded to Valdemar the provinces which had been seized by the Danes, and the friendship was further cemented by the marriage of King Hawken to Valdemar's ten-year-old daughter, Margaret. Two months later, the Danish prince Christopher died, and Margaret became eligible to the throne of Denmark, a circumstance which ultimately led to the union of the three northern kingdoms. The Swedish nobles were deeply offended, as they regarded the concessions made to King Valdemar as a treasonable sacrifice of the interests of their country, and they decided to offer the crown of Sweden to Albrecht of Mecklenburg. He offered them his next oldest son, Albrecht, who was chosen king of Sweden in 1364, after Magnus and Hawken had been formally deposed. They received no aid in their effort to defend their throne. King Valdemar was absent on a visit to Pope Urban V in Avignon, and the Norwegian nobles would not begin a war to keep them on the throne of Sweden. They succeeded, nevertheless, in raising a small army, with which they took the field against King Albrecht, but they were defeated in the Battle of Gata, March 3, 1365. Hawken escaped severely wounded, but Magnus was captured and imprisoned in Stockholm Castle, where he was confined till 1371, when he was finally set free on the payment of a ransom of 12,000 marks of silver. Footnote. A mark of silver was half a pound of pure silver, cologne weight, or 233.858 grams. It was worth about 37 crowns, or $10. But as the purchasing power of money was over eight times as great as that time as at present, a mark of silver would have a real value of about $80 in our money. Hence the ransom would amount to about $960,000. Both he and Hawken had to relinquish their claim to the throne, but Magnus received the income from the provinces Vestergutland, Dalsland, and Vermland during his lifetime. After he regained his liberty, he spent his remaining years in Norway, where the people liked his kindness of heart and called him Magnus the Good. He perished in a shipwreck on the Bummelfjord in western Norway, December 1st, 1373. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hanseatic League Gains Ascendancy in the North. When Valdemar Otterdag, in 1360, seized Skåne, and shortly after also Öland and Gothland, Magnus Smek and his son, King Håkon of Norway, formed an alliance with the Hanseatic cities against him. This alliance did not last long, as neither of the kings aided the cities in their war against Valdemar in 1362, but the Hanseatic merchants had been able to obtain a new charter, 1361, in which they were granted unrestricted permission to trade in both kingdoms whenever and in whatsoever manner they pleased. They could even remain with their wares as long as they pleased, without being obliged to bear the burdens of ordinary citizens. This charter enabled them to gain final control over all trade in every part of the country. They not only seized all commerce, but they began also to do the retail trade with the people of the country districts, which had hitherto been reserved for the Norwegian merchants. In this way, they destroyed all competition by forcing the Norwegian merchants even out of the local trade. It was indeed always stated in the charters that the Norwegian merchants should enjoy the same privileges in the German cities as the Hanseatic merchants enjoyed in Norway, 
but these were only meaningless phrases, as Norwegian commerce was already destroyed. Bergen, the great depot of the trade with the north, became one of the most important cities of the League. The Hanseatic colony in Bergen seems to have been definitely organized about 1350. Its 3,000 merchants, masters, and apprentices, all armed and robust men, were not allowed to marry or mingle socially in any way with the townspeople. They formed a distinct community, a state within the state, governed wholly by their own laws. If a member of the colony committed any misdeed, he could not be brought to justice by the city authorities, and if the offense was a grave one, he could easily be smuggled out of the city on a German merchant vessel. At times, these foreign merchants would carry on a veritable reign of terror in the city, as they well knew that the authorities did not dare to resist. In 1365, they broke into the royal residence and forced the commander of the city to grant every request, whereupon they dragged one of his servants from a monastery and beheaded him without a trial. They then forced the bishop to grant them absolution for their deeds and compelled the city council to decide the case in their favor. In case resistance was offered, they threatened to burn the bishop's residence and the whole city. It is true that this species of tyranny and brigandage affected directly only the city of Bergen, that it was a local evil which did not imperil the peace and liberty of the people in general, but it was nevertheless a national humiliation and furnished positive proof of the nation's failing strength. It was a foretaste of the kind of blessing which Norway was to enjoy under the galling commercial yoke of the Hanseatic League. When Haakon Magnusson was deprived of the throne of Sweden, he devoted more special attention to the affairs of his own kingdom of Norway. He had seen the injurious effects produced by the characters and liberties granted the Hanseatic merchants. He was loath to keep the agreements which he had made with them, and looked for an opportunity to shake off their commercial yoke. He made regulations which favored the native merchants, and infringed on the rights of the Germans granted in their charters, and in the hope of resisting them if they attempted to use force, he made an alliance with King Valdemar of Denmark. The Hanseatic cities saw the danger and determined to break the opposition of the two northern sovereigns. Footnote. The German merchants feared lest they should be shut out from the lucrative trade with the north on which they depended for many of their staple articles, such as fish, herring, furs, hides, etc., Dried codfish, one of the chief commercial articles, was exported from Bergen. The herring fisheries on the coast of Bohuslän were especially important at the time. Fishing boats and fishermen from Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Scandinavia would assemble in large numbers during the fishing season in the two towns Skanur and Falsterbo, where they built storehouses and depots, and where great markets were held. These two towns, situated less than two miles apart on a jutting peninsula, became one of the leading trading places in the north. A French nobleman who sailed through the Sound in the 14th century on his way to Prussia states that 40,000 boats and 300,000 people took part in the herring fisheries during the months of September and October. End footnote. Already in 1336 they were uttering loud complaints about encroachments made by the kings of Denmark and Norway on their charters and trade privileges, and made extensive preparations for a decisive war against the two realms. The cities of the Baltic sea coast were the leaders in the undertaking, but they also persuaded the other cities of the League to join them. In 1367, a general Hanseatic meeting, the largest of the kind ever held, was assembled at Cologne, and a coalition for war was organized in the name of the whole League. The cities agreed to assist each other faithfully against the kings of Denmark and Norway. No city should carry on negotiations or conclude peace separately, and the compact should remain in force three years after peace was concluded. The warships should assemble at Easter, 1368, in the Sound. Duke Albrecht of Mecklenburg and his son, the King of Sweden, the Counts of Holstein, and many nobles in Jutland, led by Klaus Limbeck, were also persuaded to join the coalition. The courage of the Allies rose with their numbers. They agreed to partition Denmark so that the king of Sweden should receive Skåne and the island of Gothland, Albrecht of Mecklenburg, Sealand, and some of the smaller islands, and the counts of Holstein should receive Jutland, Fien, Longeland, etc. King Valdemar must have been aware of the grave danger which threatened his kingdom, but there is no indication that he took any decisive steps to safeguard his realm. Footnote Tradition says that when he received the Hanseatic city's declaration of war, 
he improvised as an answer this low Dutch stanza. Seven unter seventy gensen, heft seven unter seventy gensen. Wo mi die gensen nicht in bieten, na den hensen frage ich nicht in schieten. This is without doubt only an invention, but the impression seems to have prevailed that Valdemar was overconfident and failed to make preparations. End footnote. Valdemar was a sagacious though unscrupulous statesman, a great ruler but not really a warrior, and when so many, even of his own nobles, joined the coalition against him, he seems to have despaired of success in the war. He turned the government over to the Lord High Constable, Drost, Henning Podbusk, and left the kingdom. He went to Germany, but what he had in mind is not clear. He may have sought to get aid, or he may have thought that the council would be able to make peace on better terms if he were not present. Off the island of Rigen, the League collected in 1368 a fleet of 17 large war vessels and many smaller ones, carrying 200 horses and 1,540 warriors. This force was to operate against Denmark, and the victory was swiftly and cheaply won, as no Danish fleet appeared to offer battle. Copenhagen was captured and sacked, the German garrison was placed in the castle, and the harbor was obstructed by sinking ship holes at the entrance. Elsinore, Helsinger, Alholm, Nieköping, Malmö, Skaner, and Falsterbo were captured. Seeland was harried with fire and sword. The king of Sweden took Skana, and the counts of Holstein seized the greater part of Jutland. The Germans harried Jutland and all the possessions of the Danish king, says the old analyst. The second fleet of six war vessels and 1,100 men was organized in the Netherlands to operate against Norway, and this force met as little resistance as the first. The old lading system in Norway had fallen into such complete decay that the country no longer had a fleet worthy of the name. The districts east of Lindesness were ruthlessly harried, and 15 parishes are reported to have been laid waste. Marstrand, Konghella, and Ljodhus were burned, and as King Haakon had no means of resisting the enemy, no alternative but the negotiation of peace remained. On August 10, 1368, an armistice was arranged at Wismar, which should last until Easter the following year. During this interval the hostilities should cease, but the embargo on commerce with Norway was to be maintained, a proviso which would ultimately compel the Norwegians to accept peace on any terms offered. But the stipulations regarding the secession of hostilities were not kept. The sea coast, as far as Bergen, was harried, houses and forests were burned, and an effort was made to so terrorize the people that they would never again attempt to offer resistance to the Hanseatic merchants. Before the war broke out, the Hanseatic League ordered all the German merchants in Norway to leave the country. Footnote. The order recalling the merchants from Bergen was issued at Lübeck, February 2, 1368. End footnote. The English merchants seized the opportunity and tried to re-establish their trade with Norway, but the Germans returned and drove them away. Footnote. The English complained of this in 1375 when an embassy from the Hanseatic League arrived in England and sought to obtain a renewal of the trade privileges of Edward I's time. End footnote. A new armistice was concluded in 1369, which should last till 1370 when peace negotiations should begin at Bohus Castle. These negotiations at first led only to the prolongation of the armistice, and permanent peace was not concluded till 1371. Peace with Denmark was concluded at Stralsund, 1370, the most humiliating which any northern kingdom had ever been forced to conclude. The victorious Hanseatic merchants secured the renewal of all their trade privileges. They got full control of the important herring fisheries on the coast of Bohuslän, and the towns and castles of Skaner, Falsterbo, Malmöhus, Helsingborg, and Varberg were ceded to them for fifteen years as a war indemnity. Their trade privileges were now so extensive and well protected that all competition could be excluded. Their commercial supremacy in the north was absolute and uncontested. Footnote. It will be seen that after the Hanseatic merchants gained control of the trade, they exported from Bergen goods worth about twice the amount of the goods imported. As trade at this time was a mere barter, Norway received only half of what her exported goods were worth, and the German merchants were reaping an immense profit. 
and footnote. The only trade which still remained to the native merchants was the traffic with the colonies and with Nordland, the northern districts of Norway, except Finmarken. From Nordland, fish and other products were brought to Bergen and sold to the German merchants. But even this trade was soon brought under the control of the merchants at Bergen. The Norderfader, Nordfere, as the Germans called the native traders and fishermen who carried on the traffic with Nordland, were often in need. Their capital was small, and the merchants at Bergen gladly furnished them the needed supplies, after an agreement had been made that the fish brought to Bergen should be sold for a fixed price, which was always very low. In this way, the Nordfarer were kept in a sort of commercial serfdom, an evil which lasted long, and which was eradicated with great difficulty. As to the nature of the influence exerted by the Hanseatic merchants on Norway's commercial development, there has been difference of opinion among historians. P. A. Munch and J. E. Sars have held that as Norway at this time had no distinct merchant class, the Hanseatic merchants filled an empty gap and stimulated Norwegian trade and commerce to new growth. They had more capital and better business methods than the native traders, and although their control of Norwegian commerce proved ruinous to individual traders of Bergen, Tunsberg, and Oslo, forcing them out of business, it was not injurious to the nation as a whole. It must be admitted that Norway's decline cannot be ascribed to the operations of the Hanseatic merchants, but it can, nevertheless, not be doubted that a strong foreign commercial supremacy, established at a time of transition and national weakness, tended to prolong the weakness, and hindered the free unfolding of native enterprise which might have produced a new national development. Alexander Buga shows that already, at the time of Hawken Hawkinson and Magnus Lagerbrother, a new and quite numerous and enterprising Norwegian merchant class was springing into existence, but its further development was cut short by the Hanseatic commercial and naval ascendancy. In speaking of the Norwegian merchants, Buge says, Who then were the Norwegians who carried on trade and sent their ships to foreign lands? Here, as in regard to cultural life in general, the reign of Hawken Hawkinson forms a period of transition. We learn from the King's Mirror, written by a courtier at the time of Hawken Hawkinson, that it was customary for members of the chieftain class to make trading expeditions to foreign countries. But foreign ideas of knight errantry and nobility gained a firmer hold, and according to these it was considered inconsistent with the dignity of a nobleman to carry on trade. Ever more seldom did the Norwegian chieftains trade in foreign lands, even though we find such instances even in the century following, the 14th. There was, then, a place vacant for a real urban merchant class in Norway, but did no such class exist in the country? The answer will, I think, be both yes and no. There can be no doubt that at the time of Hawken Hawkinson such a class was springing into existence in Norway, or rather, perhaps, in the city of Bergen. Trade was so brisk and extensive, and the concourse of strangers so great, that the townspeople could no longer be made amenable to the same laws with the country people as hitherto. Under Hawken Hawkinson, and especially under his son, Magnus Lagerbrother, the cities, i.e. Bergen, Nidaros, Oslo, and Tunsberg, were organized as distinct communities separate from the country districts. They received their own laws and even a degree of self-government. And what we learn from unmistakable facts of history points in the same direction, that in the cities, especially in Bergen, there was a class, a very numerous class, whose business it was to carry on trade with foreign countries, or rather with England, a class of men who were not at the same time craftsmen and farmers, but merchants exclusively. A well-informed author of the King's Mirror tells us that there were men who resided permanently in the cities and carried on trade. In the privileges granted the Norsemen in England, and in the treaties concluded between the kings of Norway and England, the merchants, mercatores, but not the subjects of the King of Norway, are mentioned. In the time of Magnus Eriksson, there was in Bergen a separate guild of England's Fadere, traders who were engaged in the regular traffic between England and Norway. No such guild of Tiskland's Fadere, or Holland's Fadere, is mentioned. Not only from Bergen, but also from other Norwegian cities was trade carried on with foreign countries. In 1225, for example, there came to Lynn a trader from Nidaros who called himself Skule Jarl's Merchant who was permitted to buy 200 corteria of grain in the city. But these sprouts were not allowed to thrive and grow. Had it only been a century earlier, now it was too late. The strangers had gained too great a power and had become indispensable to the country. 
there is reason to believe that peaceful rivalry would have reawakened the spirit of competition and stirred Norwegian commerce to a new activity and growth. This rivalry would have been furnished by the uninterrupted intercourse with England, where native commerce was developing. But the forcibly maintained trade monopoly of the German merchants removed every opportunity, and left Norwegian traders and shipowners helpless in the tightening grip of the Hanseatic League, which was not progressive in spirit, but which maintained its supremacy by coercion and force. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of History of the Norwegian People, Volume Two by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other Features of Hawken Magnusson's Reign When King Magnus and his queen died, the provinces which they had held in Norway were again placed under the administration of the Norwegian government, and various measures adopted show an earnest desire also to strengthen, as far as possible, the ties between the colonies and the mother country. In Iceland and the Orkneys, the people, as well as the Sisselmend, were required to take an oath of allegiance to the king, and Henry of St. Clair was made Jarl of the Orkney and Shetland Islands in preference to Alexander de la Arde, who failed to respond to a request to come to Norway, where he would be granted an opportunity to prove his title to the Jarldom. St. Clair went to Norway and did homage to the king, subscribing also to a document which imposed great obligations upon him, and placed strict limitations upon his rights and powers in the colony. But such agreements were more easily made than kept. There was no evidence that St. Clair did not intend to keep his word, but Scotch influence was growing, and as Norway's naval strength was broken, the Norwegian kings found it ever more difficult to exercise any real authority in the colonies. Even commercially the ties were weakening, as fewer ships now sailed between Iceland, Greenland, and Norway than formerly. Of nine ships scheduled for Iceland in 1376, only six reached their destination, the others being driven back by storm. Greenland was visited but once a year by the Greenland Knarre, and if this failed to cross the stormy North Atlantic, the colony remained isolated from the rest of the world till the following year, or till the ship succeeded in making the voyage. That such periods of isolation grew ever more frequent and protracted was evident and proves that Norway's hold upon her distant colony was weakening. But it is not strange that commerce with Greenland was maintained with difficulty. The fact that the Norwegians were still able to cross the Atlantic at more or less regular intervals proves that their old-time skill and daring in navigation was not yet lost. The union with Sweden and the closer relations with Denmark and Germany, established through the altered foreign policy, brought a change also in the character and title of the higher officials in the kingdom. Norway had few castles, it is true. The chief ones, and in a strict sense the only ones, were Akershus, Bohus, Bergenhus, and Tunsberghus, but these became of greater importance than formerly. One or more herreds, or districts, were placed under the castle, and the income from these was collected by the officer in command, who received the German title of Vogt, Foget, Fogel, and even the district belonging to the castle was called Fogeti. Fogderi. Even the Sisselmand, in districts where there were no castles, were often called Foget, and the Gjaldkeri in the districts were sometimes called Bifoget. In Norway, this new system was of little real significance, however, when we compare it to that of Denmark or Sweden, where the whole kingdom was parceled out among the numerous castles of the nobles. Over cities and larger districts, and also over the colony of Iceland, the king placed royal governors called Hirthsjorar, whose duties are but imperfectly known. It has already been stated that Haakon married Margaret, the daughter of King Valdemar Rotterdag, in 1363. She was reared in Norway by a Swedish lady, Marta Ulfstotter, a daughter of St. Birgitta, and seems to have resided permanently at Akershus Castle in Oslo, where her son Olaf was born in 1370, when the young queen was in her 18th year. After peace had been concluded with the Hanseatic cities and Duke Albrecht of Mecklenburg in Stralsund, 1370, King Valdemar returned to Denmark and devoted himself to the reorganization of his shattered kingdom. Among the many problems which engaged his attention was also that of the succession. As his only son had died some years previous, Albrecht, the son of his elder daughter Ingebjörg, and Olaf, the son of King Haakon and Margaret, were both eligible, but in order to obtain a favorable peace with Mecklenburg, Valdemar had promised to support Albrecht. 
This seemed to give him the better chance of the two candidates, but when Valdemar died in 1375, Albrecht imprudently assumed the title of King of Denmark, before he had been elected. He thereby violated the principle of elective kingship, and offended the Danish nobles, while the gifted Queen Margaret, who seems to have been charming to a very unusual degree, and knew how to win their favor, secured the election of her five-year-old son Olaf. The young king's parents should act as regents during his minority, but as King Haakon always remained in Norway, the queen herself became the real regent and the guardian of her son. Olaf was already crown prince of Norway, and his election to the throne of Denmark would ultimately lead to a union between the two kingdoms similar to that which had before existed between Norway and Sweden. King Haakon VI had been forced to cede the throne of Sweden to Albrecht of Mecklenburg, but he refused to acknowledge the German prince as rightful king. When his father, Magnus Smek, died, he seized the provinces which that king had been suffered to retain during his lifetime, and hostilities between Norway and Sweden continued, though no real campaigns were fought till shortly before King Haakon's death in 1380. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Union of Norway and Denmark, Queen Margaret The sudden death of Haakon VI placed his ten-year-old son Olaf on the throne. Queen Margaret, who was in Denmark at the time, hastened to Norway to arrange for the succession of her son, and Olaf was proclaimed king at the Urething in Trøndelagen. A formal act of union of the two kingdoms must also have been drawn up, but no such document now exists, nor is it anywhere mentioned. A union was thus brought about between Norway and Denmark, which was destined to last for 433 years. But the future consequences of so important a step seem to have caused no great concern. Margaret, who was very ambitious, hoped that the union would be permanent, while the leading men of the two kingdoms seemed to have regarded the union as a temporary expedient as the two realms had nothing in common but the king. During Olaf's minority, Margaret was to act as regent whenever she was in Norway, but when she was not in the kingdom, the administration was to be directed by Agmund Finnsson as regent, assisted by the chancellor, Henrik Henriksson. This precaution was probably taken to prevent the queen from managing the affairs of Norway while she was staying in Denmark, as the situation in that kingdom was still so difficult that it would absorb the greater part of her attention. Many castles and provinces were still in the hands of the Allies, who had fought against Denmark in the Hanseatic War, and Margaret had to employ all her skill to win back what had been lost. A contemporary Lübeck chronicler writes, In the year 386, the Queen of Norway gained possession of the Kingdom of Denmark as completely as her father Valdemar had held it. This she did with great ability in that she first gained possession of Skåne, and then negotiated with her enemies, the Counts of Holstein concluded a permanent peace, and granted them the duchy of Schleswig as a fief. When this was done, a fear and trembling seized all the nobles of the kingdom, as they saw the wisdom and power of this lady, and with their sons they now offered to serve her. She summoned before her all the fogeds of the kingdom, and she went from one castle to the other to be held as queen. She also transferred fogeds from one castle to the other, even as abbots moved the monks from monastery to monastery. This happened even within a quarter of a year before Candlemas, and it is quite astonishing that a woman, who before was so poor that she could give no one a meal except by the aid of her friends, because all her castles were encumbered more by force than by debts, now, together with her son, became so powerful in a quarter of a year that she lacked nothing in the whole kingdom. Making due allowance for the metaphoric expressions of the chronicler, it is nevertheless clear that Margaret was a worthy successor of her illustrious ancestors. Munch says, The more closely we examine the political events in the North at this time, the more prominent Margaret comes into the foreground as the one who surveys and controls events and whose superior mind directs the whole. The relations with Sweden continued to be hostile. In 1385, King Olaf became of age, and with the advice of his mother he assumed the title of King of Denmark and Norway and heir to the Kingdom of Sweden an open avowal that he would maintain his father's claim to the Swedish throne. Albrecht's power in Sweden was fast declining. He had attempted to place some restrictions on the growing power of the nobles, 
and this caused such a resentment that a strong party wished to place Olaf on the throne in the same manner in which Albrecht himself was made king in 1364. This repetition of this kind of coup d'etat was however averted for the time being by the sudden death of King Olaf at Falsterbo Castle in Skåne, 1387. Footnote. The cause of Olaf's sudden death is unknown. The belief that he had been killed or imprisoned by his own mother is wholly without foundation. An impostor claiming to be King Olaf appeared some years later, but he was tried and executed. According to the law of succession, the heirs to the throne were divided into twelve classes. Albrecht, the son of Margaret's elder sister Ingebjörg, had no right to the throne, as neither of his parents belonged to the Norwegian royal family. Albrecht, king of Sweden, was number nine in order of succession. End footnote. This was a great calamity for the kingdom of Norway as well as for Queen Margaret personally. As Olaf was her only living child, the royal family became so nearly extinct at his death that for the first time in centuries a successor had to be placed on the throne by election. Footnote. The election of Queen Margaret was in harmony with the Norwegian law of succession, which provided that when no heir to the throne was found, the one who had the best claim according to the general law of inheritance should be chosen. Since King Albrecht of Sweden was not considered, no heir existed, and Margaret had the best claim as the heir of her son, King Olaf. In the Norwegian Letter of Homage, issued February 2, 1388, it was expressly stated that she was chosen because she was Hawkins' queen and the mother of King Olaf. End footnote. King Albrecht of Sweden, a great-grandson of Magnus Smek, was the only heir to the throne of Norway according to the law of succession, but he was not even considered, owing to his great unpopularity and the enmity which had existed between him and the late kings of Norway, who regarded him as an usurper. Queen Margaret had no direct claim to the throne. She was not a member of the royal family of Norway, and hitherto no woman had ruled the kingdom, but her ability and popularity counted strongly in her favor. Seven days after King Olaf's death, she was chosen ruling queen of Denmark, and when the council assembled at Oslo, she was also elected regent in Norway, while Eric of Pomerania, a son of her sister's daughter, was chosen heir to the Norwegian throne. She also assumed the title of Queen of Sweden, to show that she would continue the policy of her predecessors in her attitude to that kingdom. The Swedish nobles, who had intended to place Olaf on the throne, now turned to Queen Margaret. At a meeting at Dalsborg Castle in Dalsland, where she was present, they chose her Queen of Sweden, and she promised in return to aid them in driving Albrecht from the kingdom, an agreement which was swiftly carried out. At Allsed, near Falköping, the nobles met King Albrecht's weak forces, defeated him, and carried him and his son Eric as prisoners to Lindholm Castle, where they remained incarcerated for six years. King Albrecht's rule had ended, and the queen had won the throne which her son and husband had claimed, though the struggle was still protracted for a time. The novelty of a ruling queen, who had been able to unite all the northern kingdoms, seems to have impressed the people deeply. A chronicler records with almost superstitious solemnity that God placed an unexpected victory in the hands of the woman. Queen Margaret had been able to accomplish, both in Denmark and Sweden, what her late predecessors had attempted in vain, a sufficient proof of her ability and diplomatic skill. In 1389, Eric of Pomerania was formally elected King of Norway at a new meeting of the council, but Queen Margaret should act as regent until the young king became of age and she secured from the nobles concessions, which greatly strengthened the royal power both in Sweden and Denmark. In Sweden, no more castles should be built, and those that had been erected in Albrecht's time should be raised. More important still was the provision that all crown lands which had been alienated in Denmark in the reign of Valdemar Otterdag, and in Sweden in the reign of Albrecht, should revert to the sovereign, and the income from them should go to the royal treasury. In Denmark, a new tax was levied to secure a better coinage, and in Sweden the queen received large personal possessions. It is quite evident that Margaret, the first great ruling queen in European history, possessed skill in administration as well as in diplomacy, but her system of statesmanship was nevertheless only a continuation of that of her predecessors, Magnus Smek and Valdemar Otterdag. It was her ambition to rule over a large realm, to gather the threads of administration and political power into her own hands. When the three kingdoms were finally united under her sway, she sought to perpetuate her dominion 
by strengthening the power and influence of the crown, and by increasing her revenues and private possessions. In these efforts she directed her attention to politics rather than to details of administration, and the local needs of each kingdom continued to be neglected. The efficiency of the local administrative authorities was even purposely weakened, to ensure increased influence of the sovereign. Many of the highest offices both in Norway and Sweden were left vacant. The queen was staying in Denmark, and the old administrative system in both kingdoms was falling into decay. In Norway, many Danes were appointed to fill the highest positions in the church, until it awakened merited resentment. In Sweden, the queen appointed Danish fogids. Lawlessness increased, and for want of proper supervision by the royal authorities, these foreign administrative officers became ever more arrogant and arbitrary, and wrung from the oppressed people loud and well-founded complaints. A contemporary remarks, The Germans were expelled, i.e. King Albrecht and his Mecklenburgers. The Danes then got the power in the land for many years, and then the Germans were lauded by the people. The Danish Fogods were called tyrants whose cruelty, never to be forgotten, brings them eternal perdition. The three kingdoms were associated on equal terms under the same sovereign, but through Margaret's influence a foreign overlordship was even now being established both in Norway and Sweden, a feature which was to make the political partnership with Denmark so expensive and profitless a business, especially for Norway. Even the defeat and imprisonment of King Albrecht was not to pass without a most unfortunate sequel, which caused much loss and suffering both in the north and elsewhere. The city of Lübeck had sided with Queen Margaret, but the two Hanseatic cities, Rostock and Wismar, undertook to aid Albrecht. They issued a proclamation that anyone who wished to undertake raids into the northern kingdoms and would aid in carrying provisions to the city of Stockholm, which was besieged by the queen, would be given protection in their harbors. The invitation proved very tempting to hundreds of lawless adventurers, who gathered from all parts of the Baltic sea coast, and a league of professional buccaneers, known as the Victual Brothers, sprang into existence, which gravely endangered all commerce, not only in the Baltic, but also in the North Sea. The demon of lawlessness once let loose ran its own riotous course. Without decriminalization, the wild corsairs robbed and plundered remorselessly. They seized Gothland and captured Visby, which they made their chief stronghold. In 1393 they captured Bergen, sacked and burned the city, and committed the greatest outrages. Malmö and Nyköping were burned, Hanseatic merchant ships were everywhere attacked, and the danger to commerce finally became so great that the fisheries on the coast of Bohuslän and Skåne had to be abandoned for three years. In 1395, Bergen was sacked and burned a second time, and the robbers, says the chronicler, gathered great stores, treasures of gold and silver, costly cloth, household goods and fish, which they brought to Rostock and Wismar, and sold with great profit, as the people of those cities did not care whether the goods were gotten honestly or dishonestly. Because of constant losses and increased hazards connected with navigation, prices rose, and many districts suffered for want of supplies, but Queen Margaret was quite helpless against this enemy. The Hanseatic cities made determined efforts to suppress the sea robbers. Hundreds were captured and executed, but new bands appeared. In 1400, the cities of Hamburg, Bremen, and Lübeck thought that they had succeeded in sweeping the sea clean of pirates, but they soon had to send out a new expedition. In 1402, the notorious pirate chief, Klaus Stortebecker, and two of his associates, together with a large number of followers, were captured and put to death. Again, the Hamburgers sallied forth and captured Gerdeke Mikkelsen, Wickman Wigbold, and eighty pirates, who were all promptly beheaded. Through such energetic measures, the strength of the pirates was finally broken. They sacked Bergen a third time in 1428, and yet a fourth time in 1429, but after that their names disappear from history. The Victual Brothers destroyed the last remaining strength of the native Norwegian merchants, and when the Hanseatic cities revived their trade, they gained exclusive control. This marks the beginning of the period of their greatest prosperity and power in Norway which lasted for about a hundred years. In 1395, Queen Margaret made peace with the cities of Rostock and Wismar, and Albrecht and his son were liberated. Thereby, the war for the possession of Sweden was formally terminated, 
but the Victual Brothers still continued their ravages, and Stockholm did not open its portals to the Queen till 1398. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of History of the Norwegian People, Volume Two by Knut Gershut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Kalmar Union. After Erik of Pomerania had been raised to the throne also in Denmark and Sweden, Queen Margaret took steps to bring about a formal union of the three kingdoms. In 1397, a meeting of magnates, councillors, and ecclesiastics of the three kingdoms was assembled at Kalmar in Sweden to negotiate about the formation of a union. At this council, Eric of Pomerania was crowned king of all the three kingdoms, and a joint seal was also prepared. But the queen's hope of uniting the three realms in a federal union with an hereditary king was not realized. A rough draft of an act of union, a sort of constitution, was indeed drawn up, but it was never completed in the necessary documentary form or supplied with the required seals. It was expressly stated in the draft that for the greater assurance that all these points shall forever be loyally kept, the document shall be written on parchment, two copies for each kingdom, and to these shall be affixed the seals of the king, the queen, the councillors of the kingdom, the lords, and the cities. As this was not done, the first draft of the points on which an agreement had been reached could not be legally binding. Footnote. The Proposed Kalmar Act of Union this document, which is written on paper, still exists. It contains the following points. 1. The three kingdoms shall henceforth have one king, and shall never be parted. 2. After the death of the king, a successor shall be elected jointly by the three kingdoms. If the king dies without issue, a successor shall be chosen according to the best judgment and conscience. 3. All the three kingdoms shall continue in love and unanimity, and one shall not withdraw from the others. That which befalls one, as war or attack by foreign enemies, shall be regarded as befalling all three, and each kingdom shall help the other with full faith and energy. 4. Each kingdom retains its own laws, and the king shall rule according to them. He shall not import from one kingdom to the other what has not formerly been law and justice there. 5. One who has been outlawed in one kingdom shall be considered an outlaw in the others. 6. If negotiations are carried on with foreign lords or states, the king has the power to decide the matter with the advice of the council of the kingdom in which he happens to be, or with a few councillors from each kingdom. 7. All these articles should be kept as prescribed and they should be so interpreted that they will be to the honor of God and the peace and well-being of the king in the realm. If anyone acts contrary thereto, then shall all the three kingdoms aid the king and his officials to remedy the wrong. 8. Queen Margaret shall have and hold with full royal right all that which her father and her son granted her in Denmark, her dowry in Sweden and what the Swedes have given her, together with what her husband and her son have granted her in Norway. At her death the castle shall revert to the crown, but otherwise she may, through her testament, dispose of what she has. 9. These articles shall be embodied in a document written on parchment, two copies for each kingdom, and to these shall be affixed the seals of the king, the queen, the councillors of the kingdom, the lords, and the cities. This preliminary draft, written on paper, was to be signed by seven Swedes, six Danes, and four Norwegians, but only ten seals appear on the document. Three Danish and all of the Norwegian seals are lacking. End footnote. It is possible that after the queen had failed to carry the chief points of the proposed plan, she abandoned the whole of it, and preferred to rule without being bound by a document which gave the union no strength, and the sovereign no increased power but it is also possible that since the four Norwegian seals are lacking in the original document, the Norwegian councillors refused to sign, owing to the clause which made the king elective. This would change Norway from an hereditary to an elective kingdom, a serious step to which the Norwegian councillors would not willingly subscribe. 
A union had, nevertheless, been effected through the election of a joint king for the three kingdoms. This was solemnly ratified at Kalmar by the coronation of Eric as king of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and the new relation of the three realms was also betokened by the use of the common seal. But the principle of elective kingship was retained, and each kingdom kept its full sovereignty and autonomy, its system of laws and administration. With the exception of the king, no central government for the United Kingdoms existed, and nothing was specified as to any duties which they owed each other as members of the Union, except what was found in the unfinished draft of the points on which an agreement had been reached. As to the outward evidences of the compact entered into, the three realms could not have been united by more slender ties. But what Margaret had failed to do directly might in time be done indirectly, since the council had failed to adopt a constitution defining the relation of the kingdoms to each other, or limiting the power of the sovereign. The kingdoms had become associated under the same ruler. The ever-present force of circumstances might do everything else that an ambitious and autocratic ruler might wish, since no written constitution existed to remind the people of the limit of his power, or of the extent of their own rights. Even a poor constitution could have been amended, and would have taught the people the art of constitutional government, but the magnates assembled at Kalmar, who seemed to have guarded so jealously against any encroachments on their own liberties, failed with almost childish fatuity to safeguard those liberties for the future. When King Eric was eighteen years old, he was declared of age by a council assembled at Vadstena, Sweden, in 1400. But Margaret continued to reign until her death. In 1401, negotiations were begun with the Queen and King Henry IV of England regarding the marriage of King Eric to Henry's daughter Philippa. As Henry IV was seated none too securely on the English throne, he sought to strengthen his position through foreign alliances and by the marriage of his children to members of the royal houses. He had watched with much interest the growing power of Queen Margaret, and the consummation of the union of the three northern kingdoms seems to have made him desirous of gaining the friendship of this new power. After prolonged negotiations, Philippa finally came to Denmark in 1406, and the marriage was solemnized at Lund, in Skåne. The young king is described as a man of fine appearance. He had yellow or golden hair, large eyes, blonde complexion, and a broad white neck, writes Ania Silvio Piccolomini, the later Pope Pius II and an account to the English Council of the Conditions in the North, dated August 8, 1400, evidently written by English envoys, states that the three kingdoms, which have now been united, enjoy a hitherto unknown peace, whereas before, while they remained separated, they suffered much from war and unbearable evils. The young king is highly loved by his subjects because of his charming and noble personality. The English envoys had evidently not discovered that the gallant young king very early showed signs of that rashness, ill-temper, and lack of good judgment which made his reign so inglorious a failure. A new era seemed now to have dawned for the northern peoples, or rather, a new era might have dawned, if the rulers who were guiding their destinies had possessed the necessary wisdom and foresight. The union of three peoples so closely related in language and nationality that no appreciable difference yet existed augured well for the future. By combining their strength, which had hitherto been wasted in wars and rivalries, the united Scandinavian kingdoms might have risen into new prominence as one of the powers of Europe. Careful amalgamation would soon have obliterated the existing differences, as a friendly feeling already existed between the three peoples. Commercially, their interests were identical, and a wisely conceived public policy would have sought means to strengthen the love for the Union and to stimulate the spirit of cooperation against foreign rivals, which would soon have welded the neighbors into one nation. But no such idea seems to have dawned even upon the keen-witted and practical Margaret. Her worthless successors were wholly incapable of conceiving it. After the kingdoms had been united, and cordial relations had been re-established with England through the marriage of Eric and Philippa, the opportunity seemed to have come to revive the naval strength of the Scandinavian realms, to throw off the Hanseatic yoke, and to re-establish commercial relations with England. But Margaret attempted none of these things. No steps were taken even to strengthen the navy or the coast defenses, though the whole realm lay exposed to the attacks of the Victual Brothers, 
against whose ravages the queen had been so helpless that she had asked permission of King Richard II of England to hire three ships at Lynn for the defense of her kingdom. The lack of means could scarcely be urged as a reason for this strange neglect, as the queen constantly increased her revenues, so that in a single year, 1411, she could donate 26,000 marks to various religious institutions. Her failure to utilize the new opportunities in the right way was rather due to her system of statesmanship, which was wholly guided by dynastic and personal interests. It was of the general type of the statescraft of the Middle Ages, according to which the sovereign did not regard himself as the servant of the state, but as its owner. The realm was his private property, and it was his main care to secure as much revenue as possible and to defend his title to the crown. The thought of developing a united Scandinavian nation was as remote from the mind of Margaret as the idea of nationality was foreign to the whole age. The possibility of amalgamation of the three peoples was precluded from the outset by the Queen's effort to make Denmark the principal country in the Union, and to reduce Norway and Sweden to the position of provinces. Danish ecclesiastics were appointed to the highest offices in the church in both countries, and swarms of Danish officials were sent, especially to Sweden, while no Norwegians or Swedes were appointed to office in Denmark. We have seen how this policy awakened the bitterest resentment in both countries. The Danes were soon looked upon as oppressors and enemies, and Margaret was unjustly described as cunning and greedy. A Swedish monk calls her the daughter of the wolf, i.e. King Valdemar. Albrecht, he continues, levied heavy taxes, but Margaret made them still heavier. What he left, she took. The peasant's horse, ox, and cow. In short, all his possessions. Another contemporary analyst states that she was very covetous. With incredible craft she made herself ruler of all the three kingdoms, which she reduced to almost nothing, and no one could resist her cunning. These outbursts of indignation do not serve to enlighten us as to the real character of the queen, for it is evident that the statements of these analysts are as unjust as they are incorrect. In her dealings with her subjects she was in no sense the daughter of the wolf as she was not harsh or tyrannical, but cautious and generous. Her varied activity as ruling queen bears the marks of moderation and goodwill, and not seldom of true womanly kind-heartedness. But she had created a system of administration, the pernicious character of which she probably never fully knew or understood. And it is with some justice that the queen, who originated the system, should be made directly responsible for its attendant evils, which could neither be controlled nor abated. In Sweden, the spirit of rebellion again raised its head. The Norwegians were more tranquil, not because they were better satisfied, but because the weak Norwegian nobility was less able to resist oppression, or to take the reins of government into their own hands. In Norway, the administration had been strongly centralized by the able kings of Harald Harfagor's line. But the success of such a system depended on the continued presence of the sovereign, and the close supervision by the central government but this supervision ceased when the Kalmar Union was established. Norway might almost be said to be without a government. During the last fifteen years of her reign, Margaret visited the kingdom only twice, and King Eric came to Norway only once after he became of age. When the Drottsetta, or regent, Agmund Finsson died, no successor was appointed to this most important office for several years, and the Chancellor's office was also left vacant for some time after Henrik Henriksson's death. The council was seldom assembled, the country was ruled from Denmark, and the foreign officials, who were constantly increasing in numbers, could disrespect the laws and practice their extortions with impunity. The queen erred when she established such a system, but it was, perchance, an error of judgment, not one of heart. Queen Margaret died quite suddenly on board her ship in the neighborhood of Flensborg, October 28, 1412. She was buried at Sora, but her remains were later transferred to the cathedral of Roskilde, where her beautiful sarcophagus still stands. Nothing is known as to her personal appearance. The marble figure on her tomb is a decoration, not a portrait, as it seems to have been made to order by some foreign artist who probably never saw the queen. But the noble and majestic face makes us feel that thus she must have looked, this great queen who once ruled the whole Scandinavian north.
End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of History of the Norwegian People, Volume Two by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Eric of Pomerania. When King Eric assumed the duties of ruling sovereign, circumstances gave promise of a most successful reign. The newly established union was winning favor in all the three kingdoms. The revenues were large, and the people were well disposed towards the king as they hoped that he would prove to be a wise and kind ruler. But these fair hopes were soon shattered by the worse than worthless Eric. The only question which threatened to produce complications at the beginning of his reign was that of the relation of Schleswig to the crown of Denmark. But this molehill of difficulty grew in King Eric's hands into a mountain of trouble. Queen Margaret had been obliged to cede this province to the Counts of Holstein in 1386, but at the time of her death she was on the point of regaining control of the duchy. An armed conflict had been precipitated, though the question was still left unsettled. Eric was opposed to the queen's cautious policy. He would drive out the Germans who had migrated in large numbers into the duchy and would unite it permanently with the kingdom of Denmark. He submitted the question to a council, Danahof, assembled at Nieborg, 1413, and this assembly decided that as the counts had been in arms against their sovereign, they had committed felony, and had forfeited their fief to the king. Schleswig was thus reunited with Denmark, but the counts would not abide by the decision of the council, and a long and expensive war was the result. Hostilities commenced in 1416. Eric gained some success, and captured the city of Schleswig, but he was unable to take the fortified strongholds of the duchy, and the situation became critical when the Hanseatic cities, because of the damage done their commerce, cut off all trade with the north, and threatened to join the Holsteiners in active war operations against the king. In 1424, the question was finally submitted to the arbitration of the German emperor, Sigismund, who decided that the duchy of Schleswig belonged to the king. Eric, who had gone to Hungary to visit the emperor, was so pleased with what he considered the happy termination of the quarrel, that he journeyed to Jerusalem to offer thanks to God for the victory. But upon his return from Palestine in 1425, he still found Count Henry of Holstein in possession of the Duchy of Schleswig, and when he attempted to enforce the decision of the emperor, the war was renewed. The Hanseatic cities now joined the Holsteiners. Throughout the whole struggle, the Victual brothers had carried on their raids, not only through the connivance, but even upon direct invitation of the Holsteiners and such damage had been done to commerce that conditions became unbearable. But the united forces of the Allies suffered serious defeats. King Eric gained a notable victory over their fleet in the Sound, 1427. Many of their ships ran aground, many were captured, and the commander, Tiedemann Sten, fled with the remainder. The great Hanseatic merchant fleet, which arrived shortly after the battle on its northward voyage, was captured. In an attack on Flensburg, Count Henry of Holstein lost his life, and a second Hanseatic fleet failed in its operations against Copenhagen the following year. In two campaigns, the Allies accomplished nothing. In 1425, King Eric has seized the opportunity to levy a toll, Ödersund's tollen, on every ship which passed through the Sound, and he might now have concluded peace on very favorable terms, but he stubbornly insisted on enforcing to the letter Emperor Sigismund's decision with regard to Schleswig. His subjects, especially in Norway and Sweden, were tired of this war from which they could derive nothing but harm. Few reinforcements were furnished, and the king was not able to continue the struggle successfully. Flensborg fell into the hands of the Allies, and in 1432 he was at length forced to enter into peace negotiations, in which he abandoned his plan of enforcing the emperor's decision against the Counts of Holstein. The peace was concluded at Vordingborg, 1435. Colonial affairs were not wholly neglected by King Eric, but the commerce with the Norwegian island possessions was nevertheless falling into decay. In 1410, the last ship of which any definite record is preserved came from Greenland to Norway, and no further communications with those distant settlements seem to have been maintained. Footnote. The Norwegian nobleman Diedrich Pining, who was Hirsjori in Iceland, 
and Commandant of Vardahus, about 1490, was a bold sailor and buccaneer. According to an old Icelandic source, Pining and his companion Pathorst, about whom nothing is known, carried on trade with Greenland, but this statement seems to be a mere conjecture. Very little is known about Pining's operations in the Arctic waters. The humanist Olaus Magnus says that Pining and Pothorst were excluded from all intercourse with humanity by the severe decrees of the kings of the north, and they were outlawed because of their violent robberies and many wicked deeds committed against all sailors, which they would seize both far and near. They then sought refuge in the mountain Fitzark, which lies between Iceland and Greenland, he continues. Ludwig Dai thinks that after peace was concluded between England and Denmark-Norway in 1490 in King Hans's reign, all preying on English commerce by Danish and Norwegian sailors had to stop. But Pining seems to have continued his buccaneering activity, and as a result he was outlawed. End footnote. Holberg says that after Queen Margaret's time, the kings were so occupied that they had no time to think about old Greenland. The trade with the colonies continued to be a royal monopoly, and all foreign merchants were forbidden to trade with them. But after Norway's sea power was broken, and the Hanseatic merchants gained control of the trade, the kings could no longer successfully defend even this last remnant of Norwegian commerce. In 1413, King Eric protested to King Henry V of England against the operations of foreign merchants in the Norwegian colonies. In 1431, he again complained to King Henry VI that for twenty years the English had carried on unlawful trade with Norway's lands and islands. Iceland, Greenland, the Faroe Islands, Shetland, the Orkneys, Hologoland, and Finnmarken. That they had plundered and burned, that they had carried away many ships with fish and other goods, and that many people had been slain. In Eric's reign, English merchants were beginning to gain control of the trade with Iceland. This trade had always been of some importance, as the Icelanders imported grain and other staple articles, while they exported wool, sheepskins, sulfur, etc. At this time, great cod fisheries, which gave this trade increased importance, were also developed near the coasts of Iceland. The commerce with Iceland was carried on especially by the Norwegian colonists of Bristol, who in earlier times had controlled this trade. They now ventured to disregard the restrictions which the kings had placed on the trade with the Norwegian colonies, hence their trading expeditions often turned into piratical raids. But whether these were extended to Greenland, as indicated in Eric's complaint, is doubtful. In 1432, King Eric concluded a treaty with England, in which King Henry VI agreed to pay the damages which England traders had done in the Norwegian colonies. The people who, during the last twenty years, had been carried away by force, wherever they were found in the kingdom of England, should receive pay for the services they had rendered, and should be allowed to return to their homes. The interdiction of trade in the Norwegian colonies was renewed, but after this prohibition had been repeated by Henry VI in 1444, and by a treaty between Henry VI and King Christian I in 1449, the trade with Iceland was finally made free on certain conditions in 1490. King Eric continued Margaret's administrative policy. Norway and Sweden were still ruled from Denmark. Leading public offices were left vacant. The council always met in Denmark whenever it was assembled, and as the councillors from the two other kingdoms had to make long and expensive journeys, few attended its meetings and they could exercise but slight influence, as the Danish members were always in the majority. Norwegian and Swedish affairs were left in the hands of the king and his Danish councillors, who were neither familiar with local circumstances, nor much interested in the affairs which they were called upon to settle. The increased burdens of taxation resulting from the wars, the interruption of commerce, and the ravages of the Victual Brothers, from which both Norway and Sweden had suffered much, especially in 1428 to 1429, soon made Eric hated in both countries. Footnote. During the war, the trade with the Hanseatic cities had ceased, but King Eric had encouraged the English merchants, who sought to revive the trade with Bergen, and also the merchants of the city of Bremen, who had left the Hanseatic League. End footnote. The great popularity of Queen Philippa had hitherto been a saving feature of his reign. To her the oppressed could turn with their complaints, 
and her great kindness had won the people's heart. During the king's absence in Palestine she had acted as regent, and she had shown the same energy and high courage which distinguished her brother, King Henry V of England. But no child was born to the royal pair, and in 1430 the good queen suddenly died at Vadstena in Sweden at the age of 37. She had been King Eric's wisest counselor, the only person who could shield him against the growing wrath of his oppressed subjects. Now he stood alone, short-sighted, violent, hated, and always stubborn. In vain the people now complained of their wrongs. Twice the Swedish nobleman, Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsson, was sent to Denmark by the people of Dalarna to obtain relief from the oppression of the Danish Fogids. His pleas fell upon the deaf ears of the short-sighted and obstinate king. Engelbrecht's return from his last unsuccessful mission became the signal for revolt. The peasants assembled at Vesteros, and chose him as their leader, and soon all Sweden was in arms to throw off the Danish yoke. On August 16, 1434, the Swedish council, compelled by Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsson, issued a document in which they renounced their allegiance to the king. But on the 24th of the same month, the Norwegian council gave notice that it found this step to be untimely and ill-advised, and asked the Swedish council to reconsider its action as it was contrary to the happy union of the three kingdoms. The king, it continued, had not erred from ill will, but was ready to right all real wrongs. On the 12th of September, the Swedish council issued a second document, addressed to the council and people of Norway, in which they stated forcibly and in detail the reasons for renouncing their allegiance to King Eric, and asked the Norwegians to join them in resisting oppression. No better opportunity could have been offered the Norwegians to sever the unprofitable partnership with Denmark, but the invitation of the Swedish council elicited no response. In Norway, the hereditary kingship and the strength and stability of the central government had in course of time created a spirit of loyalty to the king, which had ripened into a well-established tradition. The Swedes, who had elected and dethroned their kings in rapid succession, could start a new rebellion without much compunction. To the Norwegians, such a course seemed violent and treasonable. But Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsson continued the war against the Danes with great success. In three months he drove out the Danish Fogids and destroyed a number of their castles. King Eric finally came to Stockholm with a fleet, but as the city was closely hemmed in by Engelbrechtsson's forces, he found the situation hopeless, and agreed to submit the whole question to the arbitration of a committee of four councillors from each kingdom. On a Riksdag, assembled at Arboga, 1435, Engelbrechtsson was chosen regent until an agreement should be made with the king, and at a council assembled at Stockholm, where also many Norwegian councillors were present, Eric agreed to the terms submitted. He had to give assurance that he would rule in conformity with the laws, that the castles of the kingdom should be granted only to native lords, and that Sweden should have its own government, at the head of which should stand the Drotsetta and the Marsk two new officials. For the former office, the council chose Kristen Nilsen Vasa. For the latter, the king appointed Karl Knudsen Bonda. All might now have been well, but King Eric soon violated the agreement, and war broke out anew. Engelbrechtsson fought a second campaign as successfully as the first, but on April 27, 1436, this great leader was assassinated by a personal enemy, and Karl Knudsen Bonda, a dashing young nobleman, more ambitious than gifted, assumed the management of the uprising. The Danish misrule and the failure of the king to listen to the often repeated complaints of the people finally produced an uprising also in Norway. The successful rebellion in Sweden and the concessions which Eric had been forced to make at the Council of Stockholm inspired some noblemen of the southeastern districts with the hope that they might be able to compel the king to redress their grievances. The revolt, which took place in 1436, was led by Amund Sigurdsson Bolt from Borgersissel, and five other noblemen from neighboring districts. A letter written by Engelbrechtsson, dated March 19, 1436, shows that Amund Sigurdsson and his associates sought an alliance with Engelbrechtsson and the Hanseatic cities against King Erik, and the uprising seems to have been organized shortly after the Norwegian councillors returned from Stockholm. Footnote. The letter reads in part, Likewise, the Kingdom of Norway has written us and asks to enter into alliance with private Hanseatic cities and with the Kingdom of Sweden. 
We did not know that the kingdom of Norway would join us when our messengers visited the streets, and they, i.e. the Norwegians, have now joined us to be allied with Swedes, living or dead. We ask you that you give them your assistance that they may enter into the same relations with the cities. As the Norwegian council was still loyal to King Eric, the term Kingdom of Norway can only mean Amund Sigurdsson and his party. End footnote. Amund Sigurdsson marched to Oslo and seized the fortified bishop's residence, but after an undecisive fight with the garrison of the city led by Svarte Jons, the Danish commander of Akershus Castle, the rebels withdrew. King Eric, who was notified of the uprising, seems to have been alarmed, and full and complete pardon was offered the leaders if they would submit. An armistice was concluded June 23, 1436, and a council was summoned to meet at Tunsberg to negotiate with the leaders of the uprising. Amund Sigurdsson and two other leaders met, together with 26 of their followers, and presented to the council the demand that the foreign lords and fogids should be expelled from the country before the 29th of July. This condition was accepted, and peace was formally concluded between Amund Sigurdsson and the council. The stipulations of the agreement were carried out to the letter, it seems, as the Danish lords and fogids were expelled from Norway in July, 1436. The uprising had been successful to some degree, but as it gained no general support, it became a local affair of no great national significance. Professor J. E. Sars says of it, The Norwegian uprising corresponded in many ways to the Swedish. Like the latter, it was especially directed against foreign lords and fogids, and like it, it proceeded chiefly from the common people, while the nobles kept aloof, or assumed a hostile attitude, as they regarded the movement with fear and ill will. But as closely related as the two uprisings, the Norwegian and the Swedish, seem to be regarded to origin and early success, so different were they in regard to historic importance and political consequences. The Swedish developed into a truly national movement, and forms a new epoch in the nation's history. The Norwegian was a mere episode without any permanent or important result. The chief reason why the Norwegian movement died away without results while the Swedish continued to grow and placed state and nation upon new paths of progress was that Sweden had an ambitious aristocracy, while the aristocracy in Norway had long been on the decline both politically and otherwise. In 1436, a council was assembled at Kalmar to bring about a new reconciliation between King Eric and the Swedes but the Norwegian councillors were not present, owing no doubt to the uprising at home. The Danish councillors supported the Swedes in their demands, and King Eric had to promise to abide by a new settlement to be made at a meeting of Søderkerping, September 29th. At this council, the three archbishops of the United Kingdoms, and one councillor from each realm, drew up a new act of union, the Draft of 1436, which among other things provided for a government when the king did not reside in the kingdom but this draft never got beyond the embryo state. King Eric, who had sailed to Gothland, did not return to Söderkerping to receive a new oath of allegiance from his subjects. After spending the winter in the island, he went to Prussia to raise a military force for the purpose of compelling the Danes to accept his cousin, Duke Boguslaus of Pomerania, as heir to the throne. In the fall of 1437, he returned to Denmark, but acted more arbitrarily than ever before. In June 1438, the Swedes assembled a new council at Kalmar, and urged the king to be present, so that a final settlement could be made. But this invitation he disregarded and sailed again to Gothland, where he now established himself permanently. When it became apparent that he would not return, the council of Kalmar made the agreement that he should still be regarded as king of the three realms, and that perfect friendship should exist between the kingdoms. But the Swedes summoned him to appear at Mora Stenar, to declare that he would respect the laws and liberties of the kingdom, or he would be deposed, and in October 1438, Karl Knudsen Bunda was chosen regent. Disturbances again broke out both in Norway and Denmark. In Norway, the men of Telemarken and Bambel, led by Halvard Grothop, marched against Oslo, but they were defeated and scattered by Svartha Jöns, the commander of Akershus Castle. In Denmark, the peasants rose in rebellion against the nobility and clergy. The situation was so alarming that the council invited King Eric's nephew, Duke Christopher of Bavaria, and promised him the crowns of the three kingdoms, 
an assurance which was contrary both to the spirit and the letter of the Act of Union. In 1439, King Eric was formally deposed both in Sweden and Denmark. Christopher of Bavaria was hailed as King of Denmark at the Viborg thing in 1440, and the following year he was also elected King of Sweden, and crowned at Stockholm, but only after he had made such concessions to the Swedish nobles that he became the mere shadow of a king. The revolution in Sweden, which had been set on foot by the common people, led by Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsson, had been carried to completion by the aristocracy under the leadership of Karl Knutsen Bonda. The strong royal power established by Queen Margaret had been shattered, and the monarchic union established at Kalmar had been replaced by an aristocratic union. The nobles of Sweden and Denmark had agreed that the two realms should remain united under a shadow king, while the nobility in both realms retained all real power. In this important revolutionary movement, Norway took no part, aside from the two local disturbances mentioned, although King Eric had virtually ceased to rule the kingdom. The reins had slipped from his hands here as elsewhere, but there was no one to seize them. Though Sweden and Denmark had deposed King Eric and had chosen Christopher of Bavaria as his successor, the Norwegian council adhered to their old worthless sovereign with a loyalty which would have been pathetic if it did not furnish evidence of lack of national self-consciousness and clear-sighted political leadership. Time and again the council sent messages to Eric in his voluntary retirement, assured him of the loyalty of the Norwegian people, and asked him to help them, but the eccentric old king did not even answer. The only evidence that he still regarded himself as king of Norway was a few appointments which he seems to have made to please the Norwegians. In 1438, before he established himself permanently in Gothland, he appointed two Norwegian nobles, Olaf Buch and Olaf Nilsson, commandants respectively of Akershus Castle and Bergen, and in 1439 he finally appointed a new Drottsetta, Sigurd Jonsson, and also a new chancellor, Gunnar Hulk. When it finally became evident that Eric had altogether ceased to rule, the Norwegian council consented to elect King Christopher. In 1442, the councils of the three kingdoms assembled at Lødøse, where Christopher was chosen king of Norway, and he was shortly afterwards crowned in Oslo. In his retreat in Visborg Castle in the island of Gothland, King Eric was now left alone to muse over the strange vicissitudes of human affairs. But his spirit was not of the kind that is chastened by misfortune. He turned pirate and robbed without discrimination Hanseatic merchants and his former subjects. In his castle he defended himself stoutly against attacks, but prudence finally led him to cede Gothland to King Christian I, Christopher's successor, and to retire to Pomerania, where he died at the age of seventy-seven. The internal conditions in Norway during Eric's reign reveal an increasing decadence, which was further accelerated through the maladministration due to foreign rule. This is perhaps most distinctly noticeable in the church, which up to the period of union had retained a distinctly national character. The prelates, as well as the lower clergy, were native-born, and as the king exercised great influence over the election of bishops, the state church principle was maintained in practice, however vigorously it might be assailed in theory. Both Sverre and Hawken Hawkinson had successfully defended the principle that the king was the head of the Church of Norway. The bishops, who were elected by the chapters of the diocese, had to be presented to the king to receive his sanction before they were consecrated by the pope. It is true that at the Council of Tunsberg, 1277, King Magnus Lagerbotha renounced the right to influence the election of bishops, but this act was not sanctioned by the Norwegian magnates, and during succeeding reigns the bishops who resisted the king were driven into exile. During the 14th century the king does not seem to have interfered with the election of bishops, but he received the right to appoint the priests of the royal chapels. Thereby was created a new class of clergy, the chapel priests, who were wholly dependent on the king, and hence loyally attached to him. From among these priests the king could select his chancellor and other secretaries, and while the council of the kingdom came into existence, the leaders of this clergy also received a seat in that body besides the bishops. The provost of the Apostle Church in Bergen was member of the council as Magister Capillarum, and the office of chancellor should always be held by the provost of the St. Mary's Church in Oslo. In this way, the national character of the Church of Norway had been maintained prior to the Union. 
especially after King Sverre's time, the clergy were quite loyal to the sovereign. The sagas of the kings of Norway and other great works in the national prose literature were written by them. They were not only the spiritual teachers, but also the spokesmen and leaders of their people. When the Kalmar Union was established, the process of denationalization of the Norwegian church took its beginning. The Union kings maintained with renewed energy the state church principle, and sought to influence the election of bishops, not for the sake of maintaining the national independence of the Norwegian church, but in order to strengthen their influence in the council of the kingdom. Their chief aim was to secure the election of Danish ecclesiastics, who would, naturally, be staunch supporters of the king and his policy. This practice was begun by Queen Margaret, who in 1381 made the Dane, Nicholas Finkenov, Archbishop of Nidaros, although the Norwegian ecclesiastic, Håkon Iverson, had been unanimously chosen by the chapter. Nicholas did not attend to the duties of his archdiocese, but returned to Denmark, taking with him the books and treasures of the church. In a similar way, a Danish monk, Benedict, was chosen Bishop of Bergen, 1371, and later another Dane, Jakob Knudsen, was chosen Bishop of the same diocese, 1400, but in 1407 he was transferred to the Diocese of Oslo. King Eric pursued the same policy, and meddled in church affairs in a much more arbitrary way than the more discreet Queen Margaret. When Oslak Bolt, the Bishop of Bergen, was chosen Archbishop, King Eric named as his successor the immoral and wholly unworthy Arne Clementson, whom he later forced upon the Swedes as Archbishop of Uppsala. It seems, however, that Arne was never consecrated Bishop of Bergen. In 1422, the king secured the election of another Dane as Bishop of Oslo, and he also made him Chancellor, though that office belonged to the provost of the St. Mary's Church. This was a most important office, as the Chancellor was the keeper of the seal, which had to be affixed to every royal document to make it valid. The practice thus originated by Margaret and Eric of Pomerania was continued by their successors, who often used their power very arbitrarily to secure the election of Danes. The clergy became more and more foreign in character, and the church lost its distinct national traits. It grew apart from the people, and ceased to be the nation's intellectual leader. A similar downward trend is noticeable in all departments of administration. Prior to the Union, the authority exercised by the king and the council had articulated well with the local administrative authorities, by whom the behests of the central government could be efficiently carried out. After the Union was established, this first principle of good government was destroyed, not only through the negligence and lack of insight of the sovereigns, but even purposely in order to strengthen the royal power. With undisguised efforts, the Union kings sought to gather all power into their own hands and to rule by issuing royal decrees to be carried out by fulgids whom they themselves had appointed. The old system of local administration was suffered to fall into decay. The principle of government by the people and for the people was disappearing. Henceforth, the nation was to be ruled by a wise and divinely inspired Lendesvater, who was rising to the position of a sort of benevolent despot. In Sweden and Denmark, this march towards absolutism was arrested by the revolution of 1434 to 1440. Norway was unable to profit by this opportunity. The weakness of the nobility, which made it possible for the king to exercise full control in Norway, was further augmented by the appointment of foreigners to the highest positions of trust and honor both in church and state. Thereby, the leading Norwegians were gradually excluded from public life, and forced into inactivity and obscurity while the government, which became wholly extraneous to the people, grew paternal and despotic. From the beginning of the Union, both the sovereign and the Danish council sought to increase their power and influence in Norway. The offices of the kingdom were treated as a royal possession, and donated at will to Danish nobles and courtiers, while no Norwegians were appointed to office in Denmark. In 1415, the German Hans Kruppelen had been made Fogged or Commandant of Bohus, and Balthasar van Dem had received Sundhordland as a fief. In 1424, Tidekerust was commandant of Akershus, and later Svarte Jans was appointed to the same position. Jan Umareise and Henrik Schacht, though they were foreigners, were made members of the Norwegian Council. From whatever side we view conditions in Norway, it becomes evident that the Danes were gaining the ascendancy. Many Danish nobles and courtiers flocked to Norway and married Norwegian heiresses. 
In this way they became the owners of rich estates, and as royal favors were always accorded them whenever an opportunity presented itself, these dashing foreigners with wealth and titles soon elbowed their way to the foremost possessions in the land. As illustrations of this kind of fortune seekers may be mentioned Diederik Wiesnenacher, who received as a fief the whole of Telemarken, and Hartwig Krumedike, who in the reign of Christian I became the richest man in Norway. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Embryo Democracy The sources dealing with social conditions in this period are very meager, but an important document has, however, been left us by the Italian sea captain Pietro Quirini, who wrote an account of the life and customs of the common people of the seacoast districts of northern Norway as he found them in 1432. Quirini was shipwrecked in the North Sea on a voyage to Flanders, and with a few surviving companions he finally reached the islands off the north coast of Norway in a boat. They landed on the uninhabited island of Santi, Sande, where they suffered much from hunger and cold. But some men who came to the island to look after their sheep found the shipwrecked men, and they were brought to the island of Rust, where they spent the winter. Quirini says that Rust was only three Italian miles in circumference, and had 126 inhabitants, who supported themselves by fishing, as no fruit or grain grew there. They caught a great deal of codfish, which they salted and dried in the sun. This they prepared for the table by pounding it until it became tender, whereupon they mixed it with butter and spices, which made it very palatable. They also had milk and beef, and by mixing meal into the milk they made a dough from which cakes were baked. Usually they drank sour milk, which the strangers did not find to their taste, but they also had beer. Their houses were round, wooden structures with an opening in the roof through which light was admitted, and in winter the opening was covered with a translucent membrane. Their clothes were mostly of coarse London cloth, but not of skin. The author speaks also of the vast number of wild birds, especially wild geese, which were so tame that they would make their nests close to the houses, so that when the people wanted eggs, they lifted the birds off the nests and took as many as they needed, but otherwise they left the birds undisturbed. Their wealth, he says, consists not in money, but in fish, two kinds of which were especially important, namely halibut and codfish. In the month of May, when the codfish is dry, they load it on ships and sail with it to Bergen, which is an important trading center. Thither come ships laden with articles of food and clothing from Germany, England, Scotland, and Prussia, and these goods, such as leather, iron, cloth, and various articles of food, the inhabitants of Rust receive in exchange for their fish. The people, both men and women, he says, are well-built and good-looking, and they live together in the greatest innocence and brotherly love, and usually help one another without any thought of profit. They are good Christians, they attend church regularly and keep the fast days, they never use profanity or mention the name of the devil. They are so honest that they take no care to hide their property behind locks and bars, but leave all doors and drawers unlocked. Neither do they fear that their sons and daughters shall transgress against virtue. All of them, young and old, lead such virtuous lives and live in such perfect obedience to the moral law that they do not know what incontinence is. They marry only to fulfill the commandment of God, and not from carnal appetite, which can get no power over them because of the cold air and the cold country in which they live. When their father, mother, husband, wife, children, or other near relatives die, they go to church and praise God because he suffered the deceased to dwell so long among them and neither in word nor deed do they betray any sorrow or sadness any more than if the dead were only sleeping. When a woman's husband dies, the widow makes a great feast for all the neighbors on the day of the funeral. They are then attired in their best clothes, and the widow encourages the guests to eat and drink heartily, and to be of good cheer in memory of her husband's departure into eternal rest and peace. In the month of May, the people of Rust began to prepare for their yearly trip to Bergen, whither the strangers were to accompany them. A few days before their departure, a noble lady, the wife of the governor of the district, who had heard that some strangers were staying on the island, dispatched her chaplain to Quirini and his companions with a present consisting of sixty dried codfish, three loaves of rye bread, and a cake. 
She also sent her greetings, saying that as she had learned that the people of Rust had not showed so great a hospitality as they should have done, they should report to her any wrong which they might have suffered, and full restitution would be made them. The inhabitants of Rust were also instructed to show the strangers the greatest courtesy and hospitality, and to bring them along to Bergen. Quirini and his men expressed their heartfelt gratitude to the lady for her kindness. They testified to the people's innocence of any wrongdoing, and praised them most highly for their great hospitality. Quirini sent the lady a paternoster chain of amber as a present, and asked her to pray for their happy return to their own country. On the 14th of May they set sail for Bergen, and on the way they met Archbishop Oslach Bolt, who was making a tour of inspection in his diocese. When he heard the tale of the strangers, he was filled with compassion, and gave them a letter of recommendation to the people of Nidaros, Trondhjem, where they were received with the greatest kindness. On Ascension Day, they attended Mass in the great cathedral, and they were afterwards invited by the Sisselmand to a banquet, where they were well entertained. After a ten days' visit in the city, they began their journey overland to Stegeborg in Östergötland, Sweden, where an Italian, Giovanni Franco, called in Swedish John Valen, was commandant. Corini gave the Sisselman some small trinkets which he still had in his possession, and the Sisselman gave him in return a pair of boots with spurs, a little axe with the picture of St. Olaf, a saddle, a hat, four Rhenish gulden, and a sack of provisions. The archbishop had given the people instructions to supply Quirini with a horse, and the Sisselman gave him two more. Thus provided, they started on their journey, accompanied by a guide, and they traveled eastward for fifty-three days. The kingdom was thinly settled, says the author, and they often came to houses where the people lay sleeping, as it was nighttime, though the sun was shining. The guide, who knew the custom of the country, entered without knocking at the door, and they found the table decked and chairs around it. There were also four ticks filled with down or feathers to sleep on. Everything was open so that they could eat what there was and lie down to sleep, and it often happened that the man of the house came and found them sleeping, and when the guide told them where they were from and who they were, he became astonished and gave them food without pay, so that the twelve men with three horses did not spend more than the four Rhenish gulden, though they traveled for fifty-three days. On their way they found huge mountains and deep valleys, where they saw great numbers of animals which resembled roebucks, swarms of snow-white birds of the size of heathcocks, and partridges and pheasants as large as geese. Other birds, as hawks and falcons, were all white due to the very cold climate of the country. They had also seen in the St. Olai church a white bear skin about fifteen feet long. In Stegeborg they were well received by their countryman Giovanni Franco. He sent them to Leduza, whence they went to England, and they finally returned to Italy in safety. Captain Quirini's account of the life and customs in these remote seacoast settlements is the more interesting since we still find in the country districts of Norway the same generous hospitality, the mutual helpfulness, the unsuspecting honesty, and with no great modifications, also the customs which he describes. The traits which attracted the captain's attention were not limited to a single locality or a period of time, but are general characteristics of the Norwegian people in all ages. These traits bespeak a people leading a healthy, rustic life, free from oppression or class struggles, whose simple virtues have been reduced to time-honored customs, the origin of which is hidden in remote antiquity. Norway's commerce and sea power had fallen into decay, her national greatness had suffered a total eclipse, and even her political independence was being gradually sacrificed in the interest of an unprofitable union with Denmark. But the social and economic life of the people in his local environment was left almost untouched by these changes, and retained its former health and vigor. The growing weakness and inefficiency of the public regime, to which the rapid deterioration of the military and national power of Norway must be ascribed, reflects in no way any inner social decay. Nowhere did the people govern themselves in national matters in this period. The central government was either vested in a king and his advisers, as in Norway, or in an aristocracy, as in Sweden and Denmark. If this government was unwarlike and inactive, the state was weak, though the people might be relatively prosperous and well-content. If the government was aggressive and maintained an efficient military organization, the state was strong, as people at that time counted strength. Great wars could be fought, castles and palaces could be built, the nobles could display a dazzling pomp, and the national greatness was commensurate with their number and power. 
But with the development of this intense military activity followed in the Middle Ages the feudalization of society, by which the people were deprived not only of their local autonomy, but of their personal freedom. They were gradually reduced to serfdom, and forced to shoulder intolerable burdens, which left them in hopeless poverty and intellectual apathy. In Denmark, where the aristocracy was strong, the nobles owned two-fifths of all the land besides their large family estates. Serfdom and soakage were introduced, and the bunder were reduced to a most wretched condition. Footnote. The old historian Peter Friedrich Sum says, The great lords, clergy as well as others, oppressed here as elsewhere the poor, who thereby were brought to despair, so that they frequently revolted. But in Norway this occurred much more seldom than in Denmark, because the lords were not so numerous there, and their estates were smaller, hence they demanded less service. Agriculture was declining, and likewise the population. The continual strife between the nobility and the common people was the cause of this. End footnote. The nobles who devoted themselves to military exploits could place in the field well-drilled armies of mailed horsemen, capable of waging successful campaigns even beyond the borders of the kingdom. But the burdens fell upon the unfree tillers of the soil, who were wholly at the mercy of their feudal masters. This kind of national greatness, though it produced a rather showy intellectual activity among the upper classes, and a few heroic and interesting personalities, was unquestionably attended with social retrogression and growing internal decay. The people's strength was gradually sapped, society was stratified into hostile classes, and difficult social problems were created which had to be solved before the life of the nation could be lifted to a higher plane. It is quite evident that national strength in the feudal, medieval sense must not be confounded with national progress, and it follows that national weakness, taken in the same sense, need not be associated with economic and social decay. In Norway, the aristocracy had been almost destroyed by the king, and when the royal family died out, a vigorous government, which was tantamount to a strong Norway, was impossible. The people seemed to have had no regrets. They welcomed cheerfully a Swedish or a Danish king, if he would not violate their laws or infringe on their local autonomy. They had lost their kings and their nobility, which might have maintained their national greatness, but they had also been relieved of the classes which could oppress them and reduce them to serfdom, and Norway thereby escaped the evils of the feudal system. The Union government, which was exercised at a distance, was paternal and inefficient rather than oppressive, and although greedy fogeds might commit individual acts of injustice, they lacked the power, if they did possess the will, to oppress the whole people. Cut off from international conflicts, with the exception of the wars forced upon them through their union with Denmark, the Norwegians were left to themselves to lead an uneventful rustic life among their own fjords and mountains, where they preserved their own laws, local institutions, love of freedom, and robust spirit of independence. With the disappearance of the court and the nobility, a leveling of social conditions followed which gradually obliterated the old class distinctions, and consolidated the people into a hardy, plain-spoken yeomanry. In their homes around the fjords and in the mountain valleys, the Norwegians were as much their own lords in the period of union as they had been in the Viking Age, and their irrepressible love of freedom was often wedded into violent resistance to oppression, and jealous hatred and distrust of the new upper class of Danish priests and officials which sprang into existence in the period of union with Denmark. Whatever the Norwegians might have lost through the disappearance of military power and national prestige, the unimpaired manhood and womanhood of the people, than which nothing is better worth preserving, remained to live and grow in a free and healthy domestic environment. It is true that the spirit of the nation no longer found expression in great achievements, but whenever opportunity was offered, it manifested itself in a way which created respect and admiration. We see it in the great naval heroes Kort Adler and Peter Tordenskjold, and in the great respect which the Norwegian soldiers always enjoyed in Denmark. The Danish kings in the Union period surrounded themselves with a Norwegian bodyguard, and the Danish naval forces were largely recruited in Norway. Molesworth says, The best seamen of the king of Denmark are the Norwegians. The rather bombastic patriotic songs of a later period praising the bravery, fidelity, and intense love of liberty of the Norwegians need not be taken literally but we would wholly misunderstand them if we failed to recognize that they express in an almost stereotyped and conventional way a well-established general opinion. Anathon All says, 
The people were always free, the bunder, yeomanry, much more so than elsewhere in Europe, but they lacked political leaders who could maintain the national principle. This was a loss, but it was also a gain. When the aristocracy and the national kingship disappeared, the defense of their rights and liberties and the future destiny of the nation was placed for the first time in the people's own hands. Those who ruled and those who led were gone. The people had to rely upon themselves. However this may be interpreted, it was a social revolution which necessarily marks the beginning of a new era in the people's social and political development. The Yemen class grew strong and numerous. They loved their old freedom. They cherished their rights. They were united by common customs and the equality of economic and social conditions. They lacked the means as well as the ability to seek the glory of military exploits or international politics, but they learned to act together in resisting encroachments and in managing their own domestic affairs. They were not only freer than the people elsewhere, but they were also more independent economically. We have seen that natural conditions, especially the small and scattered areas of tillable soil, had hindered the growth of a feudal aristocracy in Norway. Few castles were built, and a fairly equitable distribution of land was maintained by the law of Odal, which safeguarded the bunder in the possession of their land. The absence of feudal lords and the division of the land among the bunder, who owned and tilled their own little farms, made the large class of freeholders economically independent, and gave Norwegian society a distinctive democratic character. Because they were left without an aristocratic upper class, they also developed a love for independent action, and a spirited self-reliance which forms the theme of the patriotic national songs, and which won the admiration of the Danes in the Union period. This was not national greatness, but it can safely be called social progress. The only trouble was that this development in Norway came in an age which was not yet able to profit by democratic conditions, and make them a new force in national development. But although centuries were yet to pass before this life, under favorable political circumstances, ripened into a new self-conscious nationalism, we find in the Norwegian people after the completion of this great social and political change, the future Norwegian democracy in embryo. We see nursed in the quiet the social conditions and the traits of character which so quickly placed Norway in the front rank of political and social democracies when the Great Awakening finally came. End of chapter 10《ヒストリー・ヒストリー・オブ・ザ・ノルウェージャン・ピープル、ヴォリューム2、バイ・カヌー・ギャーシュット。これは、リブヴァンクス・ドメイン。キング・クリストファー。When Christopher of Bavaria finally succeeded King Eric of Pomerania on the thrones of the Northern Kingdoms, the three realms were again united under a common king, but the idea of uniting them into a single Danish kingdom under the personal rule of the king, which had been Queen Margaret's plan, was now abandoned. Separate administration for each kingdom was emphasized, and the only frail strand of the Union idea yet remaining was that of a common sovereign, who under the new arrangement had but limited power. In Sweden and Denmark the nobility forced Christopher to subscribe to charters which greatly reduced his power and strengthened the influence of the council. Sweden secured full autonomy. The kingdom should be left in full enjoyment of its laws, liberties, privileges, and ancient customs. The taxes collected should be used in the kingdom. The king should have only Swedish councillors and courtiers. The castles of the kingdom should be given to Swedes, and upon the king's death they should be turned over to a committee consisting of six of the leading men of the realm. In Norway no specific agreement was signed, but the king never visited the country after his coronation. The administration was left in the hands of the council, which now acted with greater authority than it had ever done since the Union was first established in 1397. Fortunately, King Christopher seems to have coveted peace and comfort rather than power. He is described as short and stout, merry and good-natured, and he evidently sought to rule in full harmony with the conditions to which he had subscribed. But for all his good intentions, he was not popular in Sweden, where the powerful Jarl Knudsen Banda coveted the throne. It had become a fixed belief among the common people that Karl Knudsen would become king. An old clairvoyant woman had told him so, and a little girl had seen a crown settle on his head while he was sitting in church. The taxes were unjust, it was claimed, and the hard times due to crop failure caused great dissatisfaction. The people said that the grain was fed to the king's horses while they had to make bread of bark, 
and they nicknamed him Christopher Bark King. In Norway there was also great unrest, especially in the southeastern districts. The people rose against their fogids, and in Gudbrandsdal, Bengt Harnikston Gildenlova, a member of the council, was slain. The Hanseatic League still controlled Norwegian commerce, and the Hanseatic factory at Bergen enjoyed at this time its greatest prosperity and power. Its members treated the native population and even the city government with unbearable arrogance, and lawlessness and licentiousness passed all bounds, for the local authorities were unable to enforce the laws. The members of the Hansa had even entered the town hall, sword in hand, and had forcibly ejected the city council. In 1444, the council of the kingdom met in Bergen to discuss the situation. The opinion prevailed that the German merchants should no longer be tolerated as a state within the state, that their privileges should be reduced to what they had been in the 13th and 14th centuries. Some of the councillors went to Copenhagen and placed this proposition before the king, who sanctioned it in a royal rescript of 1444 relative to the trade of foreign merchants in Bergen. Nothing was gained, however. In 1447, the king granted the most unrestricted privileges to the Rostock merchants to trade in the city of Oslo and Tunsberg in southern Norway, while in Bergen the commandant, Olaf Nilsson, the leader of the opposition to the Hanseatic merchants, struggled with determination, but under great difficulties, to enforce the new regulations. A most critical situation had been created when King Christopher suddenly died in 1448. In Trondheim, the Hanseatic merchants had gained no foothold, as they were forbidden to trade north of Bergen. Trondheim had always been the chief center of trade with the Norwegian colonies, especially with Iceland, but this trade declined with the decay of Norwegian commerce and sea power, and in the later Middle Ages almost nothing is known of the city's commercial activity. The Hanseatic supremacy resulted, very naturally, in a stagnation of the Norwegian cities, as the native merchants were driven out of business and the population could not grow while the trade was in the hands of unmarried foreigners, who were strictly confined within the precincts of the factory, cut off from all social intercourse with the townspeople. The attempt of Olaf Nilsson and the Norwegian Council to assert Norway's sovereign authority over these foreigners was a move in the right direction, but their zeal was greater than their strength, and the effort ended in dismal failure. End of chapter 11《ハプトゥー》です。この番組は、ノルウェーの歴史を知るためのポッドキャストです。クリスチャン・フォー・デンマークとカール・カヌーツェンのスウェーデン。As King Christopher left no children, the question arose who should be chosen his successor, if the union were to be maintained. Denmark favored the union because it was considered to be the leading kingdom. In the late reigns, the candidates for the throne had been selected by the Danish council, and the kings, who resided for the most part in Denmark, had sought to give that kingdom great preponderance in the Union. This time the Danes selected Christian of Oldenburg, another German, as their candidate, but this created great ill will among the Swedes, who claimed that the Danes had broken the Union agreement by constantly selecting the royal candidates without conferring with the other kingdoms. A small party in Sweden were favorably disposed towards the Union, but many Swedish nobles coveted the throne. In Norway, some were in favor of placing the native-born Sigurd Jonsson on the throne, but the majority were ready to abide by the choice made by the other kingdoms. In the meanwhile, Karl Knudsen had matured his plans. On May 23, 1448, he entered Stockholm with 800 armed men. A mild spring rain was falling, and this was interpreted by the common people as an auspicious omen. The great noble was the man of the hour. On June 20th, he was elected king of Sweden, and he was soon after crowned at Uppsala. The Danes were quite surprised to learn that the union had been dissolved, but they nevertheless chose their own candidate, Christian of Oldenburg, king of Denmark. In Norway, great indecision prevailed. Sigurd Jonsson, the richest noble in the kingdom, had been chosen regent, but he would not be a candidate for the throne, though he descended from King Haakon V. The council was divided into a Danish and a Swedish party. Archbishop Oslik Bolt and many of the councillors favored a union with Sweden, but Bishop Jens of Oslo and the powerful Baron Hartvig Krumendike, both of Danish birth, were eager to maintain a union with Denmark. 
They even went to Denmark as representatives of their party and acknowledged Christian of Oldenburg, king of Norway. But Archbishop Oslak Bolt with the Swedish party met at Bohus in February 1449 and chose Karl Knudsen of Sweden. In the meantime, Bishop Jens of Oslo and Hartvig Krumedika had returned from Denmark with an armed force, and the council was summoned to meet at Oslo. None of the Swedish party would meet under these circumstances, except Archbishop Oslak Bolt, who happened to be in the city. At this meeting, June 3, 1449, the Danish party chose Christian of Oldenburg king of Norway, and at a second meeting at Marstrand in July, King Christian granted the Norwegians a charter with the following main stipulations. 1. The Norwegian people should retain their laws and liberties, and the Church of Norway its rights and privileges. 2. No foreigners should receive fiefs in the kingdom, nor should they be members of the council, exempting those who already resided in Norway, or those who in the future should acquire the right of citizenship through marriage within the kingdom. 3. No important matter touching Norway should be decided except with the advice of the Norwegian council. 4. Norway should henceforth be a free, elective kingdom. 5. The king should visit the kingdom every three years. 6. The trade between Norway and Denmark should be free from duties. 7. Only in cases of emergency could the Norwegian council be summoned to meet in Denmark, and its stay there should be as short as possible. The Swedish party would not recede from their position as they resented the use of force by the leaders of the Danish party. In the fall of 1449, Karl Knudsen came to Hamar, where he was proclaimed king of Norway. On November 20th, he was crowned in Trondheim by Archbishop Oslak Bolt, after giving a charter in which he granted the prelates and the cathedral many privileges. Fifteen Norwegian nobles were knighted, and the king even sanctioned the Tunsberg Concordat of 1277 to please the archbishop. While affairs remained thus unsettled, Oslak Bolt died in 1450, and Olaf Thronson was chosen to succeed him as Archbishop of Nidaros. After his coronation, Karl Knudsen returned to Sweden, but shortly after New Year, 1450, he came to southern Norway with an army and tried to seize Oslo, which was held by Christian's chief adherent, Hartvig Krumedike. He was unable, however, to take Akershus Castle, and an armistice was concluded until the council could be assembled at Halmstad, where all disputes should be settled. When the Swedish and Danish councillors assembled in that city, May 1st, 1450, the Swedish councillors sided with the Danes, and a treaty was concluded by which it was agreed that Karl Knudsen should surrender Norway to King Christian of Denmark. That when one of the kings died, the one surviving should be king of both realms, or a regency might be established, and the choice of a king postponed until both the kings were dead, when twelve Swedish and twelve Danish councillors should meet at Halmstad, and choose a king for both realms, who should be either a Dane or a Swede. About Norway it was stated, as a sort of afterthought, that when it shall please God to unite again the three realms under one king, if it shall please the Norwegian council and the people to remain in the union, they shall enjoy with us and we with them all liberty and intercourse as stated. That Norway would remain in the Union under all circumstances was of course taken for granted by the worthy nobles who directed the political affairs of the kingdoms. Christian I was crowned in Denmark October 28, 1449, and on the same day he was married to the 18-year-old widow of King Christopher, Dorothea of Brandenburg. The following year he arrived in Norway, and the Hanseatic merchants of Bergen, who received the young king with great pomp, gave him an escort of three hundred men and five ships to accompany him to Trondheim. After the council had formally declared the election of Karl Knudsen to be null and void, King Christian was crowned in that city with elaborate ceremonies August 2, 1450. A new act of union drawn up in Bergen, dated August 29, 1450, specified the terms on which the two kingdoms should henceforth remain united. After a rather elaborate introduction, the document goes on to say, we have now, with our gracious lord and high-born prince, the said King Christian's council, will, and consent, formed a firm, perpetual, and unbreakable union between the said kingdoms of Denmark and Norway, for us and many of our brethren, the Archbishop of Lund, bishops, prelates, knights, and squires, the councils and inhabitants of both kingdoms, both those who now live and those who will be born hereafter, both born and unborn, 
with such preface and conditions that both kingdoms, Denmark and Norway, shall henceforth remain united in brotherly love and friendship, and one shall not lord it over the other, but each kingdom is to be ruled by native-born magistrates, as shown by the privileges of both kingdoms, in such wise that each kingdom enjoys, keeps, and uses freely its written laws, freedom, and privileges, old and new, which they now have, or hereafter may receive, and that both kingdoms, Denmark and Norway, shall henceforth remain under one king and lord forevermore. And the council of each kingdom, and its inhabitants, shall aid and assist the council and inhabitants of the other. And one kingdom and its people shall give the other aid and consolation as the need may be, but neither kingdom shall make war without obtaining the consent of the council of the other. But the kingdom which asks for assistance shall supply provisions and means of sustenance, and the king shall guarantee against loss. And when it shall please God to let so sad a thing happen that the king dies, then shall the kingdom in which the king dies at once invite the council of the other kingdom, and the councils of both may speedily assemble in Halmstad according to the stipulations in the earlier agreement regarding this place. If the king then has one legitimate son or more, then the council shall choose the one to be king whom they consider to be the best qualified, and the others shall be properly provided for in both kingdoms. But if such an unfortunate circumstance should occur, which God forbid that the king has no legitimate son, then shall the councils of both kingdoms nevertheless meet in the said city, and choose the one for king whom, on behalf of both kingdoms, they consider to be best qualified. In these stipulated articles neither kingdom shall suffer any slight or neglect, and especially in the choice of the king the council of each kingdom shall have full liberty, power, and free will, without let, hindrance, or deceit, and they shall not part until they have agreed upon the choice of a lord and king over both realms, and only one, but in such a way that each kingdom retains its old laws and justice, liberty, and privileges. By this agreement an important change was made in the Norwegian constitution. The old principle of an hereditary monarchy was abandoned, and an elective kingship was substituted. This change had, however, already been made in practice. After the Norwegian royal line became extinct, circumstances had made it necessary to repeatedly place kings on the vacant throne by election. In theory, the principle of hereditary kingship had, indeed, been adhered to, but as it could no longer be carried out in practice, it was becoming a mere tradition. It must be observed, however, that this tradition continued to live, and it was even strengthened by the Union kings of the House of Oldenburg, who called themselves heirs to the throne of Norway, and spoke of Norway as an hereditary kingdom. If the impression could be created that in spite of the Bergen Agreement the Oldenburg kings succeeded to the throne of Norway by right of inheritance, it would naturally tend to safeguard the Union and to bind Norway more closely to the Kingdom of Denmark. In the Articles of Union, the equality of the two kingdoms was strongly emphasized. One should not lord it over the other, but each should keep its laws, freedom, and privileges. The autonomy and sovereignty of Norway seemed thereby fully safeguarded, so far as this could be done on paper, but circumstances could not fail to operate against the maintenance of such an equality. The king resided in Denmark, where he was constantly surrounded by Danish counselors and officers of state, and in a not distant future he would naturally regard Denmark as the principal kingdom, if he did not already do so. Bygone events had already illustrated this so clearly that no doubt could exist as to the final outcome. The true character of the political situation soon revealed itself. Though King Christian had agreed to come to Norway once every three years, he did not visit the kingdom above four times after his coronation during a long reign of thirty-one years, but the administration of Norwegian affairs he nevertheless took into his own hands, and left the council of the kingdom almost wholly out of consideration. He even attempted to force upon the people the unscrupulous adventurer Marcellus as Archbishop of Trondheim, though the chapter had already chosen Olaf Thronson. Only the refusal of the Pope to consecrate that unworthy candidate saved the Church of Norway from this humiliation. His royal edicts were always prefaced with the autocratic phrases, we, Christian, by the grace of God, King of Denmark-Norway, by the Wends and Goths, Count of Oldenburg and Delmenhorst, etc. The council is seldom mentioned in these documents as if its advice or consent was a matter of slight importance. The seal of the kingdom was kept by the Danish Chancellor, while the Norwegian Chancellor became a mere judicial officer, and the office of Drotsete, the highest in the kingdom, was virtually abolished. The council, too, was allowing the control of public affairs to slip from its weakening grip. 
This became especially true after a number of immigrated Danes had become members. They had settled permanently in Norway, where they had gained wealth and social standing by marrying Norwegian heiresses, but they were still Danes in sympathy, and as they were not deeply concerned with affairs of local administration, their presence in the council rapidly destroyed its last vestige of efficiency and usefulness, and it gradually became a mere appendix to the Council of Denmark. The Norwegian clergy was still native-born and national-spirited, but it had been weakened like the aristocracy and could no longer assert its former independence. Coming events cast their shadows before. Christian, the king by divine right and the grace of God, had given the Norwegian people a first installment of Oldenburg absolutism. King Christian's policy was wholly dictated by dynastic and Danish interests. In Bergen, Olaf Nilsson had struggled earnestly, though not with proper moderation, to enforce the laws against the Hanseatic merchants. Sometimes he had even used violent and lawless means to subdue them. While Christopher lived, he supported Nelson, but Christian changed this method. He needed the support of the Hansa towns in a war with Sweden, and he considered it more important to win their friendship than to compel obedience to the laws of Norway. In 1453, he arrived in Bergen accompanied by his queen, and summoned Nelson to answer to charges preferred against him by the merchants. Nilsson sought safety in flight, and only after the king had issued a safe conduct did he return to Bergen to answer the accusations. King Christian confiscated all his fiefs and appointed a Swede, Magnus Gren, commandant in Bergen. But the doughty baron would not submit. He seized the strong castle of Elfsborg at the mouth of the Goethe River, and threatened to hand it over to the Swedes if the king did not return to him his fiefs, and reinstate him as commandant. The king now found it advisable to yield, and Olaf Nilsson returned to Bergen. But while at Elfsborg he had sent out privateers to prey upon Hanseatic merchant ships, and the merchants conspired to kill him. When he appeared at the city thing, he was attacked by an armed force, and when he fled to the monastery at Munkeliv, the merchants, to the number of two thousand, stormed the monastery, slew Bishop Thorleif and several priests before the altar of the church, and killed in all sixty men. Nilsson had sought refuge in the tower, but they set fire to the buildings. The monastery was destroyed, and he was seized and put to death. King Christian did nothing to punish the offenders, though they were sentenced to rebuild the monastery at their own expense. The king did not care much about it, as it pleased him that Olaf was killed, because he had opposed the king and had offended him by seizing Elfsborg Castle, says the chronicler. In 1469, he even granted them full pardon upon the request of the cities of Lübeck and Hamburg, and released them on behalf of the kingdom from any obligations to pay damages. He had, indeed, earned the praise of the Lübeck chronicler, who calls him Angenedic, Mildic, Sachtmodic, Förster. Other arbitrary and unstatesmanlike acts of the king were equally prejudicial to the interests of the realm. In 1469, his daughter Margaret was married to King James III of Scotland, but Christian I, who spent money lavishly and always was in financial difficulties, could not pay the stipulated dowry. In the marriage contract, he agreed to annul the annuity payable to the Kingdom of Norway in consideration of the secession of the Hebrides according to the Treaty of Perth, and also the unpaid arrear of this annuity. Of the 60,000 gulden to be paid as dowry, only 10,000 should be paid immediately, and as security for the balance he mortgaged the Orkneys to Scotland by a document dated September 8, 1468. When a fleet arrived in Copenhagen to bring the bride home, he was not able to pay more than 2,000 gulden, and as security for the remaining 8,000 he also included the Shetland Islands in the mortgage, 1469. All this was done without consulting the Norwegian Council, and as these debts were never paid, the mortgaged islands were annexed to Scotland, and Norway was thus made to pay the whole expense of the marriage of the king's daughter. King Christian I was a tall and stately man, fond of luxury and display. Our Kaiser characterizes him as follows. He was a shrewd statesman according to the standards of his times, but he lacked sincerity and mental depth. He was active, but cannot be called a good ruler. He was brave without being a great general. He was, finally, such a wretched manager of the finances of his kingdoms that the Swedes very aptly called him the bottomless purse. In his administrative policy he was guided by family interests and love of power and dominion rather than by true concern for the welfare of his realm and the happiness of his subjects. The year after his coronation as king of Norway we find him engaged in a war with Sweden, 
which was begun for the most trivial reasons, the real cause being jealousy and rivalry between the two kings. An armed force from Norway attacked Vermland even before war had been declared, but in 1452 Karl Knudsen formally declared war against Christian I and marched with an army into Skåne. Trundelagen was occupied by a Swedish force under Göran Karlsson, and another attack was directed against Bohus in southern Norway. An armistice was concluded in 1453, which lasted for two years, but in 1455 the war was renewed. Karl Knudsen was a weak and unpopular king. He had failed to secure the throne of Norway, Gothland had been taken by Christian I, and he had many powerful opponents among the nobles who reluctantly had placed him on the throne. In 1457, his old enemy, Archbishop Jöns of Uppsala, nailed a proclamation on the door of the cathedral, renouncing his allegiance to him. Stockholm was quickly invested, and Karl Knudsen, who found the situation hopeless, fled to Danzig, where he was harbored by King Casimir IV of Poland. Christian I, who by fair promises had gained strong support among the nobility, was placed on the throne of Sweden. In 1460 he was also elected Duke of Holstein and Count of Schleswig and Stormarn, whereby these provinces were united with the crown of Denmark. No king in the north had ever ruled so large a realm as the one now united under his scepter, but it was loosely knit together and badly governed. The outward greatness represented no corresponding internal strength. J. E. Sars says, Never has Norway been governed so wretchedly as under the first king of a dynasty, which to such a remarkable degree should become the object of the Norwegian people's loyalty and devotion. The thirty-one years during which this king ruled belong to the saddest in our history, not only because of the many harmful measures due to his weakness and recklessness, his lack of will and ability to do his duty to Norway, but also of the perfect tranquility which continued to exist in spite of his maladministration. But that great ill will had been quietly stored up became manifest when the king died. In Sweden, King Christian's government was no less unpopular than in Norway. His purse was always empty, and as he agreed to pay claims to the heirs of the former princes of Schleswig Holstein to the amount of 103,000 gulden, he resorted to the levying of heavy taxes and loans, secured by mortgages and castles and crown lands, to increase his revenues. These heavy burdens created the greatest discontent. In 1463, while the king tried to levy an extra tax for an expedition against Russia, a revolt broke out led by Archbishop Jöns of Uppsala, who was an irreconcilable opponent of both Karl Knudsen and the Danes. The uprising was suppressed with great severity, and the archbishop was brought captive to Denmark, but King Christian returned home only to find that new trouble had broken out. In the winter of 1464, he led an army into Sweden, but was defeated at Helleskog by the Swedish peasants under Sten Sture. When he also found that Stockholm was closely besieged, he abandoned the campaign and returned home. Karl Knudsen was recalled, but Archbishop Jöns, who had returned from his captivity, stirred up his partisans against him, and when he found the situation as hopeless as before, he formally abdicated promised never again to aspire to the throne, and retired to his estates in Finland, 1465. The ambitious archbishop was now chosen regent, but he did not long retain the high office, as other nobles also aspired to the honor. The following year, Eric Axelsson thought, succeeded him, and the crafty prelate died soon after on the island of Öland, poor and in exile, mourned by none, hated by many, and feared by all. Karl Knudsen again became king of Sweden, but Christian I would not give up the hope of regaining the Swedish throne, an aim which had become more difficult of attaining since the struggle was no longer a mere contest between rival aspirants to the throne, but a patriotic endeavor of the Swedish people to rid themselves of Danish overlordship. On his deathbed Karl Knudsen exhorted the people to fight to the utmost against the Danes, and Sten Sture, who was chosen regent by the council, rallied the people round his standards to fight for the national cause. King Christian does not seem to have fully grasped the situation. In 1471 he arrived before Kalmar with a fleet of seventy ships, and advanced a little later to Stockholm. He still hoped to accomplish his purpose through negotiations, but if this failed he trusted in his armed knights. He landed his forces and took up a strong position at Brunkeberg, but on the 10th of October he was attacked by Sten Sture and suffered a crushing defeat. Christian himself was brought to his ships severely wounded. The victory was decisive. 
Sweden had successfully maintained her independence. In 1474, King Christian made a journey to Rome with a large escort. In Rotenburg in Germany, he visited Emperor Frederick III, who received him well, hoping to gain his support against Charles the Bold and the Turks. The emperor united Holstein and Stormhorn into a dukedom, into which he also incorporated Ditmarsken, which had hitherto been an independent republic, and this new duchy of Holstein he granted King Christian I as a fief, evidently for the purpose of gaining his goodwill. Why Christian undertook this journey is not known, and little good came of it. His expenses were large, and when he came to Italy he had to borrow money from the Hanseatic merchants, who were willing enough to grant him the necessary loans, knowing that they would be able to obtain charters and trade privileges in return. By a letter of September 6, 1474, the king annulled all restrictions placed on the trade of the Hanseatic merchants in Oslo and Tunsberg, for the good will and love which the Rostock merchants had shown him, and confirmed all the privileges which had been granted them by his predecessors. In 1469 he had issued a letter which ensured them against competition from the Hollanders, by restricting the trade of Holland merchants in Bergen to one or two cargoes a year. King Christian had diligently sought to please the Hanseatic merchants and to maintain their hated commercial monopoly. In vain, the people of Bergen complained of outrages committed by them. The king would not be annoyed. He suffered the laws to sleep and his own pledges to remain a dead letter, but the ill will created by his wretched rule did not find expression until after his death, which occurred May 22, 1481. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2, by Knut Gershut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of King Hans, John At the time of King Christian's death, his son and successor Hans was 26 years old. As early as 1458, the Norwegian council had made a written promise that he should succeed his father on the throne of Norway. When it shall please God, says the letter, to call our gracious Lord from this world, then will we in love and obedience accept and receive his eldest son, if God lets him live. But if he dies, then his gracious son, who is the next oldest, son after son, to whom we now, one after another, with this our open letter and power, pay homage and receive as our rightful Lord and King of Norway, and we will faithfully serve and obey him. In 1480 this promise was renewed by the Norwegian council in Halmstad, where Hans was made co-regent with his father. Even in his father's lifetime he had been in Norway, where he had exercised royal administrative authority and had styled himself the son of King Christian, elected King of Denmark and rightful heir to the throne of Norway. But when Christian died, the Norwegians showed no inclination to accept Hans as their king in spite of these promises. Misgovernment had made them cautious, and they were now fully determined to seek redress for past wrongs before another king was placed on the throne. On February 1, 1482, 16 members of the Norwegian Council entered into an agreement with deputies from Sweden that the two kingdoms should aid one another in defending their rights and liberties, and that in the election of a king neither should take any step not sanctioned by the council of the other. The Norwegian councillors at the same time issued a letter in which they recounted the injuries which the Kingdom of Norway had suffered in King Christian's reign, the mortgaging of the Orkney and Shetland Islands, the outrages committed in Bergen by the Hanseatic merchants in 1455, when no attempt was made by the king to punish the guilty parties, the privileges granted by Christian I to the German cities, the harmful journeys by which the council had been compelled to leave the kingdom, the numerous wars which had been forced upon the people without the consent of the council, that the revenues of the kingdom had been sent out of the country, that Bohus and other fiefs had been granted to foreigners against the advice of the council, and that these foreigners had received greater powers and privileges in Christian's time than ever at any time before. When we made complaints against the foreigners, we could receive no justice, but if one of our own citizens broke the laws, he was most severely punished. This indictment of the late king breathes a bitter resentment which could not easily be appeased. In former elections, the Danish council had at times acted too hastily. This time it proceeded with greater caution. The situation was difficult. Sweden had already broken away from the Union, the duchies of Schleswig-Holstein were but loosely connected with the crown, and in Norway great dissatisfaction prevailed. Under these circumstances Denmark could not proceed to elect a king alone without incurring the risk of destroying the Union. 
In August 1482, the Danish and Swedish counselors met at Kalmar, where they agreed that peace should exist between the two kingdoms, and that they should be united under the same king, but the Swedes would not elect a king, as the Norwegian counselors were not present. A new meeting was to be assembled at Halmstad, January 13, 1483, as it was hoped that Norway would then be represented. In the meantime, the Danes tried to persuade the Norwegian counselors to join them in electing Hans, but this they would not do until they received full assurance of redress of grievances. They were especially aggrieved because a Danish noble, Jürgen Larensen, had been made commandant of Bohu's castle without the consent of the council. They determined to drive away the hated commandant by force, and the people of the neighboring districts rallied to their support. The council wrote to their Swedish colleagues complaining of the humiliations and grievances which Norway had suffered. The Danes urged the Norwegians to desist from the siege of Bohu's castle, but the councillors replied in a second letter to their Swedish brethren that it would be a harmful peace if each realm did not maintain its rights at home or defend its own thanes and territories. According to the terms of the Act of Union, each kingdom should aid the other herein instead of placing obstacles in its way. The Swedes gave them no support in the attack on Bohus, but invited them to meet with the Swedish and Danish councillors in Hamstad, January 13, 1483, to negotiate regarding the interests and welfare of the three realms. The besiegers were unable to capture the strong castle, and as the Danes removed the commandant, the council found that under the circumstances they could do no better than to attend the Hamstad conference. Sixteen Danes and nine Norwegians met on the date fixed. Two weeks later, four Swedish delegates arrived, but as they had no power to participate in the election of a king, the Danes and Norwegians chose Hans to be the king of Denmark and Norway, and issued a charter according to which he should rule both kingdoms. In this document, signed and sworn to by the king, every precaution seems to have been taken to safeguard the privileges of the church, to guarantee the laws, liberties, and full equality of the two kingdoms, and to secure full assurance of redress of grievances. The king promised to maintain the rights and privileges of the church and the clergy as they had been confirmed by the pope, and to rule each kingdom according to its own laws and charters. No foreigners should be made members of the council of the kingdom, nor should castles or fiefs be granted to foreigners, but the kingdom should be ruled by native-born men. No taxes should be levied, no city, castle, lands, or fiefs should be mortgaged or sold, no officials appointed, no one should be made a member of the council, no privileges should be granted to foreign merchants except by the advice and consent of the council of the kingdom. Each kingdom should have its own archives and treasury, and each should mint its own coin, which should be of equal value. The king should spend an equal length of time in each kingdom, and when he was not present in the realm, a commission consisting of four members of the council should have full authority to maintain law and order. The king also promised to redeem the lands and revenues belonging to the kingdom of Norway, which had been alienated in the reign of his father, King Christian I, and to see that full restitution was made for the outrages committed in Bergen against Olaf Nilsson and others. The Norwegian council, furthermore, was to meet once every two years in Bergen and Oslo alternately, whether the king was present in the kingdom or not, and the king pledged himself to sanction and enforce all its decrees. King Hans was crowned in Copenhagen, May 18, 1483, and in Trondheim, July 20th of the same year. In Sweden, the able Sten Sture was regent. He did not attempt to seize the crown, as Karl Knudsen had done, but he did not favor the election of Hans, and seems to have opposed a union with Denmark on any conditions. The councillors had indeed agreed to a union with Denmark and Norway under a joint king, but in consenting to accept Hans as king of Sweden, they submitted a charter which would place all power in the hands of the nobles and reduce the king to a mere name. As these terms could not be accepted by the Danish councillors, no choice was made, and the question continued to be agitated. Sten Sture was supported by the common people, but the nobles opposed him, and in order to drive him from power they organized a strong party of opposition against him and turned to King Hans for aid. Sture, who still championed Swedish independence, would not yield, and war broke out in 1497. The struggle could not last long, as the forces placed in the field by King Hans and his supporters were too strong to be successfully resisted. Elfsborg was taken, and a large Danish army advanced against Kalmar. Sture hastened to Stockholm to defend the capital, but the Danes seized Brunkeberg, and after defeating a force of Dalkalian peasants who were marching to his aid, they took Stockholm. Elfsborg fell, and Sture was forced to give up the struggle. On November 25, 1497, 
Hans was proclaimed king of Sweden, and the union of the three kingdoms was again established, although Sweden, as represented by Sten Sture's party, had entered into the new compact as a most unwilling partner. In order to make the union stable and permanent, the Swedish council agreed that Prince Christian, the son of King Hans, should succeed his father to the throne, and he was formally hailed as heir to the throne of Sweden at Stockholm in 1499. The commercial affairs of the north were at this time in a chaotic state. Hostilities had broken out between England and Denmark-Norway, because English merchants continued to trade with Iceland, although the trade with the Norwegian colonies was a crown monopoly. In Norway, the ill-will against the Hanseatic merchants had been increased by the outrages in Bergen, and the murder of Olaf Nilsson in 1455, to such a degree that in the charter issued by King Hans in 1483, most important trade regulations were made, which, if carried out, would have destroyed the commercial monopoly of the Hanseatic League. Merchants from all countries should be allowed to trade in Norway without hindrance, and the Hollanders especially should enjoy the same freedom as of old, but the Hanseatic merchants should not be allowed to carry on trade with Iceland, nor should the king grant any privileges to foreign merchants, except with the advice of the council. Lübeck and the other Hansa towns understood what the ultimate result would be if this provision was carried into effect, and a struggle began between Denmark-Norway and the Hanseatic cities, which resulted in the discomfiture of the Hanseatic League in the first part of the next century. The contest, which began as diplomatic negotiations, soon turned into a struggle between buccaneers, supported secretly or openly by both sides, and finally it developed into an open war in which large fleets fought great naval battles. During the buccaneering activity in the early part of the conflict, the Baltic and the North Sea were swept by professional corsairs like Pining and Pothorst, and great damage was done to commerce. Loud complaints were made, especially by the Hanseatic merchants of London, of these freebooters, who preyed extensively on English commerce. But peaceful conditions gradually returned only after Denmark and Norway in 1489 modified the charter regarding trade in the interest of the Hanseatic merchants. On January 20, 1490, King Hans and Henry VII of England concluded a treaty of peace and friendly intercourse between their realms. The trade with Iceland was made free, not only for the English, but also for the Hollanders in the Hanseatic cities. King Hans had been willing enough to subscribe to charters, but in the keeping of them he had emulated his father, King Christian I. He had agreed not to grant castles or fiefs to foreigners, but in his reign Danish nobles held Akershus, Bohus, and Bergen. The Dane, Anders Mus, became Bishop of Oslo, and another, Erik Valkendorf, was made Archbishop of Trondheim. Now, as before, the charters remained a dead letter, though the king had pledged himself in the strongest terms to rule according to them. No such overt harm was done the kingdom in Hans's reign as in that of his predecessor, but the disappointment was nevertheless great, and the dissatisfaction general. Danish Lensmen and Fogids still remained in charge of the local administration, though the charter stated that the kingdom should be ruled by native-born men, and as these foreign officials used their office to enrich themselves, they often treated the people with intolerable injustice. The Bunder knew how to resist. When their patience was exhausted, they seized the Fogids and put them to death. They lacked neither the will nor the ability to defend their rights, but there were no leaders like Sten Sture in Sweden to organize a general uprising and give it a national consecration. The leading men of the kingdom were divided into two parties, one favoring Denmark and the other Sweden, but there was no national Norwegian party to maintain the autonomy of the realm and the chartered rights of the people. The leader of the Danish party at this time was Hartvig Krumedika, commandant of Bohus Castle and a special favorite of the king. The leader of the Swedish party was Knut Olfsson, commandant of Akershus Castle, who on the mother's side was of Swedish descent. The fight between the nobles and their adherents has been interpreted by some writers as a national struggle, in which Knut Olfsson represented the cause of Norwegian national independence, but this episode can scarcely be regarded as anything but a feud between rival factions without any deeper national significance. Olfsson lacked the qualities of a leader, and the struggle with Krumedika seems to have been inspired by personal enmity rather than by lofty ideas of an independent Norway. The direct cause of this revolt was a local disturbance in Romerika, where the Fogid, Lasse Skjold, had so exasperated the people by his extortions that they rose against him and put him to death. The uprising, although not dangerous, assumed such proportions that Knut Olsen, who was commandant of Akershus, feared that he would be unable to cope with it, and he asked Henry Krumedika of Bohus for aid. Krumedika not only failed to respond, 
but it seems that he had succeeded in arousing the king's suspicion as to Alvesen's loyalty, and that he had been secretly encouraged by the king to watch his movements. Alvesen lost the king's favor. He was relieved of his command of Akersus, and a Danish noble, Peter Gris, was appointed to succeed him. A bloody feud ensued, and Alvesen turned to Sweden for aid. He raised an armed force in that kingdom and made a raid into Norway, but he was driven back by the king's adherents. Those who were dissatisfied flocked to his standards, and Eric Gildensterne, the Danish commandant of Elfsborg, joined him. Likewise also Niels Ravaldsson of Olavsborg in Viken. Akershus, Tunsberg, Marstrand, and Sarpsborg were taken, and Krumadika was striving to hold his own at Bohus. King Hans could not come to Norway, but he sent his son Christian, now twenty-one years old, to take command. The prince showed a most resolute spirit, and soon got the situation under control. Bohus was relieved, and Gildensterne surrendered Elfsburg after a few days' siege, though a Swedish army under Alfsen had arrived in the neighborhood to support him. When he arrived in the Swedish camp, he was killed by the angry soldiers who looked upon him as a traitor. After an expedition into Vermland, Prince Christian returned to Denmark, leaving Krumadika in command. Tunsberg was soon captured, and Knut Alfsen hastened to the support of Akersus, but as he feared the outcome of an armed conflict, he decided to try negotiations. Provided with a safe conduct, he boarded Krumadika's ship. But a quarrel between the rivals ensued, and Alfsen was slain, 1502. For this misdeed, Krumadika was compelled to leave Norway, and the uprising was not put down till 1504. In 1506, Prince Christian returned to Norway with full royal power. He was a man of great energy and ability, influenced by the new ideas of humanism in the Renaissance. Disposed by nature to brook no restraint, he paid little attention to conventionalities. In Bergen, he became enamored with a fair damsel, Diveka, the little dove, whose mother, Sigbert Willems, was shopkeeper in the city. She was introduced to the prince at a ball, and being greatly impressed with her rare beauty, he danced with her, says the old historian, and this was the cause of his dancing away from these three kingdoms, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. This is undoubtedly an exaggeration, but Divica became his mistress, and the attachment of the prince for the girl and her mother plays an important part in his reign. In public, as in private life, he was guided by his own impulses, which inclined him to favor the common people. He soon became their favorite, and many a goblet of ale was drunk to the health of the good Prince Christian. He sought to encourage Norwegian trade, and granted the merchants of Amsterdam permission to trade in Bergen and everywhere in Norway. In 1508 he annulled the special privileges of the Rostock merchants in Oslo and Tunsberg, and granted them the same rights as native citizens, where they settled permanently in the city and bore their share of the public burdens. The following year he placed important restrictions upon the Hanseatic merchants of Bergen and increased the privileges of the native traders. The castle of the city was also rebuilt, so that the commandant ultimately became able to force the Hanseatic factory into submission. The people of the cities might have reason to be satisfied with Prince Christian's efforts to improve conditions, but in the country districts the Danish fogids were still allowed to continue their extortionate practices unmolested. In 1508 a new revolt broke out in southeastern Norway. Under the leadership of one of their own number, Herlog Hufudfath, the Bunder of Hedemarken rose against the Danish fogids, slew one of them, and drove away another. Christian suppressed the revolt with the cruel severity usually practiced in those days, when the rulers knew better how to punish offenses than to remove their cause. The leaders of the uprising were captured and brought to Akusus, where they were put to the torture and executed as traitors. The heads of the unfortunate offenders were put on stakes and exhibited to the gaze of the multitude. That of Herlog Herfudfat was placed in the center and crowned in mockery with an iron crown. Even Bishop Karl of Hamar, who on very slight evidence was held to be implicated in the uprising, was thrown into prison, and it is a singular manifestation of the growing weakness of the church that he was suffered to remain incarcerated till his death without being convicted of any wrongdoing, even without being granted a trial. This unnecessary harshness reveals in the prince an innate cruelty, an irresponsible fierceness of temper, which proved his undoing after years of struggles had fully awakened the bloodthirstiness of his savage heart. In his administration of state affairs, Prince Christian was as despotic as he was hard-hearted in dealing with opponents and defenders. The council was almost wholly disregarded and could exercise no influence. Norwegian nobles were deprived of their fiefs, 
and Danes were appointed in their place in open violation of the charters. The kingdom was not ruled by native-born officials according to the charters, but by the king with the aid of the Danish nobles, while the power of the council was chiefly limited to judicial matters. But Christian's impulsive nature and democratic manners had gained for him a reputation as the people's friend, and he became a great favorite of the common classes, a distinction of which he was not wholly undeserving. For though a tyrant at heart, he possessed an instinctive appreciation of justice, and as his habits inclined him to favor the common people, he often championed their rights, if for no other reason than out of spite against the nobles, whom he hated. The kingdom of Sweden was tied to King Hans and the Union by very slender threads of loyalty, and these were suddenly rent by the king's unfortunate expedition to Ditmarsken. It has already been stated elsewhere that Emperor Frederick III incorporated this province together with Stormarn in the Duchy of Holstein, which he granted King Christian I of Denmark in 1474. Ditmarsken was a marshy district between the rivers Elba and Eider, protected against inundations by great dikes along the North Sea. The land had to be ditched and drained, but as the Ditmarskers were industrious and intelligent, their land was well tilled, and their country was a republic where the people governed themselves. To the rapacious nobility and land-hungry kings, this morsel was very tempting, but King Christian died before he could take possession of it. King Hans was determined to make good his claim, and the nobles joined his standards in unusually large numbers in anticipation of the rich booty which they were sure to secure. In 1500, Hans marched against Ditmarsken with an army of 15,000 men, consisting of nobles and German mercenaries. The Ditmarskers retreated before this large force, but on the road to Hemingstedt, their leader, Wolf Isebrand, fortified himself with a force of 500 men and placed some guns in position. When King Hans arrived on February 17th, rain was falling in torrents, and the Danish army was crowded together on the narrow road, on either side of which were broad ditches filled with water. The Ditmarskers opened fire. The Danes could neither advance nor retreat, and a fearful panic ensued. All order and discipline vanished, and the army was converted into a struggling mass of horses and men, trying in vain to extricate themselves. The horses sank to their knees in the mud, or tumbled headlong with their riders into the ditches. The spirited attack of the Ditmarskers sealed the doom of the entrapped army. The dikes were cut, and the North Sea rolled its billows over the marshy plains, while the peasants jumped around on their long poles, dealing death and destruction on every hand. The king escaped, but the army was destroyed. The Danebrog banner was lost, and enormous quantities of supplies fell into the hands of the Ditmarskers. King Hans's defeat made a deep impression on the whole north. In Sweden, where the people had grown restive under his rule, because he had failed to keep his promise to rule according to the charters, his discomfiture caused great excitement, and soon a well-organized revolt was set on foot. Sten Stura was again chosen regent, and the castles through the country were seized in rapid succession until only Borgholm and Kalmar remained in the hands of the king's adherents. Stockholm was ably defended by Queen Christina. The city was treacherously surrendered to Sten Stura in the fall of 1501, but not till in the spring when all stores were exhausted did the brave queen surrender the castle. King Hans himself arrived the day after with a fleet of thirty vessels, too late to be of any service. When Sten Stura died in 1503, Svantes Stura was chosen to succeed him. An armistice was concluded, and the councils of the three kingdoms should meet at Kalmar to negotiate a settlement of the difficulties, but Svantes Stura did not appear, and in 1506 hostilities were revived. As Denmark was again becoming a naval power, the campaigns of the next three years were largely waged on the sea. King Hans had hired shipbuilders in Holland, and many vessels were added to the fleet every year. In 1502, he came to Stockholm with 30 ships. In 1505, he arrived in Kalmar with twice that number. Denmark was beginning to develop the Royal Navy, which in future years was to be her main strength. The islands of Erland and Gothland, which were still in the hands of the Danes, afforded them a most favorable vantage ground, whence their able sea captains, Jens Holgersson, Otto Rude, and Søren Norby, whom the king had made chief commander of the royal fleet, harried the Swedish coasts, and swept the Baltic Sea clean of merchant vessels going to and from Sweden. Søren Norby captured Kastelholm in the Åland Islands, and Otto Rude ravaged the coasts of Finland and sacked Åbo. 
The plan was to destroy all commerce with Sweden and starve the kingdom into submission. In 1509, the leaders of the Swedish uprising had to yield. They promised to pay the king 12,000 marks and his queen, Christina, 1,000 marks a year until the councils of the three realms could assemble in joint meeting to place either King Hans or his son Christian on the throne of Sweden. But the peace did not last long. In 1510, Lübeck declared war against King Hans, and Sweden seized the opportunity to join the Hanseatic cities on the Baltic coast in a coalition against Denmark. Jens Holgersson, who was made commander of the Danish fleet, fought a great naval battle with the Lübeckers off Bornholm, August 9, 1511. The combat was indecisive, both sides claiming the victory. A second battle took place on the 14th of the same month near the coast of Mecklenburg with the same result. The next year Lübeck made peace on terms very favorable to Denmark. The Hanseatic cities could no longer claim naval supremacy in the north. The creation of a navy was the one great service which King Hans rendered the kingdom of Denmark. In his efforts to subdue Sweden he was unsuccessful. Svante died in 1512, but Sten Sture, the younger was chosen to succeed him as regent, and when peace was concluded in 1512, Sweden renewed the promises of 1509, but the union was not re-established. In 1513, King Hans died quite suddenly, 58 years of age. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Literature and Intellectual Life in the 14th and 15th Centuries In Norway, as elsewhere in the Middle Ages, the Church was the custodian of the higher intellectual culture, as well as of the religious training of the people. As the kingdom had no university, the only seats of learning were the cathedral or Latin schools connected with the cathedral chapters. According to universal practice, each cathedral maintained a higher school, cathedral school, under the leadership of a scholasticus, or schoolmaster, where the students were instructed in the branches necessary for those who were to take holy orders. Most of the parish priests had received their training in the cathedral schools, aside from the private tuition by which they were prepared to enter the schools, and their own diligent study in the libraries connected with the cathedrals. Those who wished to get a university training had to go abroad. In the 13th and 14th centuries, Paris, Orleans, Prague, and Bologna were much frequented by Norwegian students. And later, Oxford, Cambridge, Louvain, Leiden, Cologne, Leipzig, and others were also sought. In 1418, the University of Rostock was founded, and because of the lively commercial intercourse which the Hanseatic merchants maintained with the North, the Norwegian students found it most convenient to go to Rostock, which in a sense became the University of Norway. Footnote. Poor students could generally receive financial aid. In Catholic times, the tithes were divided into four parts, so that the king, the church, the priest, and the poor should receive an equal portion. But the bunder reserved the right to control the portion falling to the poor. Hence it was called bondeloden, i.e. the bunder's portion. By the statute of December 20th, 1436, it was ordained that half of this portion should be used for the support of poor students. End footnote. The cathedral chapters maintained here a separate residence for the Norwegian students, the Domus Sancti Olavi, and the university records show that they attended in considerable numbers. Even after the University of Copenhagen was founded in 1479, the Norwegian students continued to go to Rostock until after the Reformation, when the University of Wittenberg became especially attractive to Lutherans. Footnote. Many students from the north also attended the University of Greifswald, founded in 1456. The University of Uppsala, Sweden, was founded in 1477. End footnote. Not till in the 17th century, when the kings by royal decrees made it difficult for Norwegians and Danes to visit foreign universities, did the stream of Norwegian students turn to Copenhagen. The union with Denmark only served to retard the development of learning and higher culture in Norway, as Copenhagen became the center of intellectual life of both kingdoms. Norway did not receive a university like Denmark and Sweden, and while the art of printing was introduced very early in Denmark, it was not brought to Norway for some time, since the books used continued to be printed in Copenhagen or other Danish or foreign cities. The historian Sum says, In the time of King Hans, the art of printing was brought hither. 
In 1486, the first Latin book was printed in the city of Schleswig, in 1493 in Copenhagen, and in 1495 the first Danish book was printed in the same city, both by Gottfried of Gannon. In Latin, Danish, and Low German, we have some chronicles from those times written in Denmark and Holstein. Christian Petersen, canon in Lund, was a remarkable man. He was the first to print Saxo Grammaticus in Paris. Of the New Testament, we received a few Danish translations, and Wormortius translated the Psalter into Danish. Christian II was a lover of medicine and alchemy, and he forbade any of his subjects to visit foreign universities until they had become baccalaureae in Copenhagen. In Norway, no such progress was made. A few books were indeed written, but they were either printed abroad, especially in Copenhagen, Paris, and Rostock, or they were left unpublished. The first Norwegian printing establishment was set up in Christiania by Tiga Nielsen in 1643, in which year he printed three small books, Enkesuk, and Merkelig Visa, and Enni Almanach. After the Old Norse literary period came to a close about 1350, the Norwegian language underwent a rapid change, which in the Middle Norse period, 1350 to 1525, transformed it in all essential respects into modern Norwegian. This change seems to have been due in part to the almost total interruption of the old literary activity, which had hitherto maintained a literary language more or less divergent from the spoken tongue. But in general, the change parallels the development of other European languages, and must be viewed as part of a great linguistic movement. The new Norwegian was not destined, however, like other modern tongues, to become a literary language. This was prevented by the union with Denmark, which grew to be intellectual as well as political. The two kingdoms had indeed been united on equal terms, but the king and court resided in Denmark, and after 1450 Danish was exclusively used as the official language even in purely Norwegian affairs. A Dane, Erik Valkendorf, became Archbishop of Trondheim, 1510. Danes were appointed to other high offices, both in church and state, and Danish gradually became the written language of the upper classes. The University of Copenhagen, the Danish publishing houses, and finally the Reformation, in the interest of which Danish religious books were introduced in Norway, contributed to make Danish the church and school language, as it had already become the official language of the kingdom. In the cities, and among the clergy and upper classes, the Danish tongue in a greatly modified form became in time also the spoken language, while Norwegian became the despised vernacular of the common people. It continued to be spoken by the great majority, especially in the country districts, but the officials, the learned classes, and the burghers allied themselves with the Danish. To speak this language even imperfectly was henceforth regarded as a sign of culture and refinement, while the Norwegian tongue became a symbol of Arcadian rusticity. But this Danish-Norwegian city language experienced a slow growth. Professor Halfdan Kote shows that it did not become a living tongue in Norway till towards the close of the 18th century. Through the unfortunate circumstance that higher culture in Norway began to look to Denmark as its source, and thereby became associated with a foreign language, a cleavage occurred in the intellectual life of the nation which has not yet been fully healed. Culturally, the people were divided into two groups. The cities, who prided themselves in their Danish-Norwegian heritage and higher city culture, which was Danish in character and grew to be clannish in spirit, and the country people, who spoke their own vernacular, lived their own intellectual life, and had no share in the higher city culture. In course of time, the Danish culture, as well as the Danish language, became nationalized through the constant influence of environment, and assumed a Norwegian character, but this transformation was slowly consummated. The more prominent traits of intellectual life are reflected especially clearly in the literature of the period. The creative productiveness of the higher circles may be said to have ceased, but the educated classes possessed a certain diligent erudition, of which we find evidence in the numerous charters, letters, and public documents which have been published in a large series of volumes under the title Diplomatarium Norwegicum. Another large collection of laws and other legal documents has lately been published under the title Norges Gomlelova, on den Rake. In Iceland, where the interest in the sagas continued to live, some important saga compilations were made as the Hrokenskina and the Flatjarbok. A collection of Icelandic public documents has also been published under the title Diplomatarium Icelandicum. This literature, published by the classes representing the higher culture, 
shows an interest in jurisprudence in political and commercial affairs and learned activity, but none whatever in history, poetry, and storytelling, in a word, in literature properly so called. Love for the spiritless scholastic learning had replaced the old interest for history and literary art. But poesy was not dead. It continued to flourish where it had always flourished even before the old Norse literature was produced, among the common people. The poesy which blossomed forth among the unlettered and unlearned classes was a direct continuation of the best features and more popular elements of the Old Norse literature. The old spirit of the Norwegian people reasserted itself in this new poesy, unguided but also unhampered by the arbitrary rules of art, which had finally enveloped the Old Norse poetry like a hard crust, completely arresting its development. In the middle period, the upper classes ceased to cultivate literature. Thereby, poesy emancipated itself from learning, and returned to its own haunts to frolic about the fresh fountainheads from which it was originally led forth. It can scarcely be regarded as a misfortune that it deserted the halls and the court circles where it had been reduced to bondage, and fled back to the bosom of the common people, where it could begin to live again, because it found its own necessary environment, freedom. The middle period of Norwegian literature can scarcely be called the dead period, as some critics have ventured to suggest. It is in many ways one of the most important formative periods in Norwegian literary history, when poetry for the first time enters fully into its own, when it acquires the true universality of the art, and begins to express with charming artlessness the native mysticism, the national dreams, the joys and sorrows of the people. Even when modern Norwegian literature began to develop, it had to turn back to this period, and tune the harp to its melodies to find again the fundamental chords of true poesy which the two learned poets had forgotten. The middle period has not only left us one of the richest treasures among the rich stories of poesy and prose narratives in the North, which is read and admired even now to an extent which might make the masters envious, but it has done Northern literature an even greater service by rediscovering and reopening the eternal fountains of poesy, without which the great triumphs in modern literary art might never have been won. Had the upper classes continued to control the literary production, their learning might have spoiled their poetry, and we should not have had a literature so expressive of the spirit and character of the age as the folk tales, folk songs, and ballads of the common people. It would have been a literature for the upper classes, lacking the truly national element, and it is doubtful if it would have possessed the high value of the folk literature even when measured by modern standards of art. The folk literature may be divided into three main groups, the folk songs, the traditional and legendary tales, sagan, and the folk and fairy tales, eventyr. In all of these we find a new literary form, as well as a new literary spirit. In the folk songs the rhyme has replaced the old alliterative verse, and the refrain is generally, though not always, employed. The folk song has adapted itself to two new arts, music and the dance, and it is generally held, no doubt correctly, that this new poetic form had been imported together with the latter from southern Europe. In the song dance, which gradually became the great diversion of the common people, the trio, poesy, music, and dance, were again united, as they had been even among the Greeks of old. This form of the dance originated quite early in Norway, and in Iceland it is mentioned even in the 11th century. It was a home dance performed in the house in winter, but in the summer generally out of doors. All could take part, young and old, men and women formed a circle by holding each other's hands. The leader sang the song, and the others joined in the refrain, while all kept time to the melody. And as the song proceeded, all entered more and more into the spirit of it, and lived over again the saga which the song narrated. The dance became dramatic. The song was the chief thing in the dance, and all who took part were supposed to know it so well that they could accompany it with motions and facial expressions. Hulda Garborg says, The song dance strengthened and revived the interest in history, since the song so often dealt with stories from the sagas. This pastime was especially entertaining and useful during the long winters when the people stayed mostly indoors. For the young people, the dance also became a school, an introduction to the old life, and a strengthening of the love of home and kindred. The young people learned also through the singing of the songs the good traits which the song especially praised, courage and manhood, honesty and courtesy, chivalry, self-sacrifice in love, and friendship unto death. 
but shame and disgrace befell the coward and the one who was dishonest and faithless. Often the song stimulated the people's minds by wit and sarcasm. Yes, the song dance was used even as a judicial tribunal. If a man had done something wrong, two strong men took him between them into the dance and let him listen to verses full of spite and mockery sung about his conduct. But he was allowed to reply as well as he could, and when they thought that he had heard enough, the case was thereby regarded as settled. In the folk songs, the epic and lyric elements are most intimately combined. The song is usually epic, as it narrates a story based on the sagas or other traditions, or even on mythology. The background of the narrative is often dark and mystic, but through the softer undertones breathes a deep feeling of joy or sorrow which concentrates itself in the purely lyrical refrain. The Faroe Islands have the greatest collection of purely epic folk songs found in the north. The oldest of them, and in fact the oldest folk songs known, are the Sjörtharkfeði, or songs about Sigurd Fafnesbein. In Iceland, the folk songs died out, because the dance was forbidden by the church, and only fragments are now in existence. From the Shetland Islands, only one song has been preserved, the Hildenachvad, written down in the 18th century in a language half Norse and half English. Travelers who saw the song dance in these islands at that time state that here, as in the Faroe Islands, the songs dealt especially with episodes from Norwegian history. In Norway, many large collections of folk songs have been published, and the work of collecting them is not yet completed. Hitherto, the largest and most noted collection is the Norske Folkeviser by M. B. Lundstad. The traditional tales may be divided into two main groups, the mythological and the legendary historical. Those of the first group form a continuation of the myths in a disguised form, especially those of the more popular features of the old faith which had become most intimately connected with the people's everyday life. Thor, the most popular of the gods, the trolls, which are but a variation of the old Jotuns, the fairy, the mountain spirits, mermaids, elves, etc., are still met with in these tales. The old gods had ceased to be regarded as divinities, but they continued to live in the popular imagination as evil spirits who exerted a powerful influence on people's lives and destiny. The conception of the powerful Thor had been too deeply engrafted on the minds of the Norwegian people to be suddenly eradicated even by a change of faith. Though no longer worshipped as a god, he continued to exercise a magic influence in their lives. Thursday evening had yet its own significance. The magic plants used in medicine had to be picked on Thursday evening to have healing qualities, and food had to be placed by the barn on Thursday evening for the elves to gain their goodwill. Characteristic was also the belief in the Oscarsre, a fearful caravan which was thought to ride through the air on dark, wild horses. This procession consisted of the spirits of the dead who in their natural life had not done evil enough to be condemned to hell, but who were unhappy and without peace after death. Thor, as a spirit of evil, Sigurd the slayer of Fafner and Gudrun, who has been substituted for hell, are the most conspicuous figures of the procession as it rides through the air to places where fights and murders occur to fetch the souls of the slain. People were afraid to stand outdoors after dark lest the Oscar's Rai should come and snatch them away, but the sign of the cross placed on the house door was a sure protection. The legendary historical tales are especially connected with the national hero St. Olaf and the ravages of the Black Death. In these stories, the red-bearded St. Olaf has been substituted for the red-bearded Thor of mythology. It is St. Olaf with his battle-axe who wages war against the trolls and other forces of evil, as Thor swung his hammer Mjolnir against the Jotuns of old. Some of the tales are religious and legendary, while others are so closely connected with history that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish facts from fiction. The tales relating to the Black Death have already been mentioned. To these may be added the numerous Bigdesagen, or local traditions of more or less historic character, found in all parts of the country. Ludwig Dye says of these, the stories which we still find preserved by the inhabitants of a certain guard, farm, through generations, bear the closest resemblance to the sagas of all popular traditions. These old traditions have often a great value for the history of culture, even if the individual features of the stories themselves may seem insignificant. They are of so much the greater interest because they have been preserved through centuries. Many traditions of a more poetic character are also found, some of which seem to be of foreign origin, 
while others originated at home during the later romantic period of the saga literature. Of such may be mentioned the tales about Hagbert and Signe, Aslaug Kraka, King Bela and Thorsten Vikingsson, and others. The resemblance which these tales bear to the sagas is especially conspicuous in the interest manifested for family relationship and the love of historic narrative, which soon convinces us that they are pieces cut from the same cloth. But the old Norse art of storytelling, which had been developed in the saga period, is found also in the folk and fairy tales, eventir. As to contents, these tales are pure invention. If traced to their obscure origin, many of the traditions on which the stories are based may even be found to have been brought from foreign lands, but this is of secondary importance. The scenery, the characters, temperament, and language of the persons depicted in the narrative are not only Norwegian, but typically so. The very texture of the story is characteristic Norwegian art. In southern lands, the adventure was the chief feature of the story. In the Norwegian tales, the interest centers about the character of the persons depicted. Character painting, psychological analysis, is as much the art secret in the folk and fairy tales as it was in the sagas, and so it continues to be in Norwegian prose narrative even to the present. The storyteller unveils to us a character and starts him on his career. Everything, even his boldest adventurers, bear the impress of his personality and follows as a matter of course. Whatever he does, he must do, in a sense. He will do good, bad, great, mean, or foolish things, not because of circumstances, but because he is good, bad, great, mean, or foolish. His career is not a chain of romantic accidents, but the gradual unfolding of an inner law. The most typical characters created by the Norwegian folk and fairy tales are the three brothers Peter, Paul, and Esben Askelad. Esben, the youngest of the three brothers, seems to be the idealized Viking chieftain lifted into the realm of poetry. Like the Viking, he is the younger brother who finds his fortune only by leaving home. He is young and inexperienced and has never done anything but dig in the ashes of the fireplace. His older brothers ridicule him. He encounters the greatest difficulties, but he finally triumphs because of superior talents, patience, and perseverance, just as many a Viking chieftain had done, and wins the princess and half the kingdom. We can scarcely doubt that the Norwegian people were reviving the memories of the Viking period in these stories about Espen Askeladd. After they had quit seeking adventures with the sword, they began to live over again in literature the experiences of the nation. In the sagas, these experiences had been narrated as history. In these tales, they reappear as poetry. Espen becomes as typical a representative of the Middle Period as the Viking chieftains and warrior kings were of the Viking Age. He is no blood-stained warrior who goes forth to kill and plunder. He is not only brave, but also kind and sympathetic, and his very kindness is a secret source of power which helps him in the greatest trials. In this respect, he forms a contrast to his older brothers, who have caught nothing of the new spirit. Espen's victories were moral and intellectual victories, giving promise of a new era when moral and intellectual forces should begin to establish their superiority over brute strength. This new spirit touched the heartstrings and gave expression to the finer feelings which the skaldic poetry had refused to recognize. The rusty portals thereby swung open to new possibilities. For the first time, the poet could sing about what he had never seen, about what might and ought to be. Poesy was no longer chained by rules of art to past events, for imagination and feeling had been set free. Poverty and labor, sorrow and hardships might continue to build their prison walls. The human spirit could rise on the wings of poetry to an ideal world where no limitations existed, to that beautiful castle of its own creation, the castle east of the sun and west of the moon. This enthroning of creative imagination is the beginning of poetry in a modern sense, when it becomes a vehicle for bringing the ideal world into the realm of human experience as a new force of life. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Local and General Administration When the Lendermand office was abolished in 1308, the administration of internal affairs was left wholly with the Sisselmand, who were royal officials. 
In the 14th century, as already stated, the Sislamid were called the King's Fogids, Vogt, from advocatus, i.e. royal agent, and it became customary to farm out to them the royal revenues of the Sissel, or district, in lieu of which they were to pay a certain sum to the royal purse. The Sissel might also be granted them quit or frit, i.e. without returns. As the Sisselmen were regarded as royal agents to whom the districts were in a way granted for administrative purposes, the Sissels came to be called Lens, and the Sisselmen Lensmen, or Lensherr, while the older term Fogid was applied to a class of inferior officials. The Lens were divided into smaller administrative districts, called Fogderier, in each of which the Lensherr appointed Fogids as the local administrative officers. But the Fogids had to swear obedience to the king, and were not the personal representatives of the Lanzara. Under the Fogids stood the Bunderlandsmend, two in each Filka, who served as tax collectors and police officials. It had been ordained by the law of 1293 that the Sisselmen should appoint these Lensmen from among the most intelligent and upright Bunder of the district. Hence they were called Bunderlandsmend, to distinguish them from the Lensmen proper, or Lanzara. The lens were of two kinds, principal and inferior. The principal lens were ten in number, Bohus, Akershus, Brunle, Pratsburg, Agdesiden, Stravanger, Bergenhus, Trondheim, Nordland, and Vardehus. The lensherre exercised both civil and military authority in his len, but his office was appointive, not hereditary. He was appointed for life, for a fixed number of years, or for an indefinite period, but he might be removed by the king at any time. The royal lensmen could only collect the fixed and customary dues. According to the laws of 1297, 1455, and 1539, they were forbidden to levy new taxes or to change the tax rates except with the consent of the people. But this very important provision was often violated, especially by the greedy fogids, who forced the people to pay more than their just dues, and if anyone resisted forcibly, he was in danger of being treated as a rebel. But when the people assembled at the thing, they might refuse to pay a tax even if the king had levied it. When Stig Baga, at the Filkis thing in Sogndal in 1532, read a letter from the king announcing that a new tax had been imposed, the people took the matter under advisement, whereupon they declared with uplifted swords that as they had paid heavy taxes the last year, they would pay nothing this year until midsummer, and this resolve they maintained in spite of the threats of the royal lensmen. A similar action had been taken at the Filkis thing at Halsa in 1484. As both personal and property rights were often infringed upon by the Fogids, the royal lensmen, and even by the king himself, the people demanded that these rights should be safeguarded by the royal charters. By a royal decree of June 25, 1455, the king's lensmen and other officials were forbidden to oppress the people, to impose unlawful taxes, or to seize or imprison anyone without due process of law. Similar provisions are found in the Swedish charter of King Christian I, and in the charters issued by King Hans and his successors. The thing system still existed, but the power of the lawmaking had been gradually assumed by the king, who in such matters was suffered to act in conformity with the advice of the council. The people's consent expressed through the thing was generally, though not always, asked for, but it had ceased to be anything but a mere matter of form. Perhaps the chief reason why the things ceased to take an active part in legislation was that the laws were considered permanent, and the king's lawmaking power was very limited. He could issue ordinances in regard to special matters, but he had to take an oath to obey and uphold the Code of Magnus Lagobutter, which was considered to be the essential and permanent laws of the land. The Council of the Realm shared the sovereign power with the king, and in some respects it was even placed above him. It acted not only as an advisory body, but the king had to obtain its consent in all important matters. The charter granted by Christian I states that no important errand shall be undertaken or fulfilled unless a majority of the council consents thereto. When the king died, the council assumed full sovereign authority and acted as a regency, or it chose a regent to act in the interim until a new king was placed on the throne. But although the king's sovereign authority was thus divided and limited, the council was no ministry representing the will of the people, as in modern constitutional monarchies, and when we accept the chancellor, who was the king's private secretary, 
the councillors did not assist the king as cabinet members in the routine work of his administrative duties. The members of the council did not stay in the same place, but lived scattered through the kingdom, and because of the expenses and difficulties connected with travel in those days, they could meet only on special occasions when they were summoned by the king. How often these meetings were held cannot be determined with certainty. According to King Hans's charter, the council should be assembled once every two years in Oslo and Bergen alternately. Because of the slow and difficult process of assembling the council, it was stated in Karl Knudsen's charter that the king should obtain its advice except in cases of emergency, when he might act without consulting it. This was a dangerous concession, as it became possible for the king to wholly ignore the council on the plea of emergency, and we have already observed a growing tendency on the part of the Union kings to wholly disregard the Norwegian council. End of chapter 15「History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian II. The Dawn of a New Era. Christian, the son of King Hans, was born July 1, 1481, and was at the time of his father's death 32 years of age. As a child, he was so wild and untractable that his father placed him in the family of a well-to-do merchant, Hans Meisenheim. But after a month had passed, the merchant's wife, a very good and conscientious woman, refused to have the responsibility of keeping him. He was then placed in the home of his tutor, but after a short time he was brought back to the palace where he received a new tutor, the humanist Conrad of Brandenburg. Under his guidance, the young prince was made acquainted with the new ideas of the Renaissance, which seemed to have greatly interested the wide-awake pupil. Christian was a gifted boy and when he grew to manhood he was especially well-developed both intellectually and physically. He had lofty plans and a resolute will to accomplish great things. He was energetic and courageous, but suspicion and a tendency to faithlessness and melancholy were serious defects in his character which early manifested themselves. At the age of twenty-one he was placed in command of the army sent to Norway to quell the uprising led by Knut Alfsen, and a few years later he again returned as the ruler of the kingdom, clothed with full sovereign power. That he would become his father's successor was no longer doubtful. In 1487, while he was only six years old, the Danish estates had hailed him as his father's successor on the throne of Denmark. Two years later, the Norwegian council decided that he should succeed his father on the throne of Norway, and in Sweden he had been hailed as heir to the throne in 1499. But Stensturra's revolt had created new difficulties. Upon the death of King Hans in 1513, the councils of the three kingdoms were summoned to meet in Copenhagen, but only nine Swedish councillors met, and they had received such limited power that they could not settle the one great question, the attitude of Sweden to the Union. The Danish and Norwegian councillors then undertook to formulate their demands in charters which the king would be asked to sign. The Norwegian councillors prefaced their demands with a complaint that the king had called himself the rightful heir to the Norwegian kingdom although Norway was now an elective monarchy, and furthermore that King Hans, contrary to the oath which he had taken, had not redeemed the Orkney and Shetland Islands, or the annuities to be paid for the Hebrides and Man according to the Treaty of Perth. Then follows a series of demands by which the councillors sought to safeguard the autonomy of Norway, and to maintain its equality with Denmark and the Union. Towards the Danish council the king was very condescending, but the demands of the Norwegian councillors he treated with haughty disfavor. Some he refused to grant, some he passed over in silence, and others he referred to the Danish council. To the very reasonable request that the castles and lends of Norway should be granted to native lords, he returned the answer through his chancellor that since the nobility of Norway was almost extinct, he would grant the lends and castles of the kingdom to Danes and native born lords. The ecclesiastical offices over which the crown exercised the right of patronage would be given to native-born Danes and Norwegians, and none but Danes and Norwegians should be appointed to members of the Norwegian council. This was tantamount to saying that Norway should be ruled by Danes, not by native-born officials. No special charter was granted Norway, but the Danish charter was to be considered as applying to both realms, a step which destroyed the equality of the two kingdoms in the Union. This rather brutal disregard for the acknowledged rights of Norway he could show, because he knew that the kingdom lacked an efficient military organization, and that the Norwegian council had no means of enforcing its demands. 
But it is a question, says Sars, if it was politically correct for Christian II to take the greatest possible advantage of this weakness in the way he did, or if it must not rather be said that by his conduct in this instance he showed the same violent greed for power, the political short-sightedness, and lack of true statesmanship which always characterized his conduct. The charter was finally accepted, and the councils adjourned to meet again in June 1515, for the purpose of settling the difficult question regarding Sweden. On June 11th, 1514, King Christian was crowned at Copenhagen, and a little later he was also crowned at Oslo as King of Norway. On the day of his coronation as King of Denmark, Christian II was married to Isabella, or Elizabeth, the sister of Emperor Charles V of Spain and Germany. At the marriage ceremony he was represented by Mogens Jeu, who acted as his proxy as the young bride, who was only thirteen years old, did not arrive in Denmark till the following year, when the wedding was celebrated at Copenhagen. The young queen soon found that her husband was cold and indifferent. His heart still clung to Diveka, whom he refused to give up. To the appeals which foreign ambassadors and others made to him on this point, he answered with characteristic haughtiness that this was a matter with which they should not meddle. Queen Elizabeth bore her lot patiently, and proved herself a lady of such excellent qualities that she won the sympathy even of Diveka's mother, Sigbrit, who upon her daughter's death transferred her motherly affections to the young queen. But many years passed before the king learned to properly esteem his legally wedded wife. In June 1517, Diveka died very suddenly, and the story was told that she had been poisoned by some cherries which the nobleman Torburn Oxe had sent her. For a time the king was overwhelmed with grief and mental gloom. Suspicion pointed to Torburn, who indiscreetly said things which further aroused the king's anger, and his hatred once kindled was always deadly. He did not rest until Torburn was sentenced to death, and in spite of intercessions in behalf of the condemned man, he caused the death sentence to be carried out. From this time forth, Diveka's mother, Sigbrit, enjoyed the king's confidence to the fullest extent and exercised unlimited power and influence at court. She seems to have belonged to the plain townspeople of her native city of Amsterdam, but she possessed a degree of learning quite unusual among those classes at that time. She was especially well-versed both in alchemy and medicine, but the real secret of her power lay in the ability to control all who came under the spell of her influence. If the courtiers and nobles had hoped to destroy her power by removing Diveka, they were now compelled instead to wait in corridors and antechambers until it pleased Madame Sigbrit to admit them into the royal presence, and she did not hesitate to treat them as truant schoolboys, or upon occasion even to chide the king himself. But she used her power with discretion. She was instrumental in bringing about the best relations between the king and his young queen, whom she had learned to love as her own daughter. In the affairs of government, her influence was everywhere visible, and gives evidence of the practical ability and shrewd intrigue which enabled her to play her part so successfully. Archbishop Valkendorf of Trondheim, who had sought to remove Diverka, had to leave his archdiocese. He repaired to Rome to lay his case before the Pope, but died there in 1522, and the following year Olaf Engelbrechtsson, dean of the cathedral chapter in Trondheim, was chosen his successor. Sigbert gained full control of the customs and duties of the realm, and gradually assumed direction of all financial affairs, and she also acted in other matters as the king's chief counselor and assistant. The king did not fail to devote some attention to the Norwegian colonial possessions, but his efforts seemed to have been the result of sudden and easily abandoned impulses, rather than of a systematically pursued plan. For over a hundred years, the colonies in Greenland had remained wholly cut off from all communication with Norway, and they were at this time well nigh forgotten. Archbishop Valkendorf made the first attempt to re-establish communications with Greenland. He gathered what information he could find, and wrote very detailed directions for the captains who were to make the voyages to the colonies. The king aided him enthusiastically, inspired no doubt by the accounts of the great voyages which were being made to the New World. But Sigbert's opposition to the archbishop, and his flight from his diocese, put a sudden stop to the undertaking. The trade with Iceland continued to create complications requiring diplomatic negotiations. Commerce had not yet been reduced to the system of peaceful and well-regulated intercourse between nations as in modern times, for although treaties were made for the regulation of trade, the merchants still retained too much of the spirit of belligerent navigators or roving adventurers to be bound by conventions, either written or oral. The 16th century was, throughout, a period of hazardous enterprise, of sharp competition, 
and the use of the club law in the harbors and upon the high seas. If Englishmen came in too close a touch with Germans, Spaniards, or other rivals, the treaty provisions were none too closely scrutinized, and many a violent encounter followed. Such brawls between Norwegian and English traders had not been unknown in the past, and they were reenacted in Iceland, where competition for the trade led to frequent outrages and serious troubles even after commerce was made free in 1490. From 1507, the complaints of the Danish and Norwegian merchants of their English competitors were constantly growing louder, until armed conflict broke out, and in 1510 or 1511, the English who had established themselves in Iceland were driven away. The following year, they returned with increased forces, captured one of the royal ships, and killed one of the king's secretaries and several of the crew. When Christian II ascended the throne, he complained of these outrages to King Henry VIII of England, who was at that time engaged in a war with Scotland. So long as the war lasted, Henry was very polite and regretted deeply the acts of lawlessness committed by his subjects. But when peace was concluded, he suddenly changed. With a haughty air, he told the ambassadors that the Icelanders had been treated as they deserved. He refused to pay any damages, and affected to be granting a special favor when he consented, in 1515, to a renewal of the Treaty of 1490 by which further depredations were to be prevented. The 15th century had been a time of intellectual awakening in Europe. Humanism and the Renaissance had gradually moved northward across the Alps like the coming summer, and the effect produced by the ferment of the new learning began to make itself felt, not only in art and literature, but also in the growth of new social ideas. In Germany, the reform movement inaugurated by John Hus and the subsequent wars of the Hussites had created a religious revival tinged with a patriotic spirit. With this movement, humanism allied itself on its northward march. In Germany, the new learning was partly turned into religious channels, and as many of the humanists sprang from the common classes, the new movement became both intellectually and socially antagonistic to the Roman hierarchy, with its old scholastic learning and its aristocratic feudalistic ideas. This intellectual awakening prepared the way for the Reformation, which followed in the wake of the new learning. The reformers appealed to the common people in their own mother tongue, and proclaimed their right to govern themselves in religious affairs. The Protestant churches became national and democratic in conformity with the intellectual tendencies of the age. This important change, accompanied by greater freedom of the individual in matters of religious doctrine, finally broke the spell of the Roman incubus, and ushered in a new era of intellectual and social development. The new ideas of the Renaissance came also to the north. In Denmark especially, very appreciable traces of humanistic activity are to be found. But as the movement was late in appearing, it received no distinct development, but was soon fused with the Lutheran Reformation which followed in its wake. In the time of Christian II, Luther began his great church reformation in Germany. On October 31, 1517, he nailed his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg in which he attacked especially the sale of indulgences, and urged the necessity of true repentance. The attention attracted by these theses astonished even Luther himself. In fourteen days they ran through all Germany, he says, for all the world complained of the sale of indulgences. In 1520 Luther was excommunicated, a step which completed the rupture between him and the Roman pontiff. Accompanied by the students of the university, he marched to the Elster Gate of the city, where he publicly burned the papal bull as a sign that he renounced all allegiance to the Pope. Luther's teachings soon became known in Denmark, and Christian II was favorably impressed with his doctrines. He had been influenced from childhood by the liberal ideas of the Renaissance, and he hated the arrogant clergy, as well as the powerful nobility. He held quite advanced views with regard to the education of the common classes and the limitation of the power of the bishops and the monastic orders but in his inclination towards the doctrines of Luther it is impossible to discover any motive but love of power and desire for gain. The new teachings would give him the longed-for opportunity to extend his power at the expense of the clergy. This would be scarcely less welcome than the opportunity to increase his revenues by suppressing the monasteries, even as his contemporary Henry VIII did in England. His attitude to the papal agents who were selling indulgences in the north also points to this desire as the prime motive for his interest in church reform. In 1518, John Angelus Archimboldus came to the north as papal legate, 
ostensibly for the purpose of settling a quarrel between the Swedish bishop, Gustav Trolla, and Sten Sture the Younger, but it soon became evident that his real aim was to sell indulgences. Christian II granted him permission to carry on this trade throughout his realms in consideration of the payment of the small sum of 1,120 Rhenish gulden, the legate promising to use his influence in the king's behalf in Sweden. Agents were dispatched to Bergen and even to Iceland. His chief assistant, Diedrich Slaghek of Westphalia, was sent to Sweden, whither Archimboldist himself soon followed. But Stensture, who knew the legate's mercenary motives, soon won him to his side by bribes, and the prelate's perfidious conduct so angered King Christian that he ordered him and his assistants to be arrested. By timely flight they saved themselves, but the money and goods which they had collected and stored in various places were seized by the king's officers. Even a sum of 3,000 to 4,000 marks, which had been deposited with the Bishop of Bergen, was swept into the royal coffers. This episode very naturally strengthened the king's sympathy for Luther and his teachings. He was persuaded to send for a Lutheran minister to introduce Lutheranism in Denmark, and Elector Frederick of Saxony sent Martin Reinhard to Copenhagen in 1520. But Reinhard could not speak Danish and had to employ as interpreter Paulus Elie, Paul Ellison, a monk from Elsinore, Helsinger, who soon became discouraged, and again accepted the Catholic faith. Reinhard could accomplish nothing and had to return to Germany. Christian seems to have continued to be well disposed towards the Reformation, but grave political disturbances, and especially the war with Sweden, prevented him from introducing it in his realm. Norway had hitherto remained wholly untouched by the great reform movement, but the tyrannical king, who thought more of property than of faith, nevertheless secularized the two Norwegian monasteries of Dragsmark and Gimse. In Sweden, the old feud between the rival families of Sture and Trolla was continued by Archbishop Trolla and Sten Sture the Younger. Hostilities broke out between the two factions, but Trolla defended himself successfully in his strong castle of Steka in Melleren. Meanwhile, a greater danger threatened Sture from without. At a council in Arboga in January 1517, he had declared that he would never recognize Christian II as king of Sweden, and the people supported him with enthusiasm, but under the circumstances a war with Denmark was unavoidable. Christian II, who lacked funds, found difficulty in equipping an army for the campaign in Sweden. When at length he sent 4,000 men and 20 ships to relieve Steke Castle, where Gustav Trolla was closely besieged, the army was defeated, the castle was destroyed, and Archbishop Trolla was deposed and imprisoned as a traitor to his country. But Christian II would not give up the idea of conquering Sweden. On January 29, 1518, he landed an army at Stockholm and laid siege to the city. But when Sture arrived with a large force, he had to resort to peace negotiations as he lacked provisions and ammunition, and his German mercenaries were deserting in large numbers. A year's truce was arranged, but the king planned to capture Sten Sture by treachery. He invited him to a conference and promised to give hostages, but Sture refused and in turn invited King Christian on the same conditions. Christian accepted, but as soon as he had the hostages in his power, he annulled the truce and set sail for Denmark. One of the hostages thus abducted was the young nobleman Gustav Eriksson Vasa, the later liberator of Sweden. The increase of taxes due to Christian's warlike expeditions weighed heavily on the people, and caused much suffering and discontent. But such matters did not for a moment cause the tyrannous king to pause in the pursuit of his selfish aims. The toll paid by the German merchants in passing the sound was increased in flagrant violation of stipulated agreements with the German cities. Soldiers were hired in Germany, France, and Scotland, and the Norwegian magnates had to furnish a certain number of armed men. The king would not halt until Sweden was subdued. The Pope was persuaded to sanction the excommunication which Archbishop Berger had already fulminated against Tenstura. Sweden was placed under interdict, and Christian was commissioned to inflict the requisite punishment upon the kingdom. This gave Christian's war of conquest even a religious tinge, as he could now earn the blessing and gratitude of the Pope by winning the throne of Sweden. In 1520 he entered Smallland with a large army. In Vestergutland, the invaders encountered the Swedes under Sten Sture, who had stationed himself in the neighborhood of Bogesund. In the battle which ensued, Sture was wounded, his army was thrown into confusion, and fled from the field. 
At Tividen, a second engagement was fought, and the Danes were again victorious. The wounded Stensturra was brought in a sleigh across Lake Melleren, towards Stockholm, but died from his wounds before reaching the city, only twenty-seven or twenty-eight years of age. Though young in years, he was as able as he was heroic, and he is justly regarded as one of the noblest characters in Swedish history. Under these circumstances, many of the leaders lost courage and would have given up the struggle, but Stensturra's widow, Christina Gildensterna, who conducted the defense of Stockholm, refused to surrender the city. The struggle continued, and the invaders suffered heavy losses, but when Christian II arrived with a fleet and blockaded Stockholm, Christina was finally forced to surrender, September 7, 1520. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian II the Tyrant, the Stockholm Massacre From the moment that Sweden submitted, Christian II treated the kingdom with the arrogance of a conqueror. The councillors were summoned to meet in the Grey Friars Monastery, where Bishop Jens Beldenach explained to them that the king was the rightful heir to the Swedish throne according to the law of St. Eric. A trace of relationship between Christian II and St. Eric might indeed be figured out, but the claim that for this reason he was heir to the throne of an elective monarchy was a self-evident prevarication, which only illustrates how the king would respect the laws and institutions of the realm which he was henceforth to govern. On November 1st, 1520, he was proclaimed king according to the principle of hereditary kingship, which he had proclaimed. The coronation occurred November 4th. Elaborate festivities were arranged for the succeeding days, and most of the Swedish nobility had assembled in the capital for the occasion. Now that the king had reached the goal of his ambition, and the crowns of the three realms had been united on his brow, Nothing could seem more natural than to seek to win the support of all for the new order of things by a conciliatory policy. The more hideous is the thought that in the midst of the coronation festivities he was conceiving the plot for one of the darkest crimes which history has recorded. The despicable creature, Didrik Slughek, and the revengeful Gustav Trolla, the archbishop, were constantly about the king and filled his dark mind with most pernicious counsel. On the 7th of November, a large number of nobles, men and women, and a number of leading citizens were summoned to the royal palace. The doors were locked behind them, and Gustav Trolla stepped forward to accuse them of various crimes. They had driven him from his archdiocese, they had razed his castle, and they had used violence against the servants of the church, he claimed. He demanded an indemnity of 500,000 marks for the losses sustained by himself and other bishops, a sum so enormous that it would have ruined all against whom he directed his charges. He further demanded that the assembled lords and ladies should be imprisoned until they could be sentenced by the king, who would receive God's reward and the praise of all Christendom for meting out punishment to these heretics. The assembled nobles were struck with consternation, as they realized but too well that a plot had been laid for their destruction. The only one who for the moment retained full composure was Sten Stura's young nephew, Christina Gillensterna. She showed that the proceedings against Gustav Trolla had been decided by a general diet, and that if punishment should be meted out, the whole nation would have to be punished, and not only a few individual lords. But this gave the king a new opportunity. The action of the diet was interpreted as rebellion against the pope, i.e. it was heresy, for which the king could punish them in the name of the church. All were hurried off to prison, and the next day, after a mock trial had been conducted, the king sentenced them to death as heretics. Now began the carnival of blood known as the Stockholm Massacre, the direction of which was left to Diedrich Slaghek. On the 8th of November, 82 persons were beheaded on the public square of the city, among others the bishops of Strangnas and Skara, many aldermen of the city, and a large number of the leading men of Sweden. Sten Stura's body, as well as that of his dead child, was exhumed and burned with the bodies of the executed. The massacre spread also to the provinces, and it seems to have been the king's mad purpose to destroy the whole nobility of Sweden with one fell stroke. Stenstura and his adherents had been excommunicated, and it was therefore possible for the king and his evil counselors to carry on their fiendish work of destruction without incurring the execration of all Christendom. 
When the king left Stockholm to return to Denmark, he left a trail of blood. In Jokoping, several persons were executed. At Nidala Monastery, the abbot and several monks were drowned, and Christina Hildensterna, together with many other ladies, was carried into captivity in Denmark. Christian II had well earned the title of Christian the Tyrant. Even among the Danes themselves, the king's vile deed caused general consternation. The great sea captain, Sir Norby, did not conceal his ill will, even in the king's presence, and Otto Quimpen resigned as general of the army. The shock of abhorrence, which at first stunned all, was soon followed in all the realms by a storm of indignation so violent that it hurled Christian the tyrant from the throne which he had so wantonly disgraced. The young Gustav Eriksson Vasa, one of the Swedish nobles whom Christian II had kidnapped and brought to Denmark, escaped from his captivity and fled to Lübeck, whence he returned to Sweden. His father was one of the victims of the Stockholm massacre, and the king engaged spies to seize the young nobleman, who henceforward bent his great energy and remarkable talents to the one great task of freeing his country from the tyrant's grasp. The accounts of his wanderings and hairbreadth escape from his pursuers read like a romance. In vain he tried to rouse his countrymen. At Kalmar and in Smallland, he attempted it and failed, and even in Dalarna the peasants would give him no support, though they listened with reverence to his eloquent appeals. Hunted from place to place, wandering in disguise through remote settlements, despairing of success, he finally resolved to seek refuge in Norway. But when the Dalkarlians received proof of King Christian's cruelties, they repented and sent messengers to bring Gustav Vasa back to Sweden. On his return they chose him Lord and Chief of Dalarna and of the Kingdom of Sweden. In January 1521. At the head of a few poorly equipped peasants, Gustav Vasa resolutely raised the standard of revolt against the hated tyrant, and thanks to the incompetency of Diedrich Slagek, whom King Christian II had entrusted with the administration of Sweden, he was rapidly increasing his forces. Not till April did Slagheck and Gustav Trolla take the field against him, and they were defeated at Brunsbeck on the Dal River. Gustav Vasa's forces soon numbered 15,000 men, and at Vesteros, the government forces under Slagheck suffered a second defeat. At this critical juncture, King Christian was in the Netherlands visiting his brother-in-law, Emperor Charles V and his henchmen in Sweden were unable to cope with the rapidly spreading uprising. Gustav Vasa was unable to take Stockholm, but in the country districts the revolution had great success. Diedrich Slagheck was recalled to Copenhagen, and Gustav Trolla succeeded him in the management of affairs in Sweden, but he was as unable to accomplish anything as his predecessor. Before the end of the year, 1521, Stockholm, Kalmar, and Albo in Finland were the only larger cities which had not been surrendered to Gustav. As Stockholm could not be taken without the assistance of a fleet, since the redoubtable Sir Norby, who commanded the Danish fleet, carried supplies to the city, Gustav turned to Lübeck for aid, and the merchants of that city responded by sending a fleet of ten ships to blockade the city. The king, who was hard-pressed by the Hanseatic fleets, as well as by a revolt at home, could pay but slight attention to Sweden. Gustav Vasa was proclaimed king at a diet in Strängnäs, June 6, 1523, and shortly afterward the surrender of Stockholm ended the struggle which terminated for all times the unfortunate union with Denmark. The sufferings caused by Christian's tyranny and the subsequent war of liberation had awakened a strong national spirit which launched the Swedish people upon a new period of development, the era of national greatness, when Sweden under the guidance of a dynasty of great national kings rose to become one of the great powers of Europe. King Christian's tyranny and short-sightedness had not only cost him the throne of Sweden, but he had alienated the hearts of his own people, and had created an opposition which must have made him feel uncomfortable even on the throne of Denmark. The Hollanders had been offended by the arbitrary increase of the sound toll, and the Lübeckers, who had supported Gustav Vasa, fought resolutely for their naval supremacy in the Baltic Sea and in defense of their trade which Christians sought to check by creating a strong Scandinavian trade company which could compete successfully with the Hanseatic merchants. Against his foreign enemies he could get little support at home, since he had always been an enemy both of the clergy and the nobility. He summoned the council to meet at Copenhagen in November, but instead of obeying this summons, the councillors from Jutland met at Viborg, and formed a conspiracy to drive Christian II from the throne. On January 20th, 1523, 
the councilors renounced their allegiance to him, stating as their reason for this act that the king had violated the charter to which he had sworn at his coronation, that he had disregarded the council and the nobility, and had given preferment to ignoble knaves, and especially to the wicked woman Sigbrit, that pursuant to the council of these he had beheaded many Swedish nobles, also Knut Knutsen Bot in Norway, and had driven away the Archbishop of Trondhjem, and had ill-treated many other bishops. The disaffected councillors raised an army of 20,000 or 30,000 men, while Frederick, Duke of Holstein, an uncle of Christian II, who was their candidate for the throne, took the field with a force of 6,000 men. Yet the situation was far from hopeless. Christian could count on the support of the common people, and he might also have raised forces in Norway, but he was as irresolute now that danger threatened him as he had been overbearing and tyrannical while his subjects remained submissive. Duke Frederick was proclaimed King of Denmark at Viborg, March 26, 1523. Jutland and Fien joined him. Holland, Blekinge, and the Norwegian province of Viken were in the hands of Gustav Vasa, and the fleet, which the king had neglected, was unable to cope with the Lübeckers. Meanwhile, Christian sat inactive in Copenhagen, nursing his own gloomy thoughts. On April 13th, he sailed from the city with a fleet of 20 ships, accompanied by his family, Madame Sigbert, and a few friends to seek assistance in foreign lands. The occasion was a solemn one, and the people watched with tearful eyes the departure of their king. The reign of Christian II was ended. His remaining years proved but a doleful sequel to a misspent life. Some features of his rule are, however, worthy of commendation. As he was especially interested in education, he made the provision that better qualified teachers should be employed, that they should receive better salaries, and that cruel flogging of the children in the schools should be restricted. In the country districts where no schools were established, the people might send their children to be instructed by the parish priest or some man of learning in the town. As lawmaker, he sought to protect the common people against oppression. He prohibited the imposition of excessive fines, a punishment so often inflicted by the clergy for the smallest violation of the rules of the church, and the landlords were forbidden to oppress their tenants by increasing the rents. He encouraged trade and attempted to limit the power of the Hanseatic merchants. A uniform system of weights and measures was introduced, and the king also tried to create a postal system by hiring mail carriers, who should receive three skillings for carrying a letter a distance of seven miles. With his Renaissance and Reformation ideas, and his solicitude for the welfare of the common people, his reign might have become a new era of progress if his gloomy and bloodthirsty mind had not vitiated every nobler effort. The Norwegians took no part in the uprising against Christian II, as the king was generally well liked in Norway. But though it has been suggested that they might have retained Christian as their king and dissolved the union with Denmark, such a step would undoubtedly have been prevented by Sweden and Denmark, where he was feared as well as hated. The Norwegians were, moreover, unable to act independently at this moment. The principal cities were held by Danish commandants, Archbishop Valkendorf, the president of the council, was dead, his successor, Olaf Engelbrechtsson, was in Rome to receive the consecration of the Pope, and there was virtually no government in the country. When the news of Christian's overthrow reached Norway, Nils Henriksen Yildenova of Ostrot and Olaf Gala of Tom met with a few others to confer regarding the affairs of the kingdom. It was decided that Nils Henriksen should take possession of Bergen and assume control of the northern part of the kingdom, while Olaf Gala should act as governor of the southern part but Nils Henriksen was unable to take Bergen, which was defended by the Danish commandant Hans Knudsen, and Olaf Gala was no more successful in southern Norway. Frederick I soon gained the allegiance of the whole kingdom of Denmark, and as the three chief strategic points, the castles Akershus, Bergenhus, and Bohus, were held by the Danish commandants, who would transfer their support to the new king if proper inducements were offered, it was quite certain that the union of the two kingdoms would be continued. King Frederick I sent Henrik Krumedika to Norway to take charge of affairs in the southern part of the kingdom. The commandant of Bohus had already submitted to the new king, and Krumedika succeeded in winning the magnates and the cities separately by making promises which he never intended to keep. The commander of Akershus submitted to King Frederick I, and before the end of 1523 nearly all of southern Norway had pledged its allegiance to him. Another prominent Danish noble, Vincenz Lunga, was sent to the northern districts. He came to Bergen, where he met Nils Henriksen Yildenlöwe, 
his noted wife, Lady Inger Ottis' daughter of Östrot, and their daughters. Nils Henriksen, who was at this time an aged man, was anxious to shift the burdens to younger shoulders, as he had failed to take the castle of the city. A peaceful agreement could be more easily arranged, since Vincennes Lunge married Jülden Löwe's oldest daughter, Margaret, who had been lady-in-waiting to Christian II's queen, Elizabeth, and had become acquainted with Lunge in Denmark. Nils Henriksen was the wealthiest and most powerful magnate in the kingdom at this time. In 1515 he became Drotsetta, and he was also appointed one of the special envoys sent to the Netherlands to bring Christian II's bride to Denmark. His wife, Lady Inger of Oostrot, was a talented but ambitious and covetous lady. Through the marriage of her daughters to immigrated Danish nobles who had high positions in the kingdom, she exercised a unique influence and became a leading figure in one of the most tragic chapters in Norwegian history. King Frederick's representatives came to Bergen in 1523, and Nils Henriksen died the same year. Vincennes Lunge planned to take the castle still held by Christian II's adherents, and the king encouraged the Hanseatic merchants of the city to aid him in this undertaking. At a given signal in the still of the night, the merchants sallied forth, not against the castle, but to attack their rivals, the Scotch and Norwegian merchants of the city. These were ill-treated and driven with their families into the streets. Their homes were looted and their charters destroyed. The attack was especially directed against the Scotch merchants, who suffered losses to the amount of 40,000 marks. Never since the time of the Victual Brothers or the massacre of Olaf Nilsson had the citizens of Bergen been subjected to such indignities. But Vincennes Lunge did nothing, and probably could do nothing, to restrain his lawless allies. The castle, which was held by the incompetent Hans Knudsen, surrendered, and the Norwegian council granted Lunge the castle and royal land of Bergen. The new commander was a learned and able man. He had studied at several universities. He was a doctor of jurisprudence and had been professor at the University of Copenhagen. As a member of the Norwegian council, he naturally exercised great influence. After his marriage to Margaret Yildenlöwe, he accounted himself a Norwegian, and became for a period the most influential man in the kingdom, and the originator of an ultra-Norwegian political policy which saved Norway from being wholly incorporated in Denmark. But his ability, says Allen, consisted chiefly in craft and cunning, in discovering the weakness of others, and when they had been indiscreet, he used the opportunity either to crush his opponents or to use them for his own ends. He was flattering and ingratiating, and no one knew better than he how to act towards those whom he wanted to win, or to make it appear that he served those whom he wished to use as tools for his own purposes. As an enemy, he was feared for his falsity and artifice. To this must still be added, says Overland, that he was about the most covetous and greedy man of his age, and that he was proud and boastful when fortune favored him. In the month of August, 1524, the council renounced their allegiance to Christian II, and chose Frederick I king of Norway. A charter, to which the king would be required to subscribe, specified that the king should protect the Catholic Church, its teachings, rights, and privileges, that he should maintain the laws of the kingdom, renounce the title of heir to the throne of Norway, acknowledge that he received the Norwegian lends from the council, and agree not to grant them to any but native-born lords, or to lords married to native-born ladies. The Orkney and Shetland Islands were to be redeemed, and the rights and privileges granted by former charters were reaffirmed. A letter was also addressed to the king complaining of Henrik Krumedika, and giving notice that he had been deposed from his land and banished from the kingdom. With these documents, Vincennes Lunge went to Denmark to King Frederick I. The king signed the charter, but Krumedika was declared innocent on the oath of twenty-four knights, and in 1529 he received again his possessions in Norway. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Struggle for Norway, Christian II. Frederick I had been placed on the throne of Norway, but the kingdom was controlled by the council, in which Vincennes Lunge exercised the greatest authority. Olaf Galla, governor of southern Norway, and Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsson, who was president of the council, were also influential members. The relations with Sweden were not cordial. Gustav Vasa had not evacuated Viken, though he had been requested to do so, 
and Swedish refugees, the opponents of King Gustav, had been well received in Norway. The hostile feeling grew still more intense when Vincenz Lunge and Lady Inger of Östrot harbored and supported a Swedish pretender who claimed to be the son of Sten Sture, and sought to stir up a rebellion against King Gustav. The pretender, generally known as the Dalle Junker, was a worthless criminal by the name of Jens Hansen, who after having operated for a time in Dalarna fled to Norway to escape capture. He came to Östrot and succeeded in winning the confidence of Lady Hinger and Vincennes Lunge. The story was circulated that Gustav Vasa was dead, the pretender became engaged to one of Inger's daughters, probably Alina, and the ambitious mother was dreaming lofty dreams of finally seeing her daughter as queen on the throne of Sweden. Lunge's reasons for supporting the pretender, even after the fraud had been exposed, must have been of the most sordid nature. Ludwig Dahe thinks that he wished the young lady to marry abroad, in order that the estates which she would otherwise inherit might come into the possessions of the remaining heirs. In the fall of 1527, the pretender proceeded to Dalarna to rally the people to his cause. But they had been warned by Gustav Vasa, and had to return with Lunge to Norway. Gustav Vasa demanded his surrender, but Lunge still claimed that he was Sten Sture's son, though Sture's widow, Christina Yildensterna, had declared that he was an impostor. Lunge was finally obliged to send him away from Norway, but he did it in such a way that he escaped. It was the pretender's plan to join Christian II in the Netherlands, but in Rostock he was arrested and put to death. Vincent Lunge's conduct had offended not only the king of Sweden, but also his own sovereign, Frederick I, who in 1528 entered into an alliance with Gustav against Christian II. King Gustav demanded that Lunge should be punished, and Frederick complied by removing him as commandant of Bergen. He did not venture, however, to risk an open rupture with the powerful noble, but granted him other possessions as a compensation, among others the Nonester Monastery, where Lunge erected a residence called Lungegården. Lunge's power was still unbroken, but a Dane, Eska Bilde, who was married to Krumedika's daughter Sophia, became his successor in Bergen. Klaus Bilde was made commandant of Bohus, and Olaf Galle was deprived of Akershus, which was given to Mogens Yildensterne. Contrary to the charter, the three principal castles of the kingdom were granted to Danish nobles. As the king did not seem to take the charter seriously, he was no more conscientious as to its provisions. He had agreed that he should not ask of the council or of the inhabitants of Norway that anyone, either his son or anyone else, should be elected as his successor in his lifetime. But in 1529 he nevertheless sent his son, Duke Christian, to Norway to be hailed as heir to the throne. It was clearly the king's purpose to incorporate Norway in the kingdom of Denmark, or to treat it as a dependency. But this plan was frustrated by the Norwegian political policy of Vincenz Lunge and Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsen, who had revived to some extent the power of the Norwegian council. Though their motives were often sordid and their methods reprehensible, they were fighting for Norwegian autonomy, and the outcome depended on their willingness to cooperate. But a disinterested plan of united effort could not long be pursued by the two leaders, as other circumstances would have made this impossible, even if they had been men of more lofty and unselfish purposes. Archbishop Olaf was undoubtedly a patriot, who sought to defend his country's freedom and honor, but he was unable to give the struggle even a tinge of the patriot's tragic idealism, and history has unjustly veiled his name and obloquy. J. E. Sars says of him, The name of Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsen grates unpleasantly on our ears. It is connected with the memory of Norway's deepest national humiliation in such a way that about the deepest shadow of this holy dark picture falls upon him personally. Henrik Krumedika described him to King Frederick I as a false man, according to the statement of Vincenz Lunge, and in later history he has received a similar testimonial. His political policy has been described as unwise and dishonest. It has been described as showing that he had slack moral principles, a weak character, and that he lacked the proper reverence for his calling, and the conviction of the truth and justice of his cause. It has even been said that such a motive as patriotism and a feeling for Norway's liberty and honor must have been wholly foreign to him, that he sought purely personal ends, or that at best he was only guided by a Catholic prelate's hierarchical zeal. This is evidently erroneous. Vincent Lunge would scarcely have appealed so strongly in his letters to the archbishop's patriotism if he knew that such an appeal would find no response. 
and the archbishop's own writings prove that his country's honor lay close to his heart, and that he deplored the state of dependency to which Norway had been brought. He did not possess the qualities of a hero or a martyr, but he was evidently not an insignificant personality. We see that he did not fail to understand that he was necessary in order to defend the Norwegian kingdom and the Catholic Church against the dangers and enemies which threatened both, and that in a way he was always active, though he received little support from his own people. In contemplating his ambiguous, equivocal conduct, we must not forget the difficult situation in which he was placed. A man of his learning and ability, and he was, according to the circumstances of the times, a learned man and loved learning, ought to have accomplished something good and lasting, but the circumstances in which he was placed were such that even an extraordinary personality would have failed. It became his duty to represent the Norwegian Catholic Church and Norway's political independence at a time when both were tottering to their fall. His position presented problems which individually, perhaps, would have transcended the greatest power given a single individual, and which in many instances clashed with one another. Vincent Lunge inclined strongly to the Reformation movement, not only as a humanist, but also because he found an opportunity to gratify his covetousness through the secularization of monasteries and the confiscation of church property. King Frederick I, who favored the Reformation, prepared the secularization of the monasteries by appointing non-ecclesiastic managers, who should pay the king a yearly sum for this privilege, and at the same time provide the monks and nuns with the necessaries of life from the income of the estates of the monastery. Vincent Lunge had received from the king the monastery of Nonester, and he had stretched forth his greedy hands for more. He conspired with the prior of the monastery of the Dominican friars in Bergen, and the two plundered that institution of all its valuables and burned the buildings to hide the crime. Vincent Lunge and Archbishop Olaf now became the bitterest enemies. The angry archbishop threatened to take Lunge's life, and seized all the estates belonging to Lunge and Lady Inger of Ostrot, in northern Norway. The king's coronation was to have taken place at Oslo, but Archbishop Olaf struggled hard to prevent it. No less determined was his opposition to Prince Christian when he came to Norway to be hailed as successor to the throne. As the prince was even more outspoken in his adherence to the Lutheran Reformation than his father. In this matter, the archbishop seems to have received the support of Lunga, who was also striving to maintain the political autonomy of Norway. The struggle became at once political and religious, but the quarrel between Vincent Lunge and the archbishop seems to have overshadowed all national issues. Lunge continued his seizure of church property and was well assisted in this traffic by his greedy mother-in-law, Lady Inger. He failed in an attempt to take the monastery of Ulstein, but Lady Inger secured the cloister of Rain, and her son-in-law, Nils Lika, gained possession of the monastery of Tautra. In Bergen, the church was also suffering heavy losses. The new commandant, Escabilda, destroyed some of the finest edifices of the city, the Apostle Church, the Christ Church, the Bishop's Residence, and the Chapter House, all built in the Gothic style of architecture. This wanton destruction was done for military purposes, to give freer range to the artillery of the fortress, but the archbishop took no step, and probably could take none, to punish this grave offense. The Lutheran doctrine was spreading. The first Lutheran preacher, the monk Antonius, who came to Norway in 1526, seems to have received permission from King Frederick I to preach in Bergen. Three years later, two other Lutheran ministers arrived, and Vincent Lunge, Lady Inger, and their influential relatives gave the reformers active support. Bergen became the center of the Reformation in Norway, but the Lutheran preachers were active also in other districts. Bishop Hoskold of Stavanger wrote to Eska Bilda that he should not tolerate or protect the damnable Lutheran heresy which had led so many astray, but he should try with all might to stamp out the false doctrine. One of the archbishop's men complained that Lutheranism was spreading also in Finmarken. Even the Council of Lübeck became alarmed and wrote to the archbishop and the Council of Norway to act with energy against the dangerous doctrines, destructive of all social order. The Reformation could make progress because the Catholic Church in Norway, as elsewhere, had lost its spiritual vigor. The monasteries had become hotbeds of vice and corruption, and the Latin church service, which consisted chiefly of empty ceremonies, could no longer appeal to those who had caught the spirit of the new age. The fine scholar Gabel Pedersen 
became a convert to the Lutheran doctrine probably in 1536. He founded the Latin school at Bergen and became the first Protestant bishop of that diocese. In the midst of this process of disorganization, Archbishop Olaf's sole remaining hope was that Christian II might return and seize the throne of Norway. The dethroned king had longed for an opportunity to return, and he had done everything possible to gain the sympathy and support of the emperor and other princes. At Wittenberg, he had heard Luther preach, and had become converted to his doctrine, but for political reasons he renounced his Lutheran faith and returned to the bosom of the Catholic Church, which he probably did without much compunction, as he seems to have been incapable of a deeper religious conviction. But his whole conduct was not very reassuring and Emperor Charles V would do nothing to help him. As Christian could accomplish nothing by diplomacy, he boldly entered the Netherlands, collected ships, war supplies, and a sum of 50,000 gulden, and hired an army of 7,000 mercenaries for an expedition to Norway. The archbishop would not immediately declare himself for King Christian, though he had been secretly negotiating with him, but waited until he should land with his forces in the kingdom. In November 1531, King Christian arrived on the southern coast of Norway after a stormy voyage on which he had suffered great losses. Mogens Yildensterne was asked to surrender Akershus, which he agreed to do if King Frederick I did not send him reinforcements before the month of March, and Christian, who failed to see that the commandant was trying to gain time, agreed to a fatal armistice. On November 29th, he was proclaimed king of Norway at Oslo, and on the same date Archbishop Olaf declared his allegiance to him. King Christian marched from Oslo with a part of his forces to Bohus, while Jürgen Hansen led another part of the army against Bergen. But both were unsuccessful, and Christian hastened back to Oslo where he learned that Yildensterne had received reinforcements. A small Danish fleet, which had been sent to Oslo, could not reach the inner harbor, which was icebound, but a small force was landed and succeeded in reaching the castle of Akershus. The following day, Yildensterne attacked King Christian's forces, set fire to his camp, and burned the Cistercian monastery at Hovedu. Soon an army of 6,000 men, Danes and Lübeckers, arrived from Denmark. Christian's fleet was destroyed, and he was obliged to resort to negotiations. It was agreed that he should go to Denmark to treat with Frederick I in person, and if no agreement could be reached, he should be allowed to return to Norway or to Holland. King Christian was brought to Denmark, but only to be imprisoned in Sunderberg Castle as a rebel. He was finally released from his close confinement in a lonely dungeon, and brought to the castle of Kallenborg, where he was better treated. Vincent Lunge and Nils Lika, who were instructed to quell the uprising in northern Norway, came to Trondheim and requested Archbishop Olaf to submit. As he had no alternative, he renewed his oath of allegiance to King Frederick I and became in a way reconciled to his enemies and opponents. He was allowed to retain his office, but had to pay a heavy fine. At a meeting in the city, the members of the council, who were present, renounced their allegiance to King Christian II and affirmed again the union with Denmark on the condition that Norway should retain its rights and liberties as before. In theory, the principle of equality of the two kingdoms was still maintained, but it could be nothing but empty phrases, as Norway was in reality a conquered country. The people had not even made an effort to defend their independence, and the leaders, who were animated by the destructive hatred engendered by party strife, had struggled more zealously to ruin one another than to save their country. In Denmark, King Frederick I had been placed on the throne by the nobles, and he had been obliged to sign a charter which made him wholly dependent on the magnates, who had stipulated, among other things, that the king should not interfere in the relations between the noble landowners and their renters. Thereby, the nobility secured full jurisdiction over the peasants, who were gradually reduced to serfdom. The Reformation was rapidly gaining ground in the kingdom, and Frederick I had secretly encouraged it, as he was himself a convert to Luther's teachings. Hans Tausen, a learned man and eloquent speaker, who had studied at Rostock and Wittenberg, became the leader of the movement in Denmark, and set on foot a great religious revival which spread irresistibly through the kingdom. In Copenhagen, he preached with such power and persuasion that the people flocked in large numbers to hear him, and when the clergy refused to permit them to assemble in the churches, they gained admittance by forcing the doors. 
Against such a movement, the Catholic clergy soon felt themselves powerless, and their attempts at forcible resistance only aggravated the situation. Bishop Jürgen Fries sent an armed force to arrest Tausen, but the people drove them away. Monks were expelled, and priests who would not accept the Lutheran faith were discharged. King Frederick, who openly sympathized with the reformers, made Tausen his chaplain and placed him under his royal protection. But the movement was especially encouraged by his son, Duke Christian, who was an enthusiastic supporter of the Lutheran church reform. Many nobles also joined the movement, as they hoped to profit by the secularization of the monasteries and the confiscation of church property. In the country districts, they had already begun to take possession of estates belonging to the church, as the religious enthusiasm grew ever more fervid. In 1530, the citizens of Copenhagen submitted their Lutheran confession to a diet assembled in the city. The ladies' church was broken open, and its altars and paintings were destroyed. Even before King Frederick I passed away in 1533, the Catholic Church in Denmark was crumbling into ruins before the victorious assault of this new intellectual and spiritual force. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Count's War, Christian III. Frederick I had been placed on the throne by the nobles, whose support he had won by liberal concessions. But religious strife and social discontent had piled high the easily ignited fuel of discord, which at any moment might blaze forth into a general conflagration. Under these circumstances, the election of a new king was a matter causing great concern. The majority of the nobility supported Duke Christian, the oldest son of Frederick I, but as he was a Lutheran, he was opposed by a strong Catholic party led by the clergy, who favored King Frederick's younger son, Hans, while the merchants and the peasants, who were sorely oppressed by the nobility, wished to place the imprisoned Christian II on the throne. Ambrosius Bogbinder, mayor of Copenhagen, and Jürgen Koch, mayor of Malmö, the leaders of this party, allied themselves with Lübeck, where the leader of the common people, Jürgen Wollenweber, had been elected mayor. When the council assembled in Copenhagen, 1533, to elect a king, little hope could be entertained of an agreement, and many important questions awaited settlement. Whether Lutheranism or Calvinism should be the future religion in Denmark, whether the union with Norway should be maintained, whether Denmark should take the side of Lübeck or of Holland in the struggle for supremacy in the Baltic were among questions to be considered. As none of the candidates for the throne could be chosen, the election of king was postponed until the following year, but the disputes were violent, especially regarding the question of religion. Hans Tausen was summoned before the council and sentenced to death, but the sentence could not be executed, because the angry populace threatened to mob the Catholic prelates, and the persecution of the Lutherans, which was set on foot, stranded on the people's determined resistance. As to the question of supporting Lübeck or Holland, the council decided in favor of Holland. Wollenweber, who hoped to save Lübeck's commercial prestige by gaining power and influence in Denmark, was keeping his fleet ready awaiting the decision, and he immediately sent an army of mercenaries into Holstein in command of Count Christopher of Oldenburg. Owing to this circumstance, this war for naval and commercial supremacy, of succession and religious party strife, is generally known as the Count's War. Count Christopher quickly seized Zeeland, Skåne, and the Danish islands. But the people of Jutland rose against their lords, burned their residences, and proclaimed Christian II the king. Under these circumstances, the council again assembled and chose Duke Christian king but it might now be a question if they had a throne to offer him. If he wished to rule, he had to win his kingdom from his opponents. Christian III resolutely took up the fight. As Duke of Gotorp, he could rely on the support of the nobles of Holstein, who wished to become masters of Denmark. His general, John Ransau, defeated the peasants in Jutland and crushed the forces of the Lübeckers in Fien, while Peter Skram, the Danish naval commander, destroyed the Lübeck fleet. 
King Gustav Vasa of Sweden, who was a brother-in-law and ally of Christian III, aided him in bringing Skånes to submission. Copenhagen was invested from all sides, and after a long siege the city was forced to surrender in the summer of 1536. The Lübeckers had lost their control of the Baltic, the Lutheran party had triumphed, and the nobles had crushed the uprising of the peasants, who were now wholly subjected to the tender mercies of their angry lords. The situation in Denmark might have been an opportunity for Norway to establish her independence, but the people lacked organization and leaders. Archbishop Olaf summoned a general council of the nobles and common people at Bud in Romsdal, 1533, but his political prestige was gone. The religious situation made it impossible for him to unite the people politically, and the castles of the kingdom were in the hands of Duke Christian's adherents. Vincent Lunge and Archbishop Olaf, who were divided both by religious and political views, could not agree to cast their country's lot with either party, or to disregard both and set up a national government. The archbishop passively watched developments. He was in favor of Count Frederick of the Palatinate, who had married Dorothea, a daughter of Christian II, but he did not venture to espouse his cause openly. Vincenz Lunge would recognize Duke Christian in the hope that a charter might be secured which would guarantee Norwegian autonomy. He assembled a few councillors from southern Norway in Oslo, and these formally elected Duke Christian King of Norway. To the document declaring his election, they attached the condition that His Royal Majesty shall preserve to us and to the kingdom all Christian blessings, liberties, privileges, laws, and lawful customs, according to the charter granted by Frederick I. This charter should remain in force until King Christian III should come to Norway to negotiate with the council and grant a new charter, whereupon he should be crowned King of Norway. This proceeding was irregular and unlawful, but it was, no doubt, the wisest policy, as subsequent events proved. But the unfortunate quarrel between Lunga and the archbishop had flared up with new violence which made all cooperation impossible. Niels Lika, Vincent Lunga's brother-in-law, was married to Lady Inger's daughter, Eline. She died in 1532, and her youngest sister, Lucy, undertook to manage the household for her brother-in-law. He became enamored of the young lady and wanted to marry her, but the Catholic Church regarded such a marriage incestuous, and Vincent Lunga, Lady Inger, and other relatives opposed the match. Archbishop Olaf was for a time disposed to view it favorably, but when Lucy, in 1535, gave birth to a son, he could no longer shield the unfortunate lovers. He caused Nils Lika to be imprisoned in the castle of Steinviksholm, where the ill-fated noble was smoked to death. Lucy was later married to the Swedish nobleman Jens Tillofsen Bjelke, who became owner of Ustrot, and the forebear of a large and distinguished family. At Christmas time, 1535, the election of king was again to be considered at a council in Trondheim, where some of the councillors from southern Norway were present. Christian III had also asked for a tax, which was to be voted, and the people of the neighboring districts had been assembled for the purpose undoubtedly of giving their consent to whatever the council might do. But they became angry and refused to agree. Wild tumults followed. Vincent Lunga was killed, and the bishops of Oslo and Hamar were imprisoned in Tautra Monastery. Thereby, the Norwegian council was practically destroyed. Archbishop Olaf had now no choice but to act. Since Vincent Lunga's policy had been shattered, no alternative remained but the abrogation of the Act of Union with Denmark. A resolute attempt to gain possession of the fortresses of the country, and the election of Count Frederick as King of Norway. This plan was not a makeshift, but an ideal for which the greatest sacrifices might well be made. But Archbishop Olaf was wholly unfit to be a leader in a struggle of that nature, and he failed to take into account his absolute lack of preparation, organization, or resources. He dispatched Anar Tjeld with a small force to take Akershus, and Christopher Tronson was to seize Bergen. But both attempts failed, and the national uprising collapsed utterly. Archbishop Olaf lost courage, liberated those who had been imprisoned, offered to recognize Christian III as king of Norway, and to assemble a general council to elect him if pardon would be granted for the uprising. 
After the fall of Copenhagen, King Christian was undisputed lord of Denmark. By a coup d'etat, the old constitution of the kingdom was destroyed, many councillors were turned out of the council, and all political power was taken away from the bishops. A diet was assembled at Copenhagen, where a new constitution was formulated, according to which the kingdom was to be governed by the king, the council, and the nobility, and the Lutheran faith was formally accepted as the religion of the realm. These measures could have no force in Norway, which was still an independent kingdom, united with Denmark on stipulated terms, but a paragraph was nonetheless inserted in the charter which the king granted the Danish nobility, in which he boldly asserts his intention of making Norway a province of the Danish kingdom. Norway was to be treated as a conquered country, and no attention would be paid to the documents guaranteeing its autonomy. He says, since the kingdom of Norway is now so far reduced in might and power that the inhabitants are not able to support a king and lord alone, and this same kingdom is united with Denmark forever, and the greater part of the Norwegian council, and especially Archbishop Olaf Engelbrechtsson, now the leading man in that kingdom, has within a short time, with the greater part of the Norwegian council, risen against the kingdom of Denmark, contrary to their own pledges, Therefore we have promised the Danish kingdom, council, and nobility that of God Almighty has so ordained that we gain the power over Norway, or any of its provinces, castles, or sissels which belong to it, that it shall henceforth be and remain under the crown of Denmark, the same as any of the other provinces, Jutland, Fien, Zeeland, or Skana, and it shall henceforth not be called a kingdom, but a province of the kingdom of Denmark, and subject to the Danish crown forever. This was language which could not be misunderstood. Norway would have to accept the conditions dictated by Denmark. In a letter of March 5, 1536, the king threatens that if the Norwegians venture any uprising, they may be sure that he will send large numbers of warriors, both mounted and foot soldiers, and cause them to be punished as disobedient subjects, who resist their rightful king and lord, and that they must consider what injury and ruin will befall all the inhabitants if a number of soldiers enter the kingdom to rob, murder, and use all sorts of tyranny, and how good it is to live in peace and quiet. That Christian III illegally usurped the power in Norway must have been manifest to all. He was not lawfully elected king, for as Norway was an elective sovereign kingdom, neither he nor the Danes had a right to determine who should be placed on the Norwegian throne. Archbishop Olaf watched developments closely, but as he could see no ray of hope, nothing remained for him but to seek safety in flight. He gathered what money he could find, seized the treasures of the churches, and brought them on board his ships, and on April 1st, 1537, the little fleet, carrying the archbishop and his goods and archives, left Nidaros for the Netherlands, where Olaf spent his remaining years. The garrison of Steinviksholm Castle and Niederholm Monastery surrendered without much resistance to true Idulfstand, whom King Christian had dispatched to Trondheim. After the archbishop's flight, Ulfstand marched to Hamar, where he seized Bishop Mogens, and carried him as prisoner to Denmark, where he died in 1542. Christian III was never elected king of Norway in a regular way. No charter was issued defining the relation of the two kingdoms, and he never came to Norway to receive the homage of the Norwegian people. He regarded the two kingdoms as so intimately and permanently united that the election to the throne of Denmark made him legitimate ruler of both realms. Norway had lost her autonomy, but the Norwegian people knew nothing of the paragraph inserted in the Danish charter, and scarcely realized that any change had taken place, save that a new king had ascended the throne. The Norwegian council disappeared, though it was not formally abolished, and the Danish council assumed the power of acting for both realms. But since Norway had submitted to Christian III almost without resistance, he did not carry out the threat contained in the mentioned article inserted in the charter. Norway continued to be styled a kingdom equal with Denmark. It retained its old laws and its chancellor, and its administration, which was kept separate from that of Denmark, was carried on in the old way with as little direct interference from the Danish authorities as possible. Christian III might easily have established the hereditary principle in Norway, and thereby have strengthened his throne, but he lacked the statesmanlike foresight to do so. 
End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The overthrow of the Catholic Church in Denmark was quite naturally followed by a like change in Norway, where its power was, if possible, even more hopelessly shattered. Some of the bishoprics were vacant, and others had been vacated through the flight or imprisonment of the bishops. The Lutheran Church was established in Norway as a state church, at the head of which stood the Lutheran king. The Danish Church Ordinance of 1537, which was written with the assistance of Luther's friend and fellow reformer, John Bugenhagen, became the temporary constitution of the Lutheran Church in Norway, though the king had promised to give the Norwegian Church a separate ordinance, in which due consideration would be paid to local conditions. The priests should be allowed to remain in their charges, but the Catholic bishops were removed, and superintendents, or Lutheran bishops, were appointed to supervise the reformation of the doctrines of the church. Gable Petersen, a native of Helgeland, Hologeland, in northern Norway, was appointed superintendent of the Diocese of Bergen, as already stated, and the Danish church ordinance was accepted at the Oslo Logthing for the Diocese of Oslo and Hamar in 1539. But some time passed before superintendents were appointed for all the Norwegian dioceses. The estates which had hitherto belonged to the Catholic bishops were confiscated, one half of the income from the tithes was paid to the crown, and the secularization of the monasteries, which had been begun by Christian II, was continued by Christian III. In 1555 it is mentioned as completed. The property of the monasteries had been seized by the crown, and after 1562 the last traces of Norwegian monks disappear. The valuables belonging to the Norwegian churches and monasteries were seized and carried to Denmark. The king instructed Eskabilda to see to it that nothing was removed of chalices, plates, monstrances, jewels, silver, gilt tablets, and other such things which are and remain in churches and monasteries, that it may all be preserved and thereby have due care for our interest and welfare. In a second letter, he instructs Eska to collect articles of gilt copper belonging to churches and monasteries, whether they be bas-reliefs, candlesticks, or the like, and forward them to Denmark. This kind of preservation was carried out so thoroughly that there was scarcely left sufficient of the sacred articles for the communion service. Peter Clausen Fries, born 1545, writes... But it is to be regretted, and it is not praiseworthy, that at the time of the introduction of the evangelical faith, they did not only take away from the churches and monasteries the articles of gold and silver, and other treasures which were used in the Catholic service, together with vestments and other such things, but they wantonly destroyed things from which they could derive no benefit. They tore down buildings, and needlessly burned valuable books and letters and destroyed the ornaments and decorations of the churches, making God's houses cheerless and barren, which they might well have left undone, nor did they derive any benefit therefrom. As a further illustration of this kind of vandalism may be especially mentioned the spoliation of the great national sanctuary of St. Olaf at Trondheim. The remains of the saint were encased in a triple coffin, the inner of gilt silver, the others of wood richly studded with jewels, the other being the ornamented cover over the real coffin. When Archbishop Olaf left Trondheim, he placed the remains of the saint in the middle coffin, and carried the other two with him to Steinvik's home castle, where he left them when he fled from the kingdom. The Danish general Ulfstand, who captured the castle, did not return them to Trondheim, but sent them to Denmark for the profit of the royal treasury. While the king and his assistants chiefly devoted their attention to the pecuniary benefit which they might derive from the overthrow of the Catholic Church in Norway, the reform movement itself was making slow progress. The few Lutheran bishops who had been appointed to superintend the introduction of the new doctrine could not reach the masses of the people, who were as yet scarcely aware that a change had been made. The Reformation, which in other lands came as a great spiritual awakening, was suddenly forced upon the Norwegian people by royal edict. Hence it caused no new intellectual awakening, no spiritual regeneration. It was an affair of state to which the people finally yielded a more or less willing consent. 
A few Lutheran priests and a number of Danish Bibles were sent to Norway, but nothing was done to provide instruction for the people, or even to maintain the schools which already existed. Previous to the Reformation, each cathedral had its school, where its students were prepared to pursue their studies at foreign universities, and the chapters supported a number of students who studied abroad. But shortly after the introduction of the Reformation, one of these schools, the Hamar Cathedral School, was discontinued, and the prebends from the cathedral from which they derived their income were seized by the king, who used the revenues derived from them to pay Danish courtiers and ecclesiastics. As a result, the chapters were no longer able to keep students at the universities, and after the old priests died or became unable to serve, there was a deplorable want even of ministers of the gospel. Lutheran ministers had to be sent from Denmark, but the people clung to the old faith, and the new ministers were generally ill-treated, and not a few were killed. Peter Clausen Fries, clergyman in Undel, in Stavanger Stift, 1566-1614, writes, But at the time when the old bishops in these kingdoms were dismissed, and the religion was altered and changed, and the pure word of God, which had long been obscured by falsehood and human invention, was again restored, the inhabitants of the country were so displeased that they were filled with spite and hatred towards the Protestant clergymen and the whole ministry. The tithes were not fully or regularly paid, and in some districts the people offered the government large sums of money if they would be left without ministers for some years. The first effect of the introduction of the new teaching was a general deterioration of public morals, while papistical superstitions continued to live for centuries. Crucifixes and pictures of saints were believed to possess healing qualities and receive adoration which was akin to worship. Pilgrimages were made to them from far away. Even as late as 1835, pilgrimages were made to a crucifix in Roldal. The diocese of Oslo and Hamar were united under the superintendency of the Oslo bishop, Hans Reff, who had accepted the Lutheran faith. The ablest and in every way the worthiest of the early Lutheran superintendents in Norway was Gable Peterson in Bergen. He was a devoted Lutheran, and exercised a true reformatory activity in his diocese. He sought to secure Lutheran clergymen for the various parishes, and founded the Latin school at Bergen, which developed under his supervision to become an efficient institution of learning according to the new humanistic ideas. Efficient teachers were secured, and new buildings were erected through Gable's efforts. He sent students to Copenhagen, Rostock, and Wittenberg, among others Absalon Peterson, whom he kept at the University of Copenhagen and later at Wittenberg at his own expense. On his return, Absalon Peterson became clergyman and teacher at the Latin School in Bergen, where he labored with great distinction till his death in 1574. The new principles which had been introduced by the Reformation, even in church administration, though not immediately beneficial, proved an important factor in the future development. According to the church ordinance issued by Christian III, the bishops or superintendents should be elected by the parish priests of the cities of the diocese. When a vacancy occurred, the priests of the cities within the diocese should assemble and elect four of their number to choose a new bishop. The bishop-elect should be examined by the nearest bishop, and the election should be sanctioned by the king. The parish priests should be chosen by the members of the parish. The parishioners should choose seven of their number who should elect a pious and learned man to be a parish priest. He should be examined by the bishop, and the election should be sanctioned by the lensherre. In each parish there should also be a deacon, who should give the children instruction in the Christian doctrine, help the minister to sing, ring the church bells, keep the church clean, and render other services. But no provision was made for paying the deacon for his services, and the plan suggested was not carried into effect. In 1552, the king made the provision that of the lands belonging to the church, a farm, gord, should be set aside for the deacon, and in the church ordinance of Christian IV, more specific provisions were made with regard to the service and pay of these officers. A special tax, Klockertolden, was to be paid to the deacon for his support, 
and he should instruct the young people in the catechism and Christian religion once a week at such a time and place as the parish priest should designate. The deacon was appointed by the parish priest with the advice of the provost, and with the consent of six of the leading men in the parish. This was the first germ of the Norwegian public school system. The Reformation had given the people privileges and opportunities of such a kind that they could only gradually learn to understand their value and importance. If the Reformation was introduced in Norway without an accompanying change in the people's religious views, it was forced upon Iceland in a manner which recalls the scenes enacted when Christianity was first introduced on the island. The old spirit and custom still lived among the people, and the two bishops, Jon Orison of Holar and Ogmund Paulson of Skalholt, were not only autocratic prelates, but proud and ambitious chieftains who brooked no resistance or interference. Willem Paulson says of them, Ogmund, strong and ambitious, proud, authoritative, willful, unable to tolerate resistance, munificent to extravagance, resembles in character and conduct the old chieftains rather than a priest or bishop. Jan Arison was a chieftain to a still higher degree. Dignified in appearance, charming in manners, cheerful and spirited in good company, but a firebrand against his opponents. He knew no Latin, but this mattered not, he said, as it was not the vernacular of the country. But he could compose a song whenever he pleased, for he was a scald, at this time perchance the best in the land. The two bishops had long been rivals and enemies. When they first met at the Althing, Bishop Ogmund appeared with a force of 1,300 men, and Bishop Jan of Skalholt with 900. Their quarrel was on the point of precipitating civil strife, but they finally agreed to settle their difficulty by a duel between two of their adherents. The enmity between the two prelates subsided somewhat on the appearance of the Reformation. Lutheran books had been imported by the German merchants, who had carried on trade with Iceland since 1490. Jan Anderson, a priest of Skalholt, had become a convert to the new doctrine by reading some of Luther's books, and Gieser Anderson, whom Bishop Ogmund had sent to school in Hamburg, had also become a Lutheran by hearing the great reformers in Wittenberg. In 1539 he was appointed Lutheran superintendent at Skalholt, but he was successfully opposed by the blind old Bishop Ogmund, who still had the undivided support of the people. Gieser saw that he could accomplish nothing for the Reformation while Bishop Ogmund lived and ruled in the diocese. He reported the situation to King Christian III, as we may believe, with all the one-sidedness engendered by intense partisan spirit, and the king resolved to take measures for the introduction of the Reformation in Iceland, which proved to be far more drastic than Christian-spirited. He sent Christopher Huitfeldt, the commandant of Steinvixholm, to Iceland with a military force. On his arrival, Huitfeldt conferred with Gieser Anderson, and the two seemed to have agreed upon the plan to be pursued. The people were ordered to bring horses, ostensibly for the purpose of transporting goods to Skalholt, but thirteen mounted men were immediately dispatched to Hjotla, where Bishop Ogmund was visiting his sister, and the aged bishop was seized and brought to Huitfeldt as a captive. Deprived of their leader, the clergy could make no resistance. The Lutheran Church Ordinance was accepted in the Diocese of Skalholt, and after Gieser was paid a large sum of money from the diocese and treasury in lieu of a tax demanded by the king, Huitfeldt sailed to Denmark, bringing with him Bishop Ogmund, who died shortly after his arrival. As Lutheran Bishop of Skalholt, Gieser labored diligently to introduce the Lutheran doctrine and the new church service in southern Iceland. In the Diocese of Holar in the northern part, Bishop Jan Arison still held sway, the enmity between the two bishops became very intense, but an open clash was averted by the death of Gieser, 1548. The Lutherans and Catholics each chose their own candidates to succeed Gieser, but the ambitious Jan Arison, encouraged by the victories gained by Emperor Charles V over the Protestants in Germany, thought that he could seize the bishopric and make himself the lord of all Iceland. He marched against Skalholt with a hundred armed men, but timely warning had been received, a force of three hundred men had been gathered, fortifications had been constructed, guns were mounted, and when Bishop Jan arrived, he was unable to take the bishop's residence by force, as intended. But Jan Arison was too much of a chieftain of the old school to yield because his plan had been foiled. In 1549 he took the Lutheran bishop, Martin of Skalholt, prisoner, 
forced the bishop's residence to surrender, drove out the Danes from the monastery at Vedi, which had been secularized, and reinstated the abbot. The Catholic church service was reintroduced in the district of Borgerfjord, and the monastery of Helgefeld, which had been a royal estate, was reorganized. After having gained this notable success, the relentless Bishop Jan directed his attack against his personal opponents, many of whom were compelled to flee from Iceland. R. Kaiser says of him, Jan Arison had been unscrupulous in his younger days when he sought to win the Episcopal office. Unscrupulous he showed himself now in his old age when the question was to hold fast with trembling hands the power once gained. He heeded neither threats nor counsel, but proceeded arrogantly in the once chosen course until the abyss of destruction yawned at his feet, and all revenues of retreat were closed. He had still one powerful opponent, the chieftain Dada Gudmundsson, who was married to a sister of the imprisoned Lutheran bishop, Martin. The bishop collected an armed band of 120 men, and marched to attack Dada, but the wary chieftain met him at Soidefelt with a force of trusty followers. After a determined fight, Bishop Jan and his two sons, Are and Björn, were made prisoners in the church where they sought refuge. As the royal commandant had returned to Denmark, Dada turned his prisoners over to his assistant, Christian Skriver, but he feared the bishop's adherents and did not know where the prisoners could be safely kept. One morning at the breakfast table, the minister, Jan Bjarnason, said to him that although he was not very wise, he knew a good way of keeping the prisoners. When asked what plan he had in mind, he answered that the axe and the grave would keep them best. This suggestion was acted upon, and the old bishop and his sons were led to execution and beheaded. The people of Bishop Jan's diocese, Holar, bitterly resented this vile deed. They watched their opportunity, attacked Christian Screever, and killed him and his armed escort. Later, fourteen more Danes were killed, and a spirit of bitter hostility against the Danes had been kindled in all Iceland. Sigurd Jonsson, a son of Bishop Jan Arson, sent thirty men to Skelholt to bring the bodies home for internment. Bells were fastened to the coffins, and as they journeyed along, the church bells were ringing, and the people flocked about them to touch the coffins of the dead bishop and his sons, who were revered almost like saints. They were buried with great honors in the cathedral at Holar. Christian III had dispatched a military force to Iceland even before he had received notice of Bishop Jan's death. Two hundred men were sent to the southern districts and five hundred to the diocese of Holar. After the bishop's death, the people, who had been deprived of their leader, submitted without resistance and took the oath of allegiance to the king at the Althing, July 1st, 1551, and Olaf Hjaltason was appointed Lutheran superintendent at Holar. The Lutheran Reformation was thereby officially accepted, but Jan Arson was still regarded as the national hero, and generations had to pass before Lutheran Christianity could become a regenerating force in the people's intellectual and spiritual life. Very little is known about the introduction of the Reformation in the Faroe Islands. The last Catholic bishop was Amund Olofsson, who was appointed by Frederick I in 1533. Jens Rieber was the first Lutheran bishop in the islands. In 1557, he became Bishop of Stavanger as Jon Guttormsson's successor. The Diocese of the Faroe Islands was discontinued, and the islands were incorporated in the Diocese of Bergen, and later in that of Sealand in Denmark. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of Christian III. The disappearance of the Norwegian Council, the gradual decay of the aristocracy, and finally the destruction of the Catholic Church and clergy left the Norwegian people without leaders, unable to assert their independence or even to maintain their legal rights in the affairs of internal administration. The principal lens of the kingdom were given to Danes with but few exceptions. Bishops and ministers were sent from Denmark, the government was wholly in the hands of the king and his Danish council, and even the courts of justice were often presided over by Danish judges appointed by the king. The Norwegian codes of law were translated into Danish, 
and the church laws were annulled through the introduction of the Reformation. It became customary also to appeal from the decisions of the log things to the king, who together with his council acted as a court of higher jurisdiction. He also sent members of his council to Norway to hold court together with the royal Lensherre and Logmend, in order to examine complaints against Lensherre, Fogas, and others. This tended to undermine the authority of the old courts, and exerted a deteriorating influence on Norwegian jurisprudence. The lawmaking activity was limited to the issuing of charters and the granting of trade privileges to the Hanseatic merchants, and the legal practice degenerated into a dull and formal routine, as the Danish judges were ignorant of the principles of Norwegian law, as well as the detail of court procedure. During the Union period, Norwegian jurisprudence lost the high position which it had formerly held. Foreign rule prevented its further development, and the people themselves became indifferent, and ceased to cultivate the knowledge of the old laws. Christian III, who was a judicious and practical king, avoided as far as possible all steps which would irritate the Norwegian people. The clause which he had inserted into the charter, possibly in order to humor the Danish nobles, he suffered to remain a dead letter. The charter remained deposited in the archives unknown to most people in Denmark and probably to all in Norway. Two kings were laid in the grave before it became known. The king's chief aim was to maintain peace, to improve the economic conditions in his kingdom, and to increase the revenues for the purpose of paying the big debts which had been contracted in the late war. As he felt the crown resting securely on his brow, he was in a position to carry out his administrative policy with firmness. The nobility exercised far less influence than they had expected to do, and the Norwegians remained peaceful and loyal subjects. In the Count's War, King Christian had seen the importance of the fleet, and he aimed to make the dual kingdom of Denmark-Norway a naval power strong enough to control the Baltic. This would also tend to draw the two peoples closer together through a strengthened feeling of the necessity of cooperation in furthering common interests. Able sea captains were not wanting. Men like Christopher von Trutheim, Christopher Tronson, Otto Stigson, Stig Balga, and others had learned seamanship as bold corsairs and lawless rovers of the seas. But King Christian, who needed their services, was willing to condone past offenses if they would enter the royal service in good faith, and this they were anxious enough to do. Stig Baga of Kvinestal in Norway was a very able captain, and the king granted him Lister Len, but on an expedition against the Netherlands, 1541, he was captured and put to death. He was succeeded by the no less valiant and able Christopher Tronson, Christopher von Trondheim, these two are the forerunners of a number of distinguished Norwegian naval heroes who later served in the fleet of the two kingdoms. The king devoted special attention to the development of mining in Norway. He seems to have thought, as did Absalon Pedersen Bayer, that the mountains of Norway were full of silver, gold, and other precious things. Alchemy had stimulated the search for precious metals, and the growing need for money and iron, caused by the wars and the enlargement of the navy, gave a new impetus to this industry. Hitherto, iron had been gathered in bogs, where small quantities of native ore could be found. King Christian II had sought to introduce the more modern system of extracting metals from the rich mineral-bearing rock of Norway, but the attempt had led to no practical results. King Christian III renewed this attempt and imported miners from Germany, where the mining industry at this time was most highly developed. He made special regulations for the industry, based on German laws, and in 1537 several mines were opened in Telemarken. The undertaking was very important as a first chapter in the development of a new industry, but no proper control was exercised over the rude foreign miners, whose lawless behavior so exasperated the people that a serious uprising occurred in the mining districts. The general ill will against the Danish fogods added fuel to the flame. Several of these officials were slain, and the uprising spread rapidly. Christian III, who never visited Norway after he became king, remained a stranger to all local conditions, and without inquiring further into the real cause of the disturbance, which he regarded as a rebellion, he ordered the commandants of Akershus and Bohus to suppress the uprising. They marched into Telemarken, where they met the armed Bunder, who were persuaded to lay down their weapons. After they had thus been disarmed, the Bunder were surrounded and taken prisoners, 
and a number were sentenced to death and executed. The mines were operated with profit for some years, but a decline set in during the decade from 1542 till 1552, and a few years later the work was discontinued. The introduction of mining, though attended at first by little success, was nevertheless a harbinger of a new era of national development. Another manifestation of the awakening of the spirit of progress was the destruction of the Hanseatic trade monopoly in Bergen, and the coming into existence of a body of enterprising native merchants, who dared to enter into competition with the Germans. Though the Hanseatic League had lost its former power in the Count's War, the German merchants in Bergen continued to act with their customary arrogance, and sought to intimidate all whom they feared might become competitors. Lawlessness and corrupt practices had hitherto been the means by which they had maintained their power in Norway, but Christian III would tolerate no violence or overt disobedience. In 1556 he appointed as commandant of Bergen the resolute, calm, and fearless nobleman Christopher Falkendorf, who would neither be scared by threats nor disheartened by open resistance. The Hanseatic merchants had mounted cannons on the tower of the St. Mary's Church, and sought to frighten the new commandant, but he paid no attention to their meddling schemes. With unbending firmness he undertook to carry out the necessary reforms. Hitherto the German merchants had been a foreign nation maintaining an organized state of their own in Bergen. In order to prevent their clerks and apprentices from marrying and becoming domiciled in Norway, they encouraged immorality to the utter corruption of the social and moral life of the city. Falkendorf began his work of reform by bringing the corrupt social practices under strict control, and the merchants had to submit to the laws and promise to live honestly, Christian-like, and well in all respects. He summoned the German artisans and demanded of them that they should take the oath of allegiance to the king or leave the kingdom. Hitherto they had been a colony of foreigners subject only to their own laws. Henceforth they would have to become citizens amenable to the laws of Norway if they wished to stay in Bergen. The demand, though a very just one, was not heeded. The powerful merchant guild encouraged them to resist, and emboldened by this support, they threatened that if the commandant attempted to enforce such a demand, there would soon be orphans and widows enough in Bergen. In answer to these threats, Valkendorf ordered the windows of their shops to be closed, trained the cannons of the fortress upon them, and held his forces ready for action. The commandant's resolute action struck terror into the hearts of the artisans, and they begged for an opportunity to negotiate. A meeting was arranged in the St. Mary's Church, where Valkendorf appeared accompanied by two boys, and told the artisans of the order given the garrison of the fortress to fire upon their shops if we were harmed. No one ventured to resist, and an agreement was made by which the artisans pledged themselves either to take the oath of fealty to the government, or to leave the city before the next Michaelmas, unless the king should permit them to remain on the old conditions. But the king supported Falkendorf, and when the choice finally had to be made, they decided to leave Bergen, 1559. The German merchants still remained, but their power was broken. Successful resistance could no longer be made to the laws and authorities of the city, and the time would soon come when they would have to submit to the government and remain satisfied with sharing the legitimate privileges accorded all other merchants of Bergen. Christian III and his queen, Dorothea of Lauenburg, were both devoted Lutherans. The king was a diligent student of the Bible, and was well versed in theology, medicine, history, and natural science, but he used the German language exclusively and never learned to speak Danish. Though not gifted above the ordinary, he conducted the administration of the kingdom of Denmark with great ability and good judgment, but the affairs of Norway were much neglected, as the king never visited that kingdom throughout his whole reign. The great changes which made his reign the harbinger of a new era are nevertheless ascribable, in a degree, to his active cooperation, if not to his initiative. The Reformation, the rebuilding of the navy, the destruction of the Hanseatic trade monopoly, the introduction of mining in Norway were measures which not only showed an increased national vigor, but which gave promise of a new development born of the ideas of the Reformation and the Renaissance. King Christian's greatest merit was that he became an advocate of the new ideas, and helped to make them a factor in the national development. He died on New Year's Day, 1559. His old rival, King Christian II, who had been liberated from prison in 1549, died the same month at Kallenborg in Denmark. End of chapter 21
Chapter 22 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frederick II. The Seven Years' War with Sweden. When Christian III died, his son, Prince Frederick, who was 24 years of age, ascended the throne. He had been hailed as his father's successor in Denmark in 1542 and in Norway 1548, a step which shows a growing tendency to restrict the choice of king to the members of the royal family. The new king had inherited his mother's restless energy and imperious temperament, but his education had been neglected, as he cared little for books in his boyhood. The religious tone prevalent at his father's court did not appeal to him. He quarreled frequently with his parents, loved pomp and display, and exhibited great fondness for military pursuits. In the administration of the affairs of the kingdom, the careful and constructive course pursued by King Christian III was abandoned. The public policy shaped by Frederick II became a series of hasty impulses and of ill-considered adventures, terminating in failure and general distress. The king won his first military glory in a war with Ditmarsken. It had been constantly urged that the Danes should avenge the defeat suffered by King Hans in 1500, but Christian III would not begin war. His two brothers, the dukes Adolf and Hans, who had always been in favor of renewing the attempt to take Ditmarsken, found no difficulty in persuading their nephew, King Frederick II, to join them in the undertaking. An army of 20,000 foot soldiers and 3,000 cavalry was raised, and the Ditmarskers, who could only muster a force of 7,000 men, were finally overpowered in 1560 after a most heroic resistance. King Gustav Vasa of Sweden died September 29, 1560, and was succeeded by his son, Eric XIV. The new king was of a warlike disposition, and as many old grudges still existed between Sweden and Denmark, a contest for the supremacy in the Baltic was almost sure to come. King Frederick II asserted the old claim of Denmark to Estonia and Ussel, and sought to ward off Russian encroachments in Livonia. But Sweden took possession of Reval and entered into open rivalry with Denmark for the control of the Baltic. The immediate cause of the Seven Years' War which soon broke out was the use of three crowns in the coat of arms both of Sweden and Denmark. The three crowns was the old coat of arms in Sweden, but in Denmark they had been adopted as a sign of union of the three northern kingdoms. As Sweden had left the union, the continued use of the three crowns in the Danish coat of arms was an indication that the kings of Denmark had not yet relinquished their claim to the throne of Sweden. Frederick I had indeed dropped the three crowns from the Danish coat of arms, but they had been reintroduced by Christian III and Frederick II. This led to protracted negotiations, but neither Eric XIV nor Frederick II would yield. In fact, both desired war. King Eric hoped to take Norway, and Frederick II felt certain that the war would give him the longed-for opportunity to gain the throne of Sweden. In vain, the older and more experienced men counseled him not to risk a war. He found support among the young nobles who exercised great influence in court circles, and the torch of war was soon lighted. In the first naval engagement off Bornholm, a Norwegian by birth, took the Danish admiral prisoner, and captured three of his ships. On August 9, 1563, Frederick II, who was the aggressor, issued a declaration of war. Lübeck, Poland, and Russia became his allies, and Sweden was politically isolated. The war became, to a large extent, a naval contest, as Frederick depended on the Danish-Norwegian fleet, which his father had created. The operations on land consisted chiefly in destructive border raids, in which lives and property were destroyed, seemingly without any other plan than to swell the general sum of misery. Norway was the trophy for which King Eric XIV was willing to do battle. In the days of Karl Knudsen and Christian I, there had been sharp rivalry between Sweden and Denmark for the possession of Norway, and although Denmark had succeeded in maintaining the union with the sister kingdom, the old jealousy was not wholly allayed. When the war broke out, the Swedes still hoped, as in the time of Engelbrecht Engelbrechtsen, that Norway would revolt and attempt to shake off the Danish yoke. This hope is expressed in the Latin poem Querule Swedicae, Swedish Complaints, written at the court of King Eric XIV. The poem describes Norway's sad fate, criticizes the Danish kings and officials, and enumerates the misfortunes which Danish misrule had brought upon the country. 
O oh, sister, to be pitied art thou. After Denmark with her sweet union bitterly hast brought thee under her feet, thou complainest too late. Too late dost thou take the shield after the wounds have been inflicted. Too late thou grievest, because thou hast been brought under the tight reins of oppression. Now, unfortunate one, thou finally seest that there has been black gall beneath so sweet honey. There seemed indeed to be an opportunity for Norway to shake off Danish overlordship and dissolve the Union, but as nothing had been done for the creation of an efficient army, the country lacked the necessary means for the successful pursuance of such a course. The sailors and marines in the Danish-Norwegian navy had been, to a large extent, recruited in Norway. The fortresses of the country had Danish commandants, and no central organization existed which could lead to a national uprising. There seems indeed to have been at this time in Norway a sentiment in favor of Sweden, but such a sentiment could not be strengthened by the course pursued by the Swedish king, who in spite of expressed sympathy sent armies across the border to raid and plunder in Norwegian territory. In the fall of 1563 a Swedish army occupied Jemtland, but the province was recaptured by Evert Bild, the commandant of Steinviksholm in Trindelagen. The following year a Swedish army of 3,500 men again entered Norway. The Norwegian commander was pursued and slain, and the logman was captured and placed in fetters. How cruelly they treated the people, God knows, says an old writer. Both in Jemtland and Heriodalen, which were held by the Swedish troops throughout the whole war, the people were so oppressed by the rude soldiers that they fled from their homes to Norway in large numbers. The commander of the Swedish army was a Frenchman, Claude Collard, who after subduing Jemtland marched across the mountains to Trindelagen, and laid siege to the strong fortress of Steinviksholm, which was surrendered by the commandant, Evert Bild, almost without resistance. The people welcomed the Swedes as friends. The Danes were driven away, and Trindelagen, Murra, and Romsdal accepted the Swedish king as their sovereign. This easy victory made Claude Collard, Claudius Gallus, very arrogant. He sent most of his forces back to Sweden and began to rule in a most arbitrary and oppressive way. Heavy taxes were imposed, and gallows were erected throughout the province, as if it were his object to wreak martial vengeance on a conquered race. The Trondhjem Cathedral was desecrated by his soldiers, who even carried away the body of St. Olaf, evidently with the intention of bringing it to Sweden, but it was finally reinterred at Floan Church in Trindelagen. The pro-Swedish sentiment which the people had shown was ill-rewarded by this rude soldier of fortune and his undisciplined warriors. No course could have been more effective in turning friendship into hatred, and the people would naturally welcome with joy any aid which would rid them of such oppression. Aid soon came from Bergen, where the able and energetic Eric Rosenkrantz had been made commandant. He dispatched troops under Eric Munch to Trindelagen to assist the local forces. Kalar was obliged to evacuate Trondheim and retreat to the fortress of Steinviksholm. As the Swedes did not number above 400 men, he was soon forced to surrender, and the angry bunder of Nordland, Trondelagen, Nordmer, Romsdal, and Sundmer were summoned to Trondheim, where they renewed their oath of allegiance to King Frederick II. The campaign on the southern theater of action resulted in the capture of Elfsborg by the Danes, and in 1564 the Danish admiral, Herlof Trolla, defeated the Swedish fleet commanded by Jakob Baga in a noted naval battle off Öland. Hitherto the advantage in the struggle had inclined to the side of the Danes, but the tide turned in 1565. In the naval battle of Femern, Herlof Trolla received his death wound, and his successor, Otto Rud, was captured in a second engagement at Bornholm. The situation became so critical that Denmark was persuaded to open peace negotiations, but King Eric XIV, who considered himself the unqualified victor, made demands which could not be accepted, and the struggle continued. The very able Danish general, Daniel Ransau, defeated the Swedes at Axtorna, and the heroic Jens Holgersson had successfully defeated Bohus against repeated attacks. In 1566, great efforts were made to increase the strength of the Danish army and navy. Soldiers were pressed into service, 
and the increased war contributions weighed heavily on the people both in Norway and Denmark. But of little avail were these sacrifices. A large part of the Danish-Norwegian fleet was destroyed on the coast of Gothland in a terrific storm, July 28th to 29th. Between six and seven thousand men perished in a single night, but as the Swedish fleet was also damaged in the same hurricane, the relative strength of the two powers was not materially changed. In spite of repeated misfortunes, King Frederick II did not allow his royal courage to be shaken. Again, he undertook to build a fleet, which he hoped might retrieve the losses, and bring him the coveted victory. In 1567, King Eric XIV directed his attack against Norway. This vain and ambitious king, who was inordinately licentious and void of any solicitude for the welfare of his people, was becoming mentally unbalanced. He still thought that the Norwegians would rise against the Danes, and he was encouraged in this belief by an adventurer, Enno Brandruk, a son of the Norwegian naval hero Christopher Tronson. Enno advised Eric to attack Akershus. The Norwegians, he said, would rise in revolt as soon as the Swedes appeared, and the march from Akershus to Bergenhus would be a triumphal procession. Stories like this would naturally excite the diseased imagination of the almost insane king. An army under John Sigerson was dispatched across the border into Osterdalen, and a wicked raid, accompanied by the plundering of the churches and the devastation of defenseless settlements, was begun. Osterdalen and Hedemarken were ravaged. Hamar was taken, and Hamarhus castle was plundered. But when the enemy reached Oslo, the people burned their city rather than see it fall into the hands of the invaders. The districts of southeastern Norway submitted, and the people were forced to swear allegiance to King Eric XIV, but the ravages did not cease. Swedish detachments roamed over Ringerike, Romerike, Hedemarken, Gausdal, and the districts east and west of the Christiania fort. Sarpsborg was burned because the people refused to pay war tribute. The same fate befell Konghella. New forces arrived constantly, and it seemed as if the plundering and burning would never stop. Akershus was invested, and Eric Rosenkrantz of Bergen sought to aid the besieged fortress, but he experienced the greatest difficulty in raising forces and supplies. The war had exhausted the resources both of Norway and Denmark, and loud complaints were heard on every hand. Eric Munk was finally sent to Akershus with reinforcements, and the Swedes had to retire. They marched northward from Oslo, crossed seven large rivers which were in their way, and everywhere they broke down the bridges behind them, burned everything which they found, and killed both men and women, sparing no one. On their retreat they also destroyed Hammerhus Castle and burned the Hammer Cathedral. The great church was not destroyed, but suffered serious damages, which were never repaired, and the cathedral gradually fell into ruin. After the termination of the Norwegian campaign, the struggle was waged principally on Swedish soil, and Norway was not seriously molested. The war, which had exhausted all three kingdoms, was gradually drawing to a close. King Eric XIV, who had become permanently deranged, was finally deposed, and his brother, Duke John, was placed on the throne as King John III in January 1569. About the same time, a treaty of peace had been negotiated with Denmark, but as the king and the estates of Sweden would not ratify it, hostilities began anew. Frederick II, however, had soon spent the last strength of his two kingdoms, and peace negotiations were renewed at Stettin, July 15, 1570 and the final treaty of peace was signed December 13th of the same year. According to the terms of the treaty, Denmark should surrender all claims to Sweden. The question of the three crowns in the Danish coat of arms should be settled by a court of arbitration. But as this court was never assembled, Denmark continued to use the three crowns as before. Elfsborg should be given back to Sweden on the payment of an indemnity of 150,000 riksdaler. The Norwegian provinces of Jemtland and Herjedalen, which had hitherto belonged to the Diocese of Uppsala, were joined to the Diocese of Trondhjem. All ships and cannons which had been taken in the war should be returned to their respective owners. All conquered territory should be surrendered, and Lübeck should have the right to trade with Sweden. In the long struggle, nothing had been gained by either power. Their relative strength, both on land and sea, remained what it had been since 1537. 
End of chapter 22. Chapter 23 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Norwegian Internal Administration in the Reign of Frederick II. From 1536 till 1572, Norway had no central government which could represent the whole people and serve as a connecting link between the king and the royal officials, as the council had ceased to exist. But the need of a central administrative authority within the kingdom had been keenly felt in the war with Sweden. As each Lensharo was the highest authority within its own district, an efficient use of the country's resources in time of danger was well nigh impossible. No army was maintained, and the Norwegians had been unable to defend themselves even against a small invading force. In 1572 the king created the office of Stadtholder, viceroy of Norway to which position he appointed Paul Huitfeldt, commandant of Akersus. The stadtholder should have supervision of the church and clergy, the courts, and the royal domesna lands. He should exercise authority over the lands herer, so that they should not oppress the people, and by a regulation of July 5, 1588, he was also placed in supreme command of the Norwegian military forces. The centralization of administrative authority was especially necessary in order to bring better order into the finances of the kingdom, which had been reduced to a wretched state during the war. The lands belonging to the bishops had been confiscated by the state at the introduction of the Reformation, and all church lands should also be administered by the government, as the Lutheran church was a state church. But before the revenues could be made to flow in the proper channels, the administrative system had to be readjusted to the altered conditions. Three subordinate officers, Stiftskrivere, were appointed to supervise the buildings, property, rents, and incomes belonging to the churches, and rules were made regarding sawmills and the lumber trade, the preservation of the forests, the keeping of all public property, and the building of war galleys. Paul Huitfeldt was personally very active. He traveled about in the United Diocese of Oslo and Hamar, and compiled a census of the property of churches and clergymen. A copy of this document, usually called Paul Huitfeldt Stiefsbog, is still in existence. The Lensherer usually received the whole income of a small len, but only a relatively small share of the income from the principal len. The stadtholder, Paul Huitfeldt, received for his services the income of the len of Tromsø, but only 10% of the income of Akersus Len. But besides this, he was granted also the necessaries for his large household, for which he might use 300 chickens, 10 barrels of tallow for candles, 3 barrels of salmon, and 500 flounders. The cost of maintaining these great lords, besides the taxes which had to be paid to church and state, often made the public burdens alarmingly heavy. In 1571, every Odelsbande had to pay taxes to the amount of one-half of his whole income. This was, however, a war rate. In 1576, it was reduced to half that amount, or 25% of the income. The revenues of the crown were derived from the following sources. The Landskild, or income from rented crown lands, income from lands operated for the benefit of the crown, consisting chiefly of lumber sawed in the royal forests, the regular taxes, consisting of the Leding tax for the coast districts and the Visore tax for the inland districts, Foring, or the feeding of horses used by the government, which seems to have been a new tax, as it is mentioned for the first time in a statute of 1578, fines imposed by the court in punishment of a crime, tithes, duties, consisting of duty on goods exported and a certain tax or toll on ships according to their size, size, excise, or import duty on ale and pridzing, and aid paid the crown by certain districts, probably a free donation. The taxes were collected by the provosts and fogids, who usually employed the lensmend, bunderlensmend, for this purpose. As money was very scarce, the taxes were usually paid in sheep, cattle, and produce of various kinds, which had to be transported to Akersus or some other central point at the expense of the crown. A part was used for the household of the stadtholder or lensherre, and for the payment of the servants and officials. The remainder was sent to Denmark. After the war, the army was neglected both in Norway and Denmark, but considerable attention was devoted to the fleet, 
as Frederick II wished to maintain Danish supremacy in the Baltic. The sea was also made insecure by numerous pirates, and it was necessary to keep a strong fleet in active service to keep them at bay. Interesting incidents sometimes occurred in these pirate hunts. In 1567, Captain Alborg sailed from Bergen to look for pirates. At Karmsund, he discovered two suspicious-looking vessels, which he brought to Bergen for inspection. One of the vessels was found to carry James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell, the husband of Mary Stuart. Although a fugitive, he was courteously received by Eric Rosencrantz, commandant at Bergen, who entertained him at a banquet. In Bergen, the Earl met a lady to whom he had been untrue. This was Anna, the daughter of Christopher Tronson, who confronted him with evidence that he was her husband. In Norway, she was known as Skotafroin, the Scotch lady. She would have nothing more to do with the faithless Bothwell, and the earl was taken to Denmark, where he was imprisoned at Malmöhus, and later at Dragsholm until his death in 1578. One of the most noteworthy characters whose names are connected with the pirate hunts of those times is Mogens Hainesson who was born of Norwegian parents in the Faroe Islands, where his name still lives in stories and traditions. He had sailed as merchant between Bergen and the Faroe Islands. His ship had been robbed by pirates, and he had gone to Holland, where he enlisted in the navy. Later he returned and began again to trade with his native islands, though this trade had been made a royal monopoly. Sometimes he hunted the pirates, and at other times he was a Viking corsair, leading a life of romantic adventure, until his old enemy, Christopher Valkendorf, succeeded in throwing him into prison. Through Valkendorf's influence, Hainesson was sentenced to death and executed without proper trial. This unjust proceeding was later annulled, and Christopher Valkendorf had to pay Hainesson's widow and his old business partner, Hans Lindenau, a large indemnity. The problem of creating a just and efficient government in Norway, where the details of law and administration could not come under the direct control of the king and his council, presented difficulties which were not solved even by the creation of the office of Stadtholder. The old complaints of extortion and oppression by the fogods and royal officials continued. Unlawful taxes were often collected, and the people felt aggrieved by many unjust and arbitrary acts on the part of the foreign royal officers, who neither understood the local conditions nor enjoyed the goodwill of the people. However well-meaning the paternal rule of a foreign monarch may be, it is always bad. His numerous subordinates may practice a most exasperating tyranny, which he cannot mitigate without destroying the very system of which he has become the representative. In order that the king, through his council, might exercise a more direct influence upon the administration and the enforcement of the law by the courts, councils of magnates, which had hitherto been assembled on special occasions, were held more frequently. From 1568 such councils, heredaga, may almost be regarded as a permanently established institution. They were to act as a higher court, but administrative questions were also considered and settled. Some members of the Danish council, not above five, were sent to Norway to hold such assizes. The measures adopted and the decisions made were to be regarded as if they had been made by the council itself, but an appeal could nevertheless be made to the king and the council. The king thought that all irregularities and offenses could be investigated and adjusted by the stadtholder and the councils so that no complaints would have to be carried directly to the throne but the Norwegians were accustomed from very early times to bring their grievances to the attention of the king directly. He, they thought, would not shield the offender, even if he were a high official. He would give them justice, and instead of appealing to the stadtholder, they appointed committees to go to Copenhagen to lay their complaints before the king himself. The king was anxious to see justice done, but the officials and nobles against whom complaints were made sought to revenge themselves upon those who ventured to seek justice in that way. In 1573, a committee, led by Rolf Halvardsson, was sent to Copenhagen, and when they had presented their case, the king wrote a letter to Ludwig Munch, Lensherre in Trondheim, requesting him to aid the Bunder and to see to it that the matter was settled right. But when the committee returned, they got into trouble with Ludwig Munch and his fogat, and Rolf Halvardsson and his companions were unjustly condemned to death and executed. The constant struggle between tyrannical officials and an angry people 
whose necks could not be bent, fills the centuries of the Union period with tragic episodes, and constitutes one of its most characteristic and noteworthy features. The struggle was not a war for national liberty conducted by great leaders. It was not a general organized movement, but a dogged and persistent fight by the people for their legal rights and their freedom as individuals, without which a Norseman could not live, and out of which national liberty sprang full-grown when the union with Denmark ended. End of chapter 23「Intellectual and Social Conditions in Norway in the 16th Century」The literary life in Norway in the 16th century, though it shows a lack of creative ability, is not wholly wanting in intellectual energy, and many valuable works were written in this period by the Norwegian humanists. Humanism, which had spread over Europe from Italy, had been temporarily interrupted by the Reformation, but after Protestantism had been established in the north, it blossomed forth again with increased vigor. In Norway, as elsewhere, the clergy, who had studied not only in the schools at home but at the universities abroad, and had acquired the spirit and culture of the age, became devoted adherents of the new learning. Some noblemen of literary tastes and scholarly inclinations were also enthusiastic humanists. At the bishop's seats, and also at the parsonages, small libraries were collected, though books were rare and expensive. The prevalent cosmopolitan spirit, the Latin language everywhere used by scholars, and common intellectual interests bound the humanists in all countries together with fraternal ties. They felt themselves to be a sacred brotherhood, constituting the universal kingdom of learning, and theirs was the special privilege of exploring and bringing to light the great intellectual treasures and culture of classic antiquity. They turned their attention also to the past history of their own people, and dug from obscurity and neglect the sagas of the kings of Norway, translated them into the modern Norse tongue, and sought to open the eyes of the people to their own past greatness. In Bergen, where the talented humanist Gabel Pedersen became the first Lutheran bishop, a circle of learned literary men sprang into existence. In Nidaros, Stavanger, Hamar, Oslo, and other places, Humanists were poring over old books and dusty manuscripts in their eager search for knowledge. One of the leading Norwegian humanists was Magnus Absalon Pedersen Bayer of the Bergen Latin School, a pupil and protege of Gable Pedersen. Magnus Absalon wrote the Liber Capituli Bergensis, a diary which gives the picture of Bergen at that time with great distinctness of detail. He also wrote Norges Beskrivelse, a description of Norway which is especially remarkable because of the intense patriotic feeling expressed in it. The author bemoans in most pathetic words the loss of Norwegian independence, but he speaks with eloquent hopefulness when he refers to the country's future. The following quotation will show the general tenor of the book. Therefore begins here Norway's old age, since she has become so old, cold, and unfruitful that she cannot give birth to royal children of her own who could be her rulers. Her nobility, good heroes, and warriors died from her, part by the sword and part by the pestilence during the Black Death, so that from that time forth the Norwegian nobility has constantly decreased in number, year by year and day by day, since their fathers either gave their property to monasteries or churches, or forfeited it, or they wasted it themselves through marriage, or a number of bastard sons inherited it. Furthermore, the Norwegian nobility received no grants of land belonging to the crown or the diocese, and their own suffice little or nothing to maintain the style and extravagance which are now so common, therefore they are becoming extinct. He compares Norway to an old widow who must lean upon a staff in walking, but she is only apparently not really weak. Still Norway might awaken from her sleep if she could get a ruler, for she is not so degenerated or weakened that she could not regain her former power and glory. For these hard mountains are full of good butter, silver, gold, and other precious things. The people still possess some of the old virtue, manhood, and power, which should enable them to fight for their lord and native land, if they could daily see him and experience his favor. The author's optimism regarding Norway's future development, and the ability of the Norwegian people to retain their lost national greatness, rested on a correct anticipation based on a thorough knowledge of local conditions. Unfortunate circumstances had indeed led to Norway's union with Denmark, 
in which perfect equality between the two sister kingdoms could not be maintained. But the Norwegian people had never been conquered, their spirit had not been subdued or broken, sometime the irksome ties would be dissolved, Norway would wake from her slumbers, the spirit of the people would reassert itself, and a new era of national progress would begin. Modern Norwegian history proves the correctness of Magnus Absalon Petersen's views. We shall have the opportunity to observe how this new national awakening began long before the union with Denmark was dissolved. Peter Clausen Fries, clergyman in Undal in Agder, was a patriot like his contemporary, Absalon Petersen Bayer. He wrote a work about Norway, Norges Beskrifuelsa, a Norwegian natural history, and a description of the Norwegian island colonies. He also published a translation of the Sagas of the Kings of Norway, a most important work, through which the people learned to know their past history, as they were no longer able to read their books in the Old Norse language. Through this work, Norwegian national feeling received a powerful stimulus. Mattes Stersen, who died in 1569 as Lagmand in Bergen, translated the Sagas of the Kings of Norway from the Heimskringla and the Codex Frisianus, and for the Lenshera in Bergen he wrote, about 1555, En kort beretning om kjobmendene ved Bryggen, i.e. a short account of the Hanseatic merchants in Bergen. He complained of their encroachments and proposed plans for improving the country's economic condition. Gustav Storm says, He thought that Greenland in olden times had been a gold mine for Norway, similar to what India was for the Spanish monarchy, and we probably do not err in believing that he has translated the old Grinlands Beskrivelse, and has worked it into Eric Valkendorf's account of Greenland, to be used on the expeditions of discovery which were sent out from Bergen shortly afterward. Lawrence Hansen Bonda, who lived in the neighborhood of Bergen, translated sagas and wrote commentaries to the codes of church laws. Eric Hansen Schönebol wrote Lofetens o Westerollens Beskrivelse, Bergens Fundats, written by some unknown author, 1559 or 1560, contains a history of Bergen till the time of Christopher Falkendorf and the subjugation of the Hanseatic merchants. Bergen's Rimkrenika, by an unknown author, narrates the history of the city till the time of the Victual Brothers, and is of importance as an historical source. Ganska Nomedals lens Beskrifuelsa, or 1597, Om Hamar's Kjobstad's beginning, 1553, and Norskso, the Norsersau, a bitter complaint of moral conditions in Bergen, written about 1584, are also of unknown authors. In Oslo, Bishop Jens Nilsson became the center of a large circle of learned and able humanists. Besides his knowledge of Greek and Latin, he was well versed in Norwegian history and Old Norse. He copied the manuscript of the Jofraskina and wrote Latin songs, in which he describes the scenery of Norway and the life and customs of the people, especially in the district of Telemarken, where the life of the Middle Ages was still well preserved. His most important work is his Visitatsbogr, a record of his work as bishop of Oslo Hamar diocese during a period of twenty-five years, in which he describes the country, the roads, the lower nobility, clergy, peasants, and townspeople. Frederick Grun says of Absalon Petersen Bayer, Peter Clausen Fries and Jens Nielsen, In a larger sense, the humanistic ideas were brought to Norway by these men. It was, at all events, principally these three who brought humanistic thought to the hitherto intellectually isolated educated circles in Norway, to whom these thoughts were hitherto unfamiliar. Regarding the population in the north in this period, only meager data exist, as no census was taken till the middle of the 18th century. The calculations based on tax lists and the old military system leave so much to conjecture that the results deduced by different authorities diverge very radically. Professor P. A. Munch held that the population of Norway, prior to the Black Death, must have been about 560,000. Professor J. E. Sars states as a result of his investigations that prior to the Great Plague Norway had about 300,000 inhabitants, and that during the plague the number was reduced to 200,000. At the beginning of the 16th century it had again risen to 300,000, and at the end of the same century the population of Norway numbered about 400,000. Truls Lund has figured out that in the year 1600, Denmark had a population of about 1.4 million, and that the population of Norway numbered about 600,000. But as Sars claims that this estimate is without foundation, we may take the lowest figures as the more reliable, 
i.e. the total population of Norway and Denmark in 1600 might be estimated to be about 1.5 million. But relatively considered, this was a large population at that time, as Scotland did not have over 800,000 inhabitants, and the population of England did not number above 5 million. City life was but little developed, as the people lived for the most part in the country. Bergen was still the largest city in the north, and the most important commercial center. The population of the leading cities in the Scandinavian kingdoms about 1600 is estimated by Trolls Lund as follows. Bergen, 15,000. Copenhagen, 13,000. Stockholm, 7,000. Malmö, 6,000. And Trondheim, about 5,000. But this estimate, which is based on military service and tax lists, seems to be largely a result of conjecture. Ingvar Nilsson estimates the population of Bergen to have been six or seven thousand at the times of the introduction of the Reformation, 1536, while J. E. Sars thinks that at this time the population of Bergen could not have been much above three thousand, Trondheim above one thousand, Oslo about fifteen hundred, and the other cities probably had on average about five hundred inhabitants. Because of the Hanseatic trade monopoly, many of the smaller towns, such as Vaughan, Vee, Borgund, Kalpinger, and Lillehammer, had either disappeared or had become mere marketplaces. From time to time, foreign elements have been added to the native population in Norway, as in all other countries. This influx of new blood may indeed have been lighter in so distant a land than in the countries more centrally located, but in the Middle Ages the immigration became of great importance to Norway in several ways. After the Union was established, a great number of Danes settled in the kingdom as officials, ministers, teachers, merchants, and even as laborers and artisans. During the Hanseatic supremacy, the German merchants became an influential element in many cities, especially in Bergen, where their colony at one time is thought to have numbered about 3,000 persons. In the 16th century, many Hollanders and Englishmen settled in Norway as merchants, and many Scotchmen, who had been brought over as mercenaries, remained permanently in the country. The most remarkable foreign element which came to the north in that century was the gypsies. The origin of this people is veiled in impenetrable mystery. In course of time, they have spread over the greater part of Asia and Europe, and they are also found in Africa and America. In southern Europe, they appeared for the first time in 1417, and claimed to be Egyptian pilgrims who made a vow to wander about homeless for seven years to atone for the sins of their ancestors, who had refused to give Jesus, when a child, a drink of water from the Nile. By the Greeks they were called Giftoi, which has been changed in English to Gypsies. The story which they told of their origin created sympathy for them, and the emperor and the pope placed them under their special protection. But when it was learned that the Gypsies did not return to their own land, that they practiced witchcraft, and that they were not to be relied upon in word or deed, they soon became the object of hatred and persecution. In some countries they were called Tartars, Norse Tatar as they were thought to be heathens from Asia. Led by their king or duke, the gypsies generally advanced in bands of 300 persons or less. A few of the leaders were mounted, the rest of the band, men, women, and children, went on foot. They were seen for the first time in the north in 1505. A band led by Count Antonius Gagino, which had spent some months in Scotland, came to Denmark, bringing a letter of recommendation from James IV, stating that they had been peaceful. In 1511, another band, led by Junker Jorgen of Egypt, entered Schleswig. In the following year, the gypsies appeared in Sweden, and they must have entered Norway about the same time. They were at first treated with kindness, but as they were given to theft and swindle, they soon became generally hated. In 1536, they were outlawed and ordered to leave Norway within three months. Anyone might kill them and take their property. People were forbidden to shelter them or give them any aid and the Lensmand, who did not arrest all the gypsies within his district, was made personally responsible for any damage which they might do. The poor gypsies were now in dire straits, says Trollslund. The foxes and wolves were better situated, but they could not be expelled even by these measures. Adhering like burrs, homeless as migrating birds, shy and unsusceptible to kind as to harsh treatment, hungry as wolves, noiseless and keen-eyed like cats in the dark, they lived only for the moment. They could rejoice like children when they found a brief rest, but they could also endure hardships on their endless wanderings to a degree that no mercenary soldier had dreamt of. They did not depart. They retreated everywhere but remained in the country. And whither should they go? If they went to France, they would be sentenced to the galleys. 
In Germany and the Netherlands they were outlawed. The only thing accomplished by this order issued by King Christian III was to split them up into smaller bands, which were chased without plan from one end of the country to the other, persecuted wherever they appeared, but gone at the moment when they were to be seized. Doleful, leaving no footprints like children of the darkness. As the gypsies had no religion, as they practiced magic arts and were accused, though unjustly, of sacrificing human beings, the church joined the state authorities in persecuting them. In Sweden, an order was issued to the parish priests in 1560 that a priest must have nothing to do with the Tatars, gypsies. He must neither bury their dead nor baptize their children. A similar order was issued by the Bishop of Fian in Denmark, 1578. If gypsies come to the land, as sometimes happens, then shall no priest marry them or give them the sacrament, but he shall let them die as if they were Turks, and they shall be buried outside of the churchyard as heathens. If they wish to have their children baptized, they must baptize them themselves. But the united efforts of the church and state could not crush them. Under the worst persecutions, they seemed to have made no attempt to leave. They were not reduced in number, nor did they adopt a different mode of life. At last, the more humane spirit of modern times freed even the despised gypsies from persecution, and suffered them to walk their own paths unmolested. But the modern humane spirit accomplished what medieval persecution did not achieve. The gypsies no longer felt the necessity of wholly isolating themselves from the rest of mankind. They accepted into their flocks tramps and idlers of various kinds, and thereby they gradually lost their language and their identity as a people. In Denmark they have already ceased to exist as a distinct nationality, and in Sweden and Norway they are fast disappearing. The nightmen in Jutland and the Fanter in Norway are the last mixed remnants of the gypsies who through the process of amalgamation will soon be totally absorbed by the native population. As to their influence on the native population, Trolls Lund says, The gypsies constituted a distinct ingredient in the life of the North in the 16th century, not only as viewed by themselves, but especially through their connection with the rest. Their sneaking, noiseless existence constitutes a mysterious ingredient in the motley mixture, and belongs to the shady side of its existence. They help us to understand the people's great aversion to being out after dark, the shudder which went through all when an unusual noise was heard at night, or a light was seen in the forest. One might think that the fact that they seldom appeared would have restricted this fear, but they gave name and example to a host of light-fearing tramps, crooks, loafers, and nighthawks, who even before had been a true scourge. The same was the case with the sorcery and demonolatry of the gypsies. As they were too few to attract much attention themselves, they became the visible and tangible expression for the superstition and fear of the devil which characterized the age. Inland travel was still attended with great difficulty. The journeys through the mountain districts had to be made on horseback, as no wagon roads existed. The narrow mountain trails which wound across the mountains and through the dense forests were often as hard to find as they were difficult to travel. This was especially the case in winter, when snow and ice made travel both difficult and dangerous. Man's best friend on these lonesome and hazardous journeys was the strong Norwegian pony, who might be trusted both to find the trail and to walk it with heavy burdens, and it is not strange that the Norseman from time immemorial has felt a most tender attachment for his favorite animal. The dangers and hardships of inland travel are referred to even in the Edda poems. The Hovamal says, Fire needs he who enters the house and is cold about the knees, Food and clothes the man is in need of who has journeyed over the mountains. And Skirner, who is sent to Jotunheim by the god Frey to woo for him the fair Gerd, says to his horse, Dark it is outside. Methinks it is time to journey over the damp mountains to the Jotun hosts. But both of us shall return, or both shall fall into the hands of the powerful Jotun. Skirnismal a couple of logs did the service of bridge across the roaring mountain torrents. The work of keeping the roads in repair consisted in removing rocks and timber which obstructed the passage. The road overseer, appointed by the bunder, rode on horseback along the middle of the road with a spear sixteen feet long with loops on each end. If he could pass with the spear so that the loops did not become attached to any obstruction, the road was considered to be in order. Two main routes led from eastern to western Norway over the mountains, one from Oslo to Bergen through Valdres, across Filafjeld to Sognefjord, and the other to Trondheim through Gudbrandsdal across the Dover Mountains. 
until mountain stations were erected where wayfarers might find food and shelter these routes could be traveled only with the greatest difficulty but the stream of pilgrims which yearly visited the shrine of saint olaf in trondhjem prior to the reformation made the erection of such stations a necessity in speaking of the route across the Dover Mountains, the old writer Peter Clausen Fries says, But in the winter people of high estate, as well as members of the court, travel mostly that way, because however deep the snow may fall, it blows together on the high mountains, and becomes so hard that men and horses can walk on it, and the bunder run over it on ski and snowshoes. And there are these three stations, Drivstuen, Herdekin, and Fogstuen built on the same mountain, in order that travelers may find lodging there. And kings and archbishops have given cows and land to those who dwell below the mountains, in order that they shall keep the stations in proper order. And at Herdekin dwells a man who has some cows which are given for his support, in order that he may keep the station properly, and show the travelers the way across the mountains in the winter. And it is his duty always to keep a supply of fodder and dry wood ready, for there are kettles and pots in the house, and other such utensils and at the other stations there are implements and dry wood for making fire, so that the travelers may build themselves fire and not suffer from cold, when they have to remain overnight, and cannot find the way across the mountains. On the southern route were found Maristuen and Nistuen, and at these stations chapels were also erected for the pilgrims and travelers. Because of the great inconvenience connected with inland travel, it is natural that travel by water was preferred wherever it was possible. On account of the lack of proper means of communication, the inland mountain districts were thinly settled and made slow progress. But in the 16th century, as in days of old, the most generous hospitality was shown every wayfarer. In the monasteries, the traveler always found welcome and free lodging for charity's sake, until these institutions were closed on the advent of the Reformation. But the written law of hospitality was as carefully observed by the people at large. Magnus Absalom Peterson Bayer writes, Truly a pious, God-fearing, and virtuous person can journey from Bohus to Vardahus, which journey is more than three hundred miles, and he shall not spend above a Riksdaler. Yes, they are glad, and they consider it an honor when anyone wishes to eat and drink with them. They sometimes even give people presents if they will make merry with them. A Norwegian sailed from here to Danzig, and stopped at an inn. And when he was going to leave, the hostess asked him to pay for food and ale. He asked if he should pay for food and ale, and the hostess answered yes. He said that it was not customary in his country to receive pay for ale and food, but the woman said that it was custom in her country. Then said he, O Norway, thou holy land, as soon as I touch thee again I shall fall on my knees and kiss thee, which he also did. And it is a strange thing that in other lands Norway is regarded as a barren kingdom, which it is in some respects, and still so much ale and food are given for nothing that many are astonished. After the monasteries were abolished, the country parsonages became the hostelries for wary travelers, where free food and lodging were cheerfully given by the hospitable parson, who was usually an excellent host. In the cities, numerous inns offered lodging, food, and ale for a small price, but they were usually low dives where thieves and drunkards had their haunts, and where no wayfarer could feel safe. These cheap inns were especially numerous in Bergen, where they numbered 400 in 1625. In Stavanger, they multiplied so rapidly that in 1604, Christian IV made a regulation restricting their number, as they aroused God's anger by drunkenness, murders, and otherwise. The chief means of inland transportation, especially of heavy goods, was the sleigh, and the transportation was carried on in the winter months when the fine sleighing facilitated traffic. The wagon was, indeed, used in the more level districts, and had been used from the very earliest times, which can be seen, among other things, from the Osseberg find from about 800 A.D., where a four-wheeled wagon has been preserved complete. But the use of the wagon as a vehicle of transportation must have been very restricted until the time when more modern roads were constructed. The houses of the common people were much the same in the 16th century as they had been ever since the Viking period. On each guard, farm, there were a number of houses erected for different purposes, the main one being the stua, Old Norse Stofa, or dwelling house, which corresponded to the Scala. Instead of glass, which was very scarce and expensive, windows were usually made of translucent paper or membrane. The houses were built of logs, and the walls were low. The spacious roof, which was made of birch bark, covered with sod, bore a rich crop of grass and wild flowers, 
and might at times serve as pasture for some nimble and enterprising goat. From the outside these houses presented no imposing appearance, but upon entering one might find the stua large and cozy, though the conveniences known to modern times were wanting. The abundance of fine pine timber enabled the Norwegians to build large houses, and to erect separate buildings for all sorts of purposes, so that a large guard would look almost like a small village. One notable change had taken place in the stua or skala since earlier times. The open fireplace in the center of the room, arin, and the opening in the roof above it, yori, had disappeared, and an oven with a chimney, built in one corner of the room, had come to serve the purpose of both. The room was lighted by burning sticks of pitch pine, or a lamp filled with train oil. The large table at the upper end of the room was built of substantial pine planks. The benches were made of the same material, the dishes, vessels, and utensils were homemade, and so were the clothes, the shoes, and even the ornaments of gold and silver. The houses of the common man were plain even to simplicity, dark and poorly ventilated, but they had their charm when the floor was strewn with twigs of evergreen for holidays or festive occasions, and not less when the family gathered about the fireplace in the evening, each with his own work, knitting, sewing, mending, wood carving, or making vessels and utensils for the household. Then songs and stories unlocked the stores of adventure of ages past, and young and old lived once more with Espen Oskelod and the heroes of ballads and the sagas. This simple rustic life left few but strong impressions, and though its comforts were few, it fostered a rigorous and manly race. The cities of continental Europe originated for the most part as fortified strongholds, serving as a defense against the enemy. But even in early times the Norsemen built commercial towns, and the cities of Norway are as a rule of commercial origin. Walls and fortifications were of a later construction, and with the exception of the castle, the city was never felt to be a fortress. But the general features of the European cities in the 16th century were nevertheless met with also in Norway, and a description of London or Copenhagen would no doubt apply in a general way also to Bergen, Oslo, and Trondheim. The limited space inside the city walls necessitated a crowding together of the houses. Not only were the streets narrow, but the second and third stories were often extended beyond the first, shutting out both air and light. The streets were poorly paved, dark, crooked, and filthy, as manure, ashes, garbage, and refuse of all sorts were thrown out of doors without much regard for comfort and well-being. Pigs were running loose, wallowing in pools of mud, and living off the garbage heaps, and when the late pedestrian sought to find the way home, he had to carry a lantern to avoid falling into the cellarways, projecting into the dark and narrow passage called the street. Numerous laws were passed to secure cleanliness and better order in the cities, but these were not heeded. People regarded them as an infringement on their liberty, and continued in the old ways. New lessons could only be taught by great calamities, and nature applied the lash to dull humanity in the form of conflagrations and pestilence, until the instinct of self-preservation finally produced the needed improvements. Time and again the cities, consisting as they did of wooden structures packed closely side by side, were almost totally destroyed by fire. Patiently, the suffering and impoverished inhabitants rebuilt them in the same way, until fear at length gave birth to the idea of constructing wide streets and public squares, and of rearing the buildings of less combustible material. The filth in the narrow passages and ill-kept streets proved an even worse enemy than fire. The summer heat turned these filthy passages into breeding places of disease, exhaling their deadly contagion upon a people who failed to obey nature's great law of cleanliness. Violent epidemics harried the North in the 16th century, with a frequency which filled all minds with dread and caused untold sorrow and suffering. From 1550 till 1554, a malignant pest harried the larger cities of Norway and Sweden, and especially Denmark, where the university and the schools were closed, the court fled from the capital, and so many people died that it was feared that the country would be depopulated. In 1563 to 1566, the same plague renewed its visit in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Bergen, Trondheim, and Stockholm suffered severely. The dead were thrown into big pits by day and by night. Even birds and animals were poisoned by the contagion. In 1568, the pest again visited Copenhagen. In 1572, Stockholm. In 1575 to 1578, it harried both Denmark and Sweden and in 1580 to 1581 it renewed its ravages in the whole north. 
Copenhagen was again visited by the dread disease in 1583, and during the next two years it spread throughout all Denmark. In Stockholm it broke out anew in 1588, and in 1592 it was brought from Livonia to Copenhagen. In 1596 to 1598 it harried Sweden fearfully, and in 1599 it was again raging in Denmark. What sorrow and helpless misery these fearful epidemics left in their trail! But at this great cost some lessons were learned, and the instinct of self-preservation quickened human intelligence. The study of diseases and the science of medicine and sanitation, which were to transform all human life, originated in these dark periods of human helplessness and woe. But if the suffering due to man's ignorance cast a dark shadow over human existence, the self-inflicted horrors arising from man's credulity and superstition have often turned human society into a veritable inferno from which reason itself, and all nobler instincts, for a season seems to have fled. The sixteenth century was a period when superstition sat enthroned in the minds of all classes, high as well as low. But of all delusions which haunted man's brain, the belief in witchcraft with the attending torture and burning of witches was undoubtedly the most abominable. It is not here the place to dwell upon the revolting horrors of the witchcraft craze, except so far as it has left its stain of stupid fear and brutality also in Norwegian history. As early as 1325 a witchcraft trial was conducted in Bergen against Ragnhild Tregagos. After she had been kept in prison in chains for a long time, she was finally released on the condition that she should fast certain periods every year, amounting in all to over half the days of the year, and that she should make a pilgrimage to some sanctuary outside of Norway once every seven years. How many such cases occurred prior to the Reformation is not known, but witchcraft trials and executions were numerous, especially in the latter part of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th. The most noted case was the trial of the widow of Absalom Peterson Bayer, who was condemned to death and burned as a witch in Bergen in 1590. Any woman who knew more than the Lord's Prayer, i.e. who possessed literary culture above the average, was in danger of being persecuted for sorcery and secret association with the devil. And after the craze was once started, any prank of imagination was sufficient cause for dragging the victims of suspicion before the courts, and subjecting them to the most cruel tortures to press from them an admission of guilt. From the years 1592 to 1594, the Bergens Radhus Protocol gives accounts of several witchcraft trials. Olaf Galstall was condemned to death as a sorcerer. He claimed that he had learned his magic art of two women, Marine Haldorsgaard and Mumpe Goran, and these were burned as witches some years later. He even implicated the bishop's wife, who was saved with difficulty from sharing the fate of the others. Derlis Runica was tried for witchcraft and banished from Bergen. Johanna Jens' daughter was burned at the stake, and likewise Anna Knut's daughter. In 1613, two women were burned, because by their sorcery they had caused a mill in Sandvik to be destroyed, and several more women were burned at the stake, because they were thought to have caused shipwreck upon the high seas by their magic arts. Anna, the widow of Herlof Lauritsen, the supposed author of Bergen's Fundats, was also accused of witchcraft. She was thrown into prison, and on the night of the 19th of July, her neck was twisted and broken by the devil, says the account. Who the devil was that committed this outrage is not recorded. One woman was tortured with red-hot irons until she died, and another died in prison after being tortured. From Finmarken to Oslo and Christiania, witchcraft trials were carried on with torture and executions. As late as 1737, Ole Hoime in Slidra parish was tried as a sorcerer, but he escaped with a relatively mild punishment. This seems to have closed the chapter of witchcraft trials, the ghastliest spectacle in Norwegian history. Though comparatively few were executed as compared with the thousands who suffered death in all parts of Europe. No worse outrage was ever added to the woeful list of wrongs against humanity even in those days of medieval darkness, and its effect upon the finer moral and intellectual sensibilities of society was the more pernicious, because it had been committed in the name of religion and justice. This reign of terror and superstition breeded general callousness and mental obtuseness, destroyed the regard for the sacredness of human life and the rights of man, and fostered a judicial brutality which reveals itself in all criminal jurisprudence of that period. 
The crude conception of the rights of the individual and his value to society is sadly conspicuous. In early days, the freeman's person and honor were regarded as sacred, and this sacredness of person, manhelgi, was guarded by the old laws. The greatest crimes were punished, not by straightway taking the life of the criminal, but by imposing a fine or by declaring him an outlaw, thereby turning him over to the vengeance of those whom he had wronged, but also to the mercy of the community. In the 16th century, the idea of sacredness of the individual seems to have disappeared. Human life had become cheap, and neither the body nor the honor of the individual citizen was any longer a sacred thing which the court was compelled to treat with respect. The trials were often accompanied by brutal torture, and capital punishment was inflicted with a frequency which made the hangman one of the leading city officials, and the public executions the amusement, not only of the jesting rabble, but of the sedate city fathers. On passing Nordness at Bergen, one might have seen, almost at any time, several bodies dangling from the gallows, exposed even after death to the jeers of idlers, probably for no greater crime than for jumping over the city wall or stealing a few pounds of butter. The records left by Magnus Absalon Peterson Bayer in his diary, Liber Capitulae Bergensis, gives us an insight into the way in which crimes were punished in Bergen in the 16th century. A boy was beheaded for jumping over the city wall. A man who was suspected of having killed his wife was tortured till one joint of his thumb fell off. At times he admitted, but again he denied his guilt, but he was nevertheless executed. A baker was hanged because he had stolen butter. A bunda, farmer, was hanged because he had stolen some train oil on the wharf. Two young men of old noble families, relatives of Christopher Trunson, were hanged because they had picked locks and stolen. A young boy who served at the castle was also hanged for theft. Examples of this kind of legal justice need not be multiplied, nor need we mention the numerous executions for what we would consider more sufficient reasons, for these alone, it seems, might have satisfied the desire of judges to inflict the favorite death penalty. Fights and drunken brawls were numerous even at weddings and other social gatherings. Murders and other crimes were of frequent occurrence. When we read the descriptions of social conditions in the 16th century left by old writers, we feel that there was guilt enough, but no shadow in the picture is deeper than that of justice forgetting to be just, and allying itself with superstition and bigoted cruelty. It is the one great evil which especially darkens the physiognomy of the 16th century. But the century has also its brighter side looking forward to a new era, the first dawn of which had already broken through the medieval darkness. New elements of progress had entered the intellectual and spiritual life of the people with the Renaissance and the Reformation, while new inventions, a revival of commerce, and the growth of a native merchant class in the cities gave promise of a new development in the economic life of the nation. The destruction of the Hanseatic trade monopoly and the development of Norwegian lumber export were the important factors in this commercial and economic development. Boards and timber had been exported, especially to Iceland and England, in very early times. King Henry III wrote to his bailiffs in Southampton, November the 13th, 1253, instructing them to buy 200 Norwegian pine boards and deliver them to the sheriff of that city, to be used for wainscoting the room of his dear son Edward in the Winchester Castle. At the same time, mention is made of a purchase of 1,000 Norwegian boards for the paneling of some rooms in the Windsor Castle. Norway planks, says Turner, were largely imported into this country from the early period of the century, 13th, and perhaps, although it is not quite clear, at a still earlier term. The lumber exported to England did not become of great importance, however, till in the 16th century, when the English forests no longer produced the needed supply. A more important market for Norwegian lumber developed in Holland and the lower districts of northwestern Germany. In a letter issued by King Erik Magnusson to the citizens of Hamburg, July 31, 1296, in which he grants them various trade privileges, he states that they shall have the right to carry from Norway in their own ships lumber and all other kinds of goods upon paying a fixed export duty. On August 24, 1443, the city of Amsterdam received the privilege to trade in Bergen and elsewhere in Norway, except in the Norwegian colonies, and in the reign of Christian I, five similar letters were issued in six years, 1452 to 1458, granting trade privileges to various cities in Holland, an indication of the rapid growth of trade with the Netherlands. This lumber trade with Holland led to an ever-widening commerce in that country, 
as the Hollanders did not enforce a monopoly on trade like the Hanseatic merchants, but maintained an open market and welcomed goods brought in Norwegian ships as well as in their own. L. J. Folkt observes that on December 4, 1490, the Norwegian Council issued an order forbidding the common and ruinous practice found in many districts in southern Norway, that bunder have and use their own ships with which they sail to foreign lands with rafters, boards, poles, salt, and other goods, and neglect agriculture. This shows that the lumber trade at this time must have been very lucrative. The boards were yet made by splitting the logs into slabs and hewing them with the axe, and they were therefore called hugenbord, hewn boards. New possibilities for this trade were developed through the invention of the saw driven by water power, which was introduced from Sweden in the early years of the 16th century. Vogt shows that, while the plane had been used in the north from earliest antiquity, the saw was late in making its appearance, not only because of the difficulty experienced in giving the teeth the proper shape and position, but especially in making a good saw blade. Sawmills were soon introduced in every district, and by 1530 they seemed to have been in common use. But the old method of making hugenbord with the axe was not discontinued. The increasing traffic with Holland stimulated also other countries to enter into competition for the valuable Norwegian trade, as Scotland, England, Denmark, and Germany were all in need of lumber. At the beginning of the 16th century, says Vogt, it seems to have been an established custom that the export of Norwegian lumber, without the intervention of any merchant, was free from every place on the coast of Norway where a ship could be anchored and loaded. The kings had sought to prohibit trade everywhere but in the cities in order to facilitate their growth. A statute given by Haakon the Sixth about 1380 states that all goods must be brought to the cities, and foreign merchants are forbidden to buy or sell in the smaller harbors along the coast. But no native merchant class existed which possessed sufficient capital to control trade. It has already been shown that the Norwegian traders in early times belonged to the old nobility, that with the introduction of the ideas of chivalry it came to be regarded as inconsistent with the dignity of a knight or of a man of high station to carry on trade. Commerce was, accordingly, left to the poorer classes, and especially in the 15th century the merchant class of the cities lost both its economic strength and its social influence. The native aristocratic families disappeared, and the cities were turned over, so to speak, to the control of foreign merchants. But a new merchant class in a modern sense began to develop at the beginning of the 16th century, and Norwegian cities, commerce, and navigation developed with it. Professor Alexander Buga has shown that Norway had her own merchant class about 1300, but this class was almost totally destroyed by the Hanseatic merchants. At the time of the Reformation, the whole city population of Norway, according to Sars, numbered about 9,000, consisting chiefly of shopkeepers, fishermen, seamen, laborers, and a few foreign traders and artisans. Under these circumstances, the cities could exercise no corporate strength at home, nor any commercial power abroad. A new foundation had to be laid for urban life in a more modern sense. The development was slow, but the disappearance of the old aristocracy facilitated progress, as the government of the cities was thereby naturally transferred from a circle of aristocratic families with inherited class privileges to the townsmen, who could claim no other superiority than that given them by their own energy and business insight. The growing demand for Norwegian lumber created business activity and helped to centralize trade in the cities. The freedom from the restraining influence of a privileged aristocracy, the democratic conditions existing in the Norwegian towns, and the growing commerce, especially in the latter half of the 16th century, furnished the conditions necessary for the development of the Norwegian cities along new lines. Trade in the north was also stimulated by the attempt of the English to find a northeast passage to India. This plan was advanced by the Spaniard Sebastian Cabot, who had entered the English service. He had read Heberstein's account of Russia, and had studied his map, as well as Olaus Magnus's map of the north and of the Mares Sithicum. A company of merchant adventurers was formed under the patronage of the government, and three ships were established under Hugh Willoughby to discover the new route. The expedition sailed from England May 22, 1553. On the northwest coast of Norway, the Edward Bonaventura, under Captain Chancellor, was separated from the fleet in a severe storm. Willoughby, with the remaining two ships, was driven far to the northeast, but finally he found a harbor and landed on a barren and uninhabited coast, where he and his followers perished from hunger. Their dead bodies and Willoughby's testament were found later. 
Chancellor was more fortunate. He rounded the northern extremity of Norway, which he called North Cape, and succeeded in reaching Vardahus, where he was well received by the commandant. After spending a week as his guest, they sailed again to the northeast and landed at the mouth of the Dvina, where he was received by the Russian Vovod of the village of St. Nikolai. Chancellor received permission from the Vovod to go to Moscow to visit the Tsar, from whom he received a letter granting the English the right to trade at the mouth of the Dvina. The following year he returned to England with a cargo of Russian goods. The English lauded him as a great discoverer who had found a new route to northern Russia, though the expedition had failed to discover a new route to India. But this route to northern Russia was the old way traveled by the Norwegians ever since Othera first discovered it in the time of Alfred the Great. Both Denmark, Norway, and Holland entered into competition for this trade, and the search for a northeast passage continued for half a century. The Treaty of Speer, 1544, settled the political difficulties between Denmark, Norway, and Germany, resulting from Christian III's active cooperation with the Schmalkaldic League, and a commercial treaty was entered into by the two powers, which gave Norwegian commerce a new foundation. By this treaty, unobstructed trade between Norway and Holland was assured, and Amsterdam became the chief market for Norwegian lumber, as the cities of Holland were fast becoming the center of the world's commerce which had developed after the discovery of America and of the new routes to India. The rapid development of commerce resulting from these discoveries, the increase in shipbuilding, and the growth of cities greatly enhanced the demand for lumber and shipbuilding material. In a few years after 1584, the English merchant marine was trebled in size, and a heavy export of Norwegian timber to England developed. According to Vogt, the customs rolls show a demand for Norwegian products, and an increase in Norwegian trade to which there is no earlier parallel. In 1567, Bergen exported 206 dozen boards. In 1597, 2,188 dozen. From the Fogderi of Nedenes, 12 ships were cleared in 1528, 150 ships in 1560, and 277 ships in 1613. The lumber export is estimated to have risen from 102 cargoes to 1,650 cargoes in 1560. In the harbors where the shipping of lumber was carried on, new seaport towns, Norse Lodestetter, sprang into existence. Fredrikshald, Larvik, Breivik, Kragere, Briser, Arendal, etc., owe their origin to the flourishing lumber trade. The nationalizing of trade, which had thus begun, was an important chapter not only in the economic development of the Norwegian people, but also in their political and intellectual progress. A Norwegian bourgeoisie was thereby created, which was to play an important part in the future struggles for political independence and intellectual emancipation from the Danish tutelage, which was forced upon the Norwegian people through the union with Denmark. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian IV and His Age When Frederick II died in 1588, his son Christian was only eleven years old. The council assumed control of the government and appointed four of their own number to act as a regency during the minority of the prince. In 1580 he had been elected heir to succeed his father as king of Denmark, and two years later a council of Norwegian nobles at Oslo acknowledged him successor also on the throne of Norway. Axel Jildensterne, member of the council, and a prominent and able nobleman, was appointed stadtholder of Norway. As the personal representative of the king and regency, he had royal power both in secular and ecclesiastical matters. He was instructed to exercise supervision over bishops and priests, so that full concord might be maintained and a good example might be set the parishioners. The military strength of the kingdom was to be carefully examined, and in case of war he should summon the Lensherer into service with a full quota of men, and assume supreme command. This attention to the military service was a laudable forethought at this time when the storm clouds of the approaching European wars already obscured the political horizon. England's growing naval power had already encouraged her bold sea captains to rob Spanish treasure ships and to plunder isolated Spanish-American settlements. 
In 1587, Sir Francis Drake had even entered the harbors of Cadiz and Corunna, where he burned the ships and galleys which Philip II had fitted out for an attack upon England. The Invincible Armada was ready to sail in July 1588, three months after the death of Frederick II. England, Spain's political, commercial, and religious enemy, was to be conquered. Even Danish and Norwegian ships and crews had been hired to join the great fleet when it arrived in English waters. But owing to a remonstrance from the English ambassador in Denmark, these ships were not allowed to leave the harbors. If Philip should succeed in crushing England, Denmark-Norway as a Protestant power could no longer feel safe. But the stormy sea and the bravery of the English sailors destroyed the Great Armada. Many ships were driven so far north that they were wrecked on the northwest coast of Norway. Five ships are said to have stranded in the neighborhood of Trondheim. England and the Protestant North was no longer endangered by Spanish aggression. Prince Christian, who was born April 12, 1577, was declared to be of age when he became 19 years old in 1596. On August 29th of that year, he was crowned in Copenhagen as King Christian IV, and the following year he entered upon his duties as ruling sovereign. The superstition of the age had been brought into play in connection with the birth of the prince. A peasant had visited the king to inform him that a mermaid had foretold the birth of a son to the royal pair, who should become an excellent king and lord in these northern lands, a prophecy which gained general credence. The mother had the chief care of the boy's education and early training. She had been reared according to the strict rules of her German home in Mecklenburg. She loved order and economy, and took great interest in household affairs and the management of the royal estates, a love for the practical which was inherited by the son. He was well educated in the learning of the age, and could speak and write several languages, but as a student he was only moderately successful, as his interests centered chiefly on architecture, shipbuilding, seamanship, and other practical pursuits, in which he exhibited energy and talent, and a desire to see and do things in his own way. In regard to his kingly duties, he entertained views resembling those of the Stuart kings in England, or of the Tudor Henry VIII. He would not only be the highest power in the state, but he would give personal attention to all details of government, so that nothing, however unimportant, might happen which did not reflect his royal will. As he possessed great courage, energy, and practical insight, and was always ready to take an active part in all administrative affairs, he instituted, at least in a practical way, a personal rule which bears the marks of his own temperament and character. He was a bold seaman, and visited Norway a greater number of times than all his predecessors together since the Union was established. Professor Ingvar Nilsson has shown that he visited that kingdom not less than 26 times during his reign. In 1599, he made a voyage to the North Cape to study conditions in northern Norway, in order that he might be able to regulate the growing commerce in those parts, and also to protect Finnmarken, which both Russia and Sweden would snatch from Norway at the first opportunity. He made the voyage with a whole squadron of war vessels, and captured several Dutch merchant ships which sought to sail to Russia by way of Vardahus. His firm hand was soon felt also in the internal administration in Norway, where the discontent was general because of the extortions practiced by the Danish Lensherrer and their fogods, who paid little attention to the laws and increased arbitrarily their own income and the burdens of the people. The Norwegian Bunder did not patiently submit to injustice of that kind, but sent delegations to the king to ask for justice. The complaint was again directed against Ludwig Munch, Lensherrer in Trindelagen, who had imprisoned and executed those who on a former occasion had served as messengers to the king. This time the old offender was made to feel the heavy hand of royal justice. He was dismissed from his office, banished to his estates in Jutland, and forced to pay a heavy fine. During the Union period, Denmark had gradually established an overlordship over Norway, which for military purposes, as well as in the eyes of the world at large, made the two kingdoms one united realm, and greatly increased Denmark's prestige and power. Not only was the central government Danish, but nearly all the local officials of any importance in Norway were Danes. The Norwegian laws had been translated into Danish, which became the official language of Norway, though it was never spoken by the common people. The threat made by Christian III that the kingdom of Norway should be regarded as a Danish province had indeed not been carried out, but intellectually as well as politically, Norway now stood under the aegis of Danish supremacy. But the overlordship was formal and exterior, and did not deeply affect the people's everyday life. 
Now, as before, they led their own national existence, and were governed according to their own laws and customs. And as to social conditions, the people of Norway and Denmark were more widely separated in the 16th century than in any earlier period. If the Danish Lensherer and Fogids attempted to practice in Norway what had been regarded as common usage in Denmark, they encountered the firm resistance and vigorous protest of the people, who, though they could not place a son of their own on the throne of Norway, would defend to the utmost their individual rights. Denmark had not been able to get fully into the current of European development, which tended to bring the lower classes into active participation in political life. In Sweden, Gustav Vasa had sought the support of the common people, and had made them a new political factor. In France and England, the commonality had risen into prominence, and had added new vigor to the national development. But in Denmark, the aristocracy alone grew in importance, while the common classes were constantly depressed in the social scale. The aristocracy isolated themselves from the rest of society, and instead of remaining a warrior class, they became an aristocracy of birth, wealth, and titles, who would not allow their sons and daughters to marry outside of their castle, a restriction which brought about their rapid degeneration as a class. Full jurisdiction over the enslaved peasants had been established. The will of the noble-born lord was the law to which they were held amenable. They had to render free service to their lords whenever they were called upon, and had to yield the most abject obedience not only to the lord himself, but also to his representatives of whatever sort, even to his servants and stable boys. In the rules made by Chancellor Nils Koss and Treasurer Christopher Valkendorf, June 5, 1578, for the service to be rendered the honest and noble-born Jürgen Marsvin by the peasants, it is stated that they shall not be forced to work more than one or two days a week, except in the fall, when they shall work three days a week. But this was the service rendered on a royal estate, which was much more moderate than that extracted by many an arbitrary and tyrannical lord, who would demand service of his peasants without any restriction as to time or amount. In many provinces, the peasants lost even their personal liberty. They had to remain permanently on the farm where they were born, and they would have to rent such a piece of ground as the lord would grant them, and on the conditions which he prescribed. The cruel hunting laws show even more clearly to what extent the poor Danish peasants were oppressed and done to scorn by the arrogant nobles. In the statute of Christian III of 1537, anyone who catches a poacher is instructed to put out his eyes or hang him on the nearest tree. The king's officials are instructed to watch so that no man from the cities kill animals, either large or small, or any hares, and that no fogad, or steward of a manor, or peasant shall keep greyhounds or retrievers, or shoot animals, large or small, on penalty of death, or the loss of their property. In the statute of Frederick II, 1556, the people in the cities, preachers and peasants, are instructed that they must keep no dogs unless these are always tied, or that one of their front legs is cut off. In 1573, King Frederick II wrote to the people of Kolding, Len, that since he had learned that several of them kept many dogs, which ran about in the forests and fields, and chased away and harmed the wild animals, he wished them to take notice that no one should keep more than one dog, and that dog should have one front leg cut off above the knee. In 1577, the wild animals did so much damage that the peasants in Lemsogen were unable to pay their taxes. It's not strange that the Danish nobles, who were accustomed to look upon the peasants as a class possessing no rights which they were obliged to respect, should attempt also in Norway to override the laws and oppress the people. But in Norway they did not possess the same privileges as in Denmark. Even Frederick I had promised in his Norwegian charter to rule the Norwegian people according to St. Olaf's and the Kingdom of Norway's laws and good old usages unchanged in all respects. As already stated elsewhere, the freedom of the Norwegians was safeguarded in the first place by the law of Odel, which maintained a relatively large class of freebunder who owned their farms. In the second place, the renters, who were more numerous, were protected by the laws as to their personal liberty and independence of their landlords. The amount of rent to be paid was fixed by law, and beyond this the renter owed no obedience or responsibility to the landlord. Since the old nobility had practically disappeared, Norway had virtually become a democracy, while Denmark was the most typical exponent of aristocratic rule. This may have been the reason also why the principle of elective kingship was maintained in Denmark, while Norway always inclined to the hereditary principle, which also had been introduced in Sweden by Gustav Vasa. The aristocratic social organization and the elective principle proved a weakness which sapped Denmark's strength and retarded her progress, though at the time she exercised dominion over Norway. 
On the other hand, the democratic conditions in Norway, though they had pushed the Norwegians for a season into the background, fostered powers and possibilities for a new national development. The Danish Lensherer and Fogeds, who looked upon the Norwegian laws as a restriction upon their privileges, sought to introduce the Danish system also in Norway. The crown lands had been increased through the secularization of monasteries and the confiscation of church lands until the crown owned over one-fourth of all the taxable lands in the kingdom. The Danish lords began to demand service of the tenants living upon these crown lands, and gradually also of the renters dwelling on their own estates. Many of the minor lands had been granted them in return for a fixed sum of money paid by them to the crown, or for service, i.e. for furnishing a certain number of men for the army. Some lands had been granted them quito frit, i.e. so that each lord should have the whole income from his land. In this way the power of the lensherre had been greatly increased, and the king, who was far away, could have no intimate knowledge of the methods used by the lensherre and fogids to swell their income. Another, and if possible greater power, was given the Lensherre and Fogids in connection with the execution of the decrees of the course of justice. Not seldom did they influence the Fogids to inflict the heaviest penalties, as death or banishment, upon the offenders. The Lensherre would then, out of kindness of heart, commute the sentence by substituting a fine, which was usually so large that the offender had to deed his property to the Lensherre in order to escape a worse fate. In this way, the Lensherer and Fogas could gradually increase their personal holdings. Stadtholder Axel Jildensterne wrote to the government in Copenhagen, October 9, 1590. In like manner, if any poor man commits an offense so that he has to pay the Fogid or the Lensherer for his neck, he is not executed for such a crime, but the Lensherer or Fogids imposes so high a fine for the offense that he cannot pay it, and a poor fellow promises willingly, in order to save his life, more than he or his family at any time can pay. Then he has to give the Lensherer or Fogid a deed on his farm and possessions, as if the same had been bought. This has certainly happened, and it seems therefore advisable that a royal letter should be issued to all Lensherer, Fogids, and clergymen in all Norway, that they should in no wise buy or confiscate any property, unless it is forfeited to the crown. But with all their power and systematized injustice, the Danish lords were unable to force their system upon Norway. Their most crafty schemes and their ruthless greed proved of little avail in a contest with the martial spirit of the Norwegian Bunder and their uncompromising love of freedom. In their mountain homes, the Bunder still retained their old character and customs. They came to the thing, as well as to the church, armed as of old, with sword, spear, battle-axe, shield, bow, and arrows. If they felt wronged, if their temper was aroused, the sword was their most convenient argument, and many a bloody tumult occurred at the things, when they felt that justice had not been done. At times they assembled things and passed resolutions without paying any attention to the government officials. Stiff-necked and turbulent they often were, impatient of all restraint, and utterly unwilling to submit to the arbitrary rule of the Danish lords. Peter Clausen Fries, who as clergyman sympathized with the Danish officials, says of them in speaking of the origin of the Norwegian people, However this may all be, the inhabitants of this country have their origin and descent from a hard people, because they have always been a hard, stubborn, disobedient, obstinate, restless, rebellious, and a bloodthirsty people, which I cannot deny they still are, especially in places where they keep their old customs, that is, among the mountains far away from the sea. There dwells still a wild and wicked people. In another place he calls the Bunder of Telemarken, a wicked, impious, hard, wild, and rebellious people. Some shameless, devilish fellows, guilty of adultery, murder, manslaughter, heresy, licentiousness, fights, and other vices beyond any that live in this country. It was their greatest joy in olden times to kill bishops, priests, fogids, and commandants, which is also shown by the fact that in one parish in that district seven clergymen have been killed, in other parishes one or two, and in some a greater number. Professor J. E. Sars remarks, the many irksome schemes and impositions invented by the Lensherer and Fogids seem to have caused among the Bunder a restlessness and agitation, in which their strength degenerated into brutality, and their combative and headstrong character assumed traits of insubordination and resistance to all forms of restraint. The efforts of the Lensherer and Fogids to reduce them to a subordination akin to that of the Danish peasants, instead of frightening or subduing them, only increased their defiance. They employed force against force, 
and throughout the whole land they seem to have risen in arms against all officials who in any way sought to exercise authority over them. These irregular outbursts of a spirit of liberty, which lacks guidance and a fixed aim, do not make a pleasant impression, but it must not be forgotten that they have played a part in the country's history which is by no means unimportant. We may view as a whole the endless variety of complaints of fogids and other functionaries, of riots and assaults, and the violent taking of justice into their own hands on the part of the people, of which the documents of our history from that period bring evidence. Where the issue seems to be trifling matters without any connection, real or imaginary injustice against some individual, and we can see in all these clashes between the Bunder on the one side and the Lensherer Fogids and clergy on the other, a single, long-continued struggle in defense of what must be called the chief product of the people's earlier political development, and the most important condition for their national future, popular freedom and the right to own property. And in this struggle, the Norwegian Bunder became the unqualified victors. The spirited resistance of the Bunder compelled the Lensherer and Fogids to respect their rights, and to avoid, at least to some extent, more serious conflicts with them. The Norwegian people's bravery and love of liberty became proverbial in Denmark, and the government feared that a general uprising might take place if the officials were allowed to unduly oppress the people. For this reason, the king listened to the complaints made by the Norwegians, and many an offender, even of high rank, was severely punished. But many a just complaint was also left unheeded, and in too many instances the vindictive officials found opportunity to wreak vengeance on those who had sought to bring them to justice. King Christian IV was especially anxious to win the goodwill of the Norwegians. When Jürgen Fries succeeded Jolensterna as stadtholder, the king himself was present, and the new official had to pledge himself under oath that he would listen and pay diligent heed to the complaints of the poor people and help them to secure justice. Towards the estates, nobility, clergy, citizens, and common people of the kingdom, he should so act that the king should not on his account hear any complaints from the people. In 1604, the king himself held court in Bergen to decide a quarrel between the people and the Lensherre, Peter Gruber. Peter Klaus and Fries was also involved in the trial, but both Fries and the people were held to be innocent, while Gruber was found guilty and was removed from his Len. Even in the courts of law, justice often miscarried because the old codes were no longer understood by the logmen and officials. Since the Union was established, the Norwegian jurisprudence had received no attention. Magnus Lagerbeter's Code, which was still in use, had not been revised, and many new statutes, passed from time to time, had not been incorporated in it. A revision of the Code was sorely needed, and in 1602 Christian IV ordered the Norwegian logmen to prepare a new code, which should be printed and put in use throughout the kingdom. The new law book, known as the Code of Christian IV, was submitted to the king in 1604, and after he had caused it to be read before an assembly of nobles and logmen in Bergen, it was formally authorized and printed. The new code was only a translation of Magnus Lagerbrotter's laws, and the work was wretchedly done, as many old legal terms had been misunderstood, but it was, nevertheless, an improvement, as the laws were reduced to a code which could be read and understood, and which was everywhere accessible in printed form. The new code was introduced in the Faroe Islands, but Iceland had its own laws, and did not adopt it, nor was it introduced in the Shetland or Orkney Islands, where the Old Norse laws were still in force. The church laws were not embodied in the code, but the king caused a new church ordinance to be prepared, which was finally proclaimed at a council in Stavanger, 1607. The religious outlook was beginning to cause no small anxiety at this time. The Catholic reaction against the Reformation, organized by the Council of Trent, had gained great strength, owing to the enthusiastic propaganda of the Jesuits and the vigor of the Inquisition. The Catholic Church had risen to do battle for its spiritual supremacy, to regain what it had lost. Also in the north, the Jesuits began a stealthy agitation, which did not escape the attention of King Christian. A Norwegian Jesuit, Loritz Nilsson, with the Latinized name of Laurentius Nicolai, also called Klosterlasa, Klosterlasius, had found welcome in Sweden, where King John III inclined toward Catholicism. A higher school was organized where Klosterlasius should teach. At first, his church affiliations were to remain a secret, and he was to appear only as the learned scholar, a form of agitation adopted for the purpose of gaining influence in the schools, 
and of encouraging the students to attend the Catholic universities. If the students, who had become ministers in the church, could be won for Catholicism, that faith could in time be reintroduced among the common people, and great efforts were therefore made to create the belief that the Catholic universities were better than the Protestant, and that they enjoyed a higher reputation for learning. But Clostrolasius did not accomplish much in Sweden. He became arrogant, forfeited the goodwill both of the king and the people, and had to leave Stockholm. The Jesuits directed their attention also to Norway, where the Reformation had still wrought but an imperfect conversion of the people to the Lutheran faith. Disguised as merchants, they traveled about in the country, and sought to persuade young men to go to Catholic schools in foreign lands. After these young men had completed their studies, they often returned to Norway to be ordained as Lutheran ministers in order to be able to carry on a secret propaganda among their parishioners. Clostrolasius wrote several works against Protestantism, among others, A Letter from Satan to the Lutheran Ministers, and though he never returned to Norway, he actively supported the Jesuits there. At a council in Bergen, 1604, the Norwegian bishops called the king's attention to the Jesuit agitation. He seems to have been alarmed by the reports, and issued a royal letter forbidding anyone who had been educated by the Jesuits to serve in the church or schools of the kingdom. In 1606, Clostrolasius was banished from Denmark, where he had arrived on a visit, and in 1613 the Jesuit priests in Norway were summoned before a council in Skien, where they were sentenced to have forfeited their office and inheritance, and they were immediately banished from the kingdom. After this time, but few traces of Catholicism were found in Norway. This episode had also opened the king's eyes to the necessity of improving the schools of the two kingdoms, so that Norwegian and Danish students would not need to go to foreign institutions. In 1604, a new plan of instruction for secondary schools was prepared, and better textbooks were introduced. Gymnasiums were established at the Latin schools of Roskilde, Odense, Riba, Aarhus, Lund, and Christiania, in order that the students could be better prepared for their university studies. Three or four professors were appointed for each gymnasium, who would give more advanced instruction in the classical languages, besides giving lectures on theology, logic, natural science, mathematics, botany, and anatomy. But this very laudable attempt to place secondary education on a higher level was unfortunately rendered abortive by later events. Only the gymnasium of Roskilde existed towards the end of the 16th century, and that of Odense till towards the end of the 18th. The Academy of Soru was founded in 1623, and the University of Copenhagen was much improved. Seven new chairs were created, and the king donated to the university a large part of his own library, in all 1,100 volumes. King Christian was a great builder, and erected more castles and fortresses, and founded more cities, than any other king in the Union period. In Norway he founded the city of Christiansand, and when Oslo was almost totally destroyed by fire, August 17, 1624, he founded the new city of Christiania so near to the ruins that Oslo has long since been incorporated in the capital city of Norway. The castles of Akershus and Bohus were enlarged and surrounded by strong walls, and in Akershus he erected a palace which still lifts its towers above the city. The ever-active and energetic king showed a great interest also for the Norwegian mining industry, which in the reign of Frederick II had been wholly neglected. So great an impetus was given to this industry in this reign that it may almost be said to have been founded by Christian IV. A large number of new mines were opened, but for want of the necessary skill and science they yielded no profit. The most important were the Ruros copper mines, opened in 1614, and the great Kongsberg silver mines, discovered in 1623, which led to the founding of the two cities, Ruros and Kongsberg. As many as 4,000 men were employed at Kongsberg, but the mines were often operated at a loss, till in 1830 when they began to yield profitable returns. Christian IV, who was intensely interested in navigation, entertained a fond hope of being able to re-establish communications with the Norse colonies in Greenland. Some attempts had been made also in the previous reign to reach the distant island. Frederick II sent an expedition in 1579 under the English captain John Alday, and another in 1581 under Mogens Hanesson the great pharaoh sea captain, but both failed to reach their destination because of fog and icebergs. In 1585, the English navigator John Davis reached the west coast of Greenland, but he found no traces of white people, and thought that he was the real discoverer of the land. 
In 1605, King Christian sent three ships under the Danish noblemen Goodecker Lindenau and John Cunningham, a Scotchman, with the Englishman James Hall as pilot. Cunningham succeeded in landing on the west coast and took possession of the country for the king, while Lindenau made an unsuccessful attempt to land on the east coast. Two more expeditions were sent out, one in 1606 and another in 1607, but as no traces of the colonists were found, the project was abandoned. The king turned his attention instead to the search for the Northwest Passage, and sent an expedition to the Hudson Bay under Jens Munk in 1619. In 1636 he organized the Greenland Company to trade with Greenland and to carry on whaling at Spitsbergen, but the trade with Greenland fell mostly into the hands of the Hollanders and the English. In harmony with the practice of the age, Christian IV created many similar companies with exclusive trade privileges in certain parts of the world. In 1616, he chartered the East India Company to trade with the East India Islands, China, and Japan. This company raised a capital stock of 190,000 riksdaler and secured Tranquibar on the Coromandel coast, which became the chief seat of its commercial operations in the Far East. In 1619, a company was formed to trade with Iceland, and in 1625, a Danish West India Company was organized. It was King Christian's manifest ambition to increase his power at sea, and this desire was strengthened also by the necessity of being well-armed both on sea and land because of the great wars waged by Philip II in the Netherlands, and the strained relations between the emperor and the Protestant princes in Germany. Much attention was therefore devoted especially to the navy. At his accession to the throne, Denmark-Norway had a fleet of 22 vessels, large and small, and some of these were very antiquated. The king hired Scotch shipbuilders to assist the ablest men within his own kingdom in constructing a number of new warships of the best type, and in a few years the Danish-Norwegian fleet was by far the most powerful in the Baltic Sea. In time of war the sailors and marines serving in the new fleet seem to have numbered about 6,000. End of chapter 25